All right. Hey, TJ, it's nice to uh, finally get to meet you face to face, sort of, in, in video, in person. Yeah, nice to meet you. Like yeah. I was saying earlier, it's uh, pretty much, I, I already feel like I know you when you're on the internet and you do Facebook and all that stuff. You get to know someone pretty well, I think. And then it's nice to actually have a conversation uh, both yeah. ways. Yeah. Yeah. The world's a different place now with the online stuff and meeting people in a totally different way. But at least I guess we're lucky we have this way to still contact people. Yes. And probably meet people we never would have before. So, yeah. Yeah. That's the part about Facebook. You know, there's a lot of evil social media out there, <laughs> but I can uh, stay in touch with family, meet new friends. I would have never been into the Sinclair thing as much as I am now, unless it was for all these avenues I have. So, yeah. So yeah. it has its good aspects. Yes. yes. Yeah. Have you run into a lot of the negative part of it? Do you find you have to work to kind of avoid that? There is some, yeah, especially in a couple of the, I won't mention them, but yeah, a couple of the, vintage uh type of groups that i've uh, enjoyed there's you know for lack of a better word wackos out there uh, somebody may see me as a wacko and then i see them as a wacko but <laughs> there's some people out there that you could tell are just on the internet to make trouble cause problems and yeah even with my small presence my small youtube channel uh, i guess i'm uh, known enough to where you know they'll come on and they'll send some pretty vulgar messages really? video links stuff like that that you kind of mm. gotta uh, you just gotta let it fall off and brush it mm. off and move on kind of thing yeah i do get spam links once in a while in my video <laughs> messages just for porn sites or whatever but they're not really they don't seem to be directed negative comments yeah so, they are I'm yeah i've had one. some yeah, yeah. In, 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 in pretty much in in a number of paths but yeah I've, some people will kind of you know get to know you and then you'll find the opposite side of who mm. they or find out who they really are and then you start learning this person's uh, not on a lot of facebook groups and they've been kicked out and uh, yeah there's a lot of interesting people not saying they're all good all, all yeah. bad but yeah the internet's a slippery slope and social media can be a it's a trap <laughs> like in star wars uh, <laughs> it's a trap there, yeah. <laughs> there could be some bad things but yeah. like i said i enjoy the majority of it and i'm i've been around for so long on the internet that i could just say you know what hell with it yeah, yeah. well obviously from your channel you're all about positivity i think that seems to be a main driving force and and i'm going to ask you about this in, in a moment once we get <laughs> once we get to my questions um, yeah yeah so i'm going to be coughing a bit too so <laughs> We'll yeah. try and edit those out if we can. I always um, say in any interview or anything, apologize in advance. I've in all my videos, I've got allergies, asthma. My nose is always running. I'm gonna. My eyes are uh, oozing. It's kind of like okay, I I gotta do something, and you can't just you know not. Yeah. <laughs> I apologize in advance. <laughs> Same here. Okay, and we both got our bastard club shirts on today. Right. In honor uh, of the I, occasion. I wear mine every so often. Uh, I find I swear less when I wear it. <laughs> You don't need to, right? It's it's wearing for you. That's right. I just I have to just go through. You'll know if I, you watch me play a video game. Normally, I'm pretty boisterous. But when I get quiet, it means TJ is getting serious. Yeah, I, I saw and that I, in your last video. I think the one where you did well with that uh, cranky Charles in hell or whatever it was. Right. You're Raleigh Roger and the Rockets. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hey, you Joe. did good on that one. Okay. Uh, oh. Uh, uh. Jump on the diggins. Oh, shit. <laughs> Yeah, I think I did pretty good. And actually, the um, person that made the game messaged me back and said, you actually did pretty good. Uh, there's oh. some people that don't even get past this one thing. So a lot of people make jokes like TJ's a really shitty video player. And <laughs> probably in many cases I can be. But uh, in a video I just made that I don't have posted yet, I kind of say, I bet you 50% of the people, if they're thrown into a game like I do, are probably just like me. And then there's 50% that are just very dexteric with their hands and very good at picking things up very quickly are a little better than me or a lot better but i'm sure there's a lot of people out there just like me that i just put myself on video i i throw myself to lions and i like doing that so yeah and, and that's the fun of it particularly probably obviously with specy games they're so pixel perfect how can you not <laughs> mess it up the first few times oh yes it is hard yes yeah, specy programmers those <laughs> bastards they yeah. they made things rather Difficult challenging yeah games. and the yeah. one thing i like about that game i guess we should probably try and remember the real name in case people want to look look up your video um but that one it was interesting because the character that's the one i think the character changed its appearance every 
level, right? Yankee Joe from Retro Hell just put it up. Janky Joe, right? Joe. Sloney song. <clears throat> Get janky. Yeah, exactly. And it added a whole element to the game because you would pop up and go, who am I? Where do I move? I yeah. don't want to move left or right because you're going to fall <laughs> yeah. at the beginning of the game. From the helicopter, I fell right down and died immediately. And so it's like, <laughs> yeah. I, I like the last level that you showed on your video where the guy looked like a little teapot cozy or something. I don't know what he was supposed to be, but like, oh, yeah. that's me over there. They're all supposedly parts of video games that are popular, oh, but wow. I haven't played 10,000 Smith games yet, so I yeah. don't know them all. And so I think that one is in some game. Somebody, I think, mentioned it, and um, I just don't know the character. Yeah, well, being in North America, we didn't really have access to all these Specky games back in the day. Nope. So, yeah. So we're lucky we know any of it, really. Exactly. Yeah, as much as, and it's kind of funny. So uh, I've, I've got a friend one time saying that he goes to my site to learn about Specky, but he was from the UK. <laughs> <laughs> and so it's just that I'm so into it and I make videos about it that I'd be, you know, kind of not a news source, but I'd become a source for people that have maybe never done it before. And it was in their hometown or in their country. That's interesting. Yeah. yeah. And plus you, you put a fresh angle on things, right? Cause you're discovering it brand new, which I think is probably one appeal of your channel, at least for me, yeah. actually, because even if you're, you may be familiar with these games or these systems, particularly people in the UK with your, all the specy videos that you do, but right. you know, just watching someone play a game that they're already familiar with, but is different from oh. seeing someone approach it fresh and having never seen the game before. I think it's, it really makes it kind of fun and cool to have, yeah a channel like that i like yeah that's i like doing that's why i said throw myself into the lion's den i like yeah. doing that otherwise if i go scripted i don't think i would be as fun so yeah i like just doing yeah have, have you tried making scripted videos nope <laughs> <Any> chance, no? <laughs> yeah never yeah i don't have a teleprompter i've got bad eyes anyway uh you know i'm getting mm. older so everything's <clears throat> kind of getting decrepit so yeah me trying to read something it would be so apparent so I just go off of let me loose and yeah. I'll do my thing and uh, hopefully it comes out okay. If it doesn't, hey, it's the way it is. You can always redo it, right? Just right. Throw it in the bin. Right. Yeah. Well, you seem to think on your feet pretty good. So I, I don't think you have a problem with that, really. I, I used to try to do scripted videos. The first maybe two or three videos I did, I tried to script them, but it was just a disaster. I can't read and think at the same time. Yeah. It, yeah. It's difficult. Yeah, do, making videos is a lot harder than some people think. Um, yeah, and your um, videos, they look like they would be simple because you think, oh, it's just a guy switching on a camera and uploading it, but I'm sure there's a lot more to it than that. Right. Yeah, yeah. even preparing for a meeting like this, you still got to set up the lighting and check the sound and all that stuff and yeah. get the time set aside and put the dogs away or whatever you need to do. And yep. it's a whole thing, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I've got the dogs yeah. outside, cats upstairs, <laughs> light there. I think I hit everything unless a UPS driver drives up right now and needs to sign for a package, which could happen. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's more important than our chat. So you don't want to miss any games showing up at your door in a box. Right. right. <laughs> so speaking of scripting, I I think you and I are the same in that respect. We don't work well with scripts, but I do have questions that I I wrote down that I do want to ask you so i might look off to the side here periodically and, and remind well, myself what the sense. question is yeah so yeah ask away yeah that's i i do write down some i'll put a little <clears throat> post-it note like of a few key things and as i'm in a meeting i'll put a note like remember to say this yeah do this so i I'll, I'll make a little note yeah so i wanted to ask you actually a couple different topics i wanted to talk about your youtube channel and experience and then we'll get into uh the retro stuff if that sounds okay for you so the first question I was wondering, well, the first of all, let me say congratulations on your million views. Thanks. Yeah. So what, I, does that actually do anything for you? What, do they get a plaque or something? No. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think the only uh, thing that they actually send you something out is when you hit 100,000 subs. And I've got 5,000. Okay. So uh, they send you some type of thing. So no, I, I, I think they should have did something for, you know, even if it was just a, like a little card, like a yeah. card saying, good job something yeah. uh but no <laughs> nothing they, they just send you an email uh it's in my uh so on youtube there's you know your studio and in the studio you uh, can right. yeah. uh, do stuff and there's a little note up there basically saying hey you just hit a million subs or not uh, views and i go oh okay mm. cool yeah so what, was 
what do you find is more um like what 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 would you prefer to have more subs or more views uh more views because it's funny i can look at a my channel i've got 5230 5, or whatever subs but i only get x amount of hundreds of views on videos you know right off the bat and then slowly it adds one or two every day and then i'll look at like a a, a big time youtuber that's got 7 million subs and they've only got you know such you know a couple of thousand you know uh likes or whatever and it's like yeah. numbers seem drastically off so i have a feeling a lot of people will sub to you but then never watch you other than once in a great while which yeah doesn't do your channel much because at that point they're not viewing it that's what you get and build up from youtube i think mm -hmm. is the amount of views how long they stay on so yeah the, the number of subs is kind of cool and it and says, hey, somebody's following me, but them actually doing something and watching a video is the best part of the equation. Yeah, it seems like for my channel, and I'm guessing it's probably the same for you, there's a core group of viewers that watch probably every video you make. Right. And then others are just come by maybe organically based on maybe the the tags you put in the video or the title or whatnot. Yep. But And some aren't even subs. They just, you know, I guess... For whatever reason, it, that's why a lot of people, YouTubers, real YouTubers will say, you know, hit the bell and and hit the like. And they do all that stuff because they're really trying to drive uh, people yeah. to actually do these things. Which um, that actually turns me off. I don't like seeing people trying to solicit views and likes or, and right. shares and subscribes and all this stuff. It's like, I know what your channel is. If I like it, I'll subscribe. Uh, I'll it, yeah, I, I would say every because uh, I've got a Patreon site and. Every quarter uh, or so, I'll just put out a thank you type of email yeah. to these folks, and then I'll put links to the avenues that they can help support the channel. That's about the only time I somewhat solicit, just saying, hey, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to grow it. Do I like where I'm at? Sure. But if there was triple the amount of people actually viewing, hell yeah, because then that means it's getting more exposure for my Ataris and my mm -hmm. Nexts and may allow more people to – learn about them and get excited about them and then buy them and help support the people that are making them. And that will give me more stuff to play with. So yeah. you know, there's a little bit of, I think, soliciting that's, I think, good if you're trying to help the whole platform as a whole, uh, because you're enjoying it. And if no one did anything and, and didn't buy uh, a game or go to itch.io and pay a dollar or two for a game, then people are going to stop doing it. And then sooner or later, we're going to have to find a new hobby. So yeah, I think, well, the, the thing about the, I wouldn't probably call it soliciting for what you do. You promote different avenues for people to get involved with your channel, such as uh, you can join your YouTube channel as a member and you can, you have your Patreon, of course. Yep. But uh, I think those types of things are good when you're promoting something that people might not know about, such as your Patreon, your being able to join a channel. I didn't know you could join a YouTube channel. But everyone right. knows you can subscribe to a channel, right? But all these other avenues, I think those are good to promote for the reasons that you you said. Right. Yeah, they help. Uh, you know, you become a, a little bit of a, is it the proper word? You know, you've got your own little pulpit that you get up and chat about something. And I'm not part of the next team. I'm not part <laughs> of Sinclair or any of that. But I guarantee even in my little world, there's quite a few people that probably know TJ from all the videos I've done about the Spectrum Next. So I am a cheerleader in yeah. a way. And I guarantee there's a few people that probably purchased in next because of the videos I make. So in the end, it all helps yeah. uh, evolve this hobby and spread the word. That's yeah. what you're there to make. You're making something, you want more people to do it. You better have some cheerleaders that love the heck out of this stuff so you can sell more or make more, have another Kickstarter. Exactly. Yeah. And you, you obviously are a cheerleader from your videos. <laughs> you have a positive energy, which, Probably yeah. what attracted me to your channel, the positivity. So speaking of which, let me start with that, my first question after how long we've been talking now. <laughs> yeah, I could yap for a long time. <laughs> well, that's, <laughs> that's good. I can listen for a long time. <laughs> All right. So uh, actually, I wanted to ask you just quickly about you have done some interviews on your channel, but they're not live interviews right. so far. Has that been because of your poor internet connection up to this point? Or do you just prefer the non-live interviews or? Their reason you know it's funny as a youtuber which i'm not but i am uh for uh, i've got two dogs three cats uh people coming up and making deliveries for the day right yeah. so when you're trying to do something live 
on the spot, it becomes difficult because we've got rattlesnakes here, for example, oh, wow. in California. So if I hear the dogs barking, I have to listen saying, what kind of bark is it? That, that just somebody's driving by or are they barking aggressively at a possible mm. rattlesnake? So I'm always on edge. So doing something yeah. live means I'm just going to bolt at any time. Right. Where if I pre-record things, I can set aside some time, do it. And if there was a disturbance, no big deal. Yeah. So doing something live, yeah, I, I want to do it because I, 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 I did one. I said I was going to play The Hobbit, the text adventure on the Oh, yeah, I, I remember and, that, yeah. And I did a short little test, and it went pretty well. People were there, uh, and I had fun. But I haven't really done a real one since, and I need to. Uh, I just need to find a way to, uh, maybe on a Saturday that my wife's here and the dogs are being entertained and she can handle the rattlesnake, which she won't. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't I either. That, but anyway, yeah, if there was a way that I could find, I'm going to have a solid hour no disturbance, then I can figure out a way to work live streaming into my channel. Yeah, well, I appreciate your time. And if you do need to pop away, then, uh, you know, don't <laughs> don't hesitate. We don't want any rattlesnakes uh, getting it's in your morning, dog. It's morning time here. Normally, the rattlesnakes are a bit more dormant. I already have typically one or two a year I have to deal with. But mm. yeah, I, I'm not a fan of snakes. And as long as they're away and not in an area that I'm walking by or my dogs are going to get to, let them be. Mm. But if they're right at the front door... Mm. i have a problem <laughs> yeah i remember actually in the video when you were testing my uh dungeon quest game you mentioned about there was a mountain lion in the area that your yeah. your, your wife had spotted that that's kind of uh concerning we get those two and they come out in the nighttime and you'll hear them making the weirdest screech and it took a while for us to figure out those were mountain lions but hmm. yeah we've got two dogs and mountain lions can take out full size uh you know dogs and sheep and stuff and yeah. We've got a, a new small younger dog, a corgi. They're about you know half the size of a normal dog. So I always worry that um, in one quick hop, yeah. that could change. So I'm always on edge a little bit, and I don't want to be because you've got to live. But at the same time, I want to be cognizant of it. So yeah, it is a yeah. worry here. Yeah. So so how do you deal with a rattlesnake? A shovel. Just hit it. Hit it with a shovel. You try to. Hopefully, they're not in a perfect little corner that you can't get to them. But you basically go to where you get a sharp shovel and you cut their oh. right where their head is and cut their head off. Well, wow, what if you miss? Isn't that kind of dangerous? <laughs> That's one of the yeah. It's like a video game. Throw yourself <laughs> in the lion's den. <laughs> wow. Instead of okay. Indiana Jones and I hate snakes and yeah, it's it just normally if I can get the dogs in the house and let it be, I'll let it be. But yeah. there's times where I've let it be and it's still there an hour later, and you walk by it and it starts rattling. So it's okay. This son of a bee is not leaving. And oh. I've got to do some stuff. So out comes the shovel and you try to put yourself in a good position and whack. Well, yeah. And then it takes a good five minutes because after you uh, kill a snake, they're still doing their thing. Huh. So yeah, it's, it's strange. And I don't like killing stuff. As I get older, yeah. you get closer to your maker. <laughs> I don't like killing anything. So I tried not to do it. And hopefully I don't have to do it again this summer. Yeah, actually, just last night, actually, I saw a... I guess it was a written uh, interview that someone did with you about fishing, your fly fishing. And I think it wasn't there that you mentioned that you normally up until recently, I guess, would just catch and release your fish, which I always thought you just caught them and ate them. And that's the normal thing fishermen do, no? No, yeah. Catch it in fly fishing. It's a bit different than spin casters and people going after bass and that and such. A lot of fly fishermen catch and then release. And oh. there are some that will keep, but most of the time it's kind of a sport of uh, where the trout are, try to catch them, take a picture in some cases, then release. In the hmm. 13 years I've been doing fly fishing, I've only taken two fish. And they were oh. of a species that they want you to take because uh, they're not native in an area and they say, please take them, kill them. Or... them. Uh, but I've only taken two in my whole time doing this. <laughs> oh, really? So after... After, I guess, whenever this article was, maybe like nine or 10 years ago, when you finally ate your first fish that you caught, I guess. So even after that, you just kept catching and releasing? Yep. And I've only oh. had one other one since then. The last one I took was, I'm in. I'm ready for another one. It, every five years, I seem to go through an itch like, I need a native brook trout. Brook trout tastes oh. wonderful. Mm. Uh, and they are typically not a species that, pe that fisheries want in a particular area, in yeah. some areas. 
So yeah, if I catch a brookie and it's in the right area, home comes one or two and a fish fry on a brook trout. <laughs> is that um, the catch and release way of doing things? Is it because do you think the fly fishing is more of an art of how you actually catch the fish rather than okay. maybe, I don't know, is it different from a real fishing that they just want to pull in as many as they can? It, yeah, in some areas, there's fly fishing waters only, and you want more fish to be there for the next angler that's going to come in and enjoy. Oh. And if you decimate, it's just like people, if you tell them of a secret spot, that spot is no longer secret. Mm. It becomes overrun by people and trash and garbage. Mm -hmm. Same way with fish. If you basically, everybody takes there's going to be less and less for enjoying uh, the art of catching fish and letting them go and then spawning and having more. So there's a balance to anything. And right. uh, yeah, I think mostly a balance, but yeah, a lot of fly fisher, I think they're just in it for learning how to read a water where trout can be is just an art in itself. And it's a lot of fun. Mm. And before we get into our actual, we're supposed to be talking about retro stuff, I think. <laughs> it's, it, it's general about anything, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Well, this is just so interesting. I know you have a much more varied background. Well, I don't know, but I assume you have a much more varied background than the small snippet of glimpses we see in your channel. And right. even your channel is varied to, to, to some degree. And before we get back to that, I just have one last question. I wanted to ask you about the article that i read it mentioned something i forget the name of it but i had to google it 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 was about some technique that you take the bones of the fish and you make a tea out of it or something is that what what was that yeah so it, in, in J uh, japan one of the things shiozaki i think is the, the way to say it i may not be pronouncing it right but uh, there is a particular way to when you catch your fish to then cook it and and you typically do gut it but then you can run a skewer in a certain way through the fish and then you stick that skewer in the dirt next to an open fire and you put a lot of salt on it and you cook it near a fire kind of slow cooking and then at the end show your appreciation kind of like for some hunters there's some hunters that will you know thank you for this bounty that you've given me whether they have a prayer or something in silence or they say grace at dinner same type of thing you're basically um saying a thank you to the fish basically for letting me eat you which is kind of weird to a vegetarian uh but yeah you're basically showing your appreciation for it and that you're not letting any of that fish go to waste so even with the bones there's some people that actually eat some bones mm. i don't uh but yeah you're showing a, a last little uh homage to that fish and you're putting the bones into a pan and doing a particular thing with some uh, oh. uh sake and and then you drink that? Drink it, yeah. Drink yeah. it, yeah. Did you yeah. say you're vegetarian? Is it Yes and no. So oh. all my life, my wife and I were born and raised meat eaters. But about two, we've always toyed with some vegetarian eating less meat. About two and a half years ago, uh, we uh, needed to put one of our older pups to, uh, to bed, if mm. you know what that means, to rest. And uh, I had a, a move just at that point, And I kind of told my wife that, you know, we've toyed with being vegetarians for so long. Why don't we make a more, uh, a, a more pushed effort. to try to do it. And yeah. in the last two and a half years, we still do periodically eat meat. Typically Monday through Thursday, Monday through Friday, we're mostly all plant-based vegetarian. Hmm. If meat comes into the picture, like fowl of some kind during that time or fish, Sure, we're not going to shun it out. But normally, weekday, we're more veggie. On a weekend, if we're out and about, will we have a chicken sandwich? Yes. But we eat considerably less meat. And uh, typically, when we do, it's not red meat. It's typically uh, chicken or fish. Yeah. And we don't do it all the time. So I would say we're 80% vegetarian now. Uh, I've got a lot of plant-based burgers and uh, fake chicken nuggets and all those things that we've learned to enjoy some of them. Uh, but yeah, it was just kind of one of those things that as learn you get older, <laughs> you learn to enjoy to meet, them. You're going to meet your maker. So it's like, I don't want to purposely try to kill things for my benefit. Hmm. And I know even with vegetarianism, you're still killing stuff. If people are, if you go buy a head of lettuce, if it's not organic then it could be a chance that they use pesticides that in turn killed something. So there's always that 
argument, but in my feeling, I we we eat less meat and we're killing a few less things in our lives as we get older. Hmm. And that makes us feel good. That's all. So you have you try to have positivity in every aspect of your life, it seems. Trying to, yeah, as best as we can. Yeah. Yeah, I've tried those um impossible patties for the burgers. I actually prefer those to real meat. Because you yes. don't get the little piece of gristle and bone and, <laughs> and whatever. They're, they're I like them. They're very good. Yeah. Very good. The bit out of all the ground round, that's the one impossible. I love oh yeah. It. Yeah. And they're not as common as some of the other <laughs> ones. But uh, yeah, I, I like those. I saw in one of your videos you were you, someone sent you some jerky, some non beef yeah. jerky that you uh, seem to enjoy. That was through the Aquarius group, and I'm an Aquarius user. I'm trying to remember, was her name Heather? Been a, <clears> she's <throat> not a sounds familiar. Much, but she lived in an area that had some uh, jerky that she wanted to try. And she sent me a cassette of her game that she made and some of that jerky. And it was quite good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, It looked like it. So that's um, that one of my questions. But I, I, that's an interesting point that she sent you a cassette of her game to try. And actually, I remember watching that video, obviously, because I just mentioned the, the jerky. Right. But um, how... I'm not sure if she made that game specifically intending to send it to you to try. I think maybe I remember seeing a note, something about that, that, oh, I, I didn't know TJ tests games or something. I'm going to go send him my game. Does it make you feel good to know that you're, well, even with my games, you're kind of an instigator for motivating people to make content or games that they specifically plan to send to you to see your reaction? Yeah, I think so. And like you I, uh, said, you know, there's some people that will, uh, when you watch them, you learn, oh, I could have did this differently. Oh, I can see a bug now. Oh, uh, I can understand how somebody that doesn't play much will see it this way. There's so much good that somebody can learn from a commoner like me that's not a video game expert that will come in and, and they'll pick up some good things. So, yeah, I think it's a cool thing to have somebody somewhat wet behind the ears try your stuff. Yeah, I, for me as a, well budding game developer it's actually i think very valuable and perfect to have someone like you because as i'm sure you know a lot of the specy games in particular people never see the ending they never get anywhere near the ending even though <laughs> ironically a lot of those games are so short because of the memory limitations that were in the devices back in the day so you think well it's such a short game i'm gonna make it through it but they they try to make it so difficult to try and <laughs> let you play longer that you never get to the right. end so it's kind of ironic in that way so i think it's good i think for someone like you and i would prefer to see games at least they don't necessarily have to be easier but would you enjoy it more to play a game that you knew you had a chance to get to the ending would that motivate you to play it longer do you think yes and my favorite game right now on the specy next is night night and probably the reason that I like it that much, it is a game in my field and what I typically excel at, but they made a seven level uh, game as a demo. And it took me a little bit, but I got and finished and got to the end where it said, hey, congrats, oh. made it to the end. And it made me feel good. Like, damn it, I finally, last game I won was Zork 1. <laughs> that was a while ago. That's the only game I've ever actually completed, Zork 1. Uh, I've never completed any other game, so it made me feel good. And now I'm bolstering that Night Night is my favorite game, and they have an 80 level one that's coming out with the Kickstarter too. Wow. And and it is a game that I will seriously try to now complete. The yeah. Night Night that you completed, that's from back in the day. It's not a modern, or is it a modern remake of the game? Or? Modern remake of the game for the Specky Next that David Safier, I believe, was the main person behind it that made. Uh, for the Specky Next Kickstarter 1. And then as part of the Kickstarter 2 uh, bonus things that you would get, if we hit a certain level, he would make the game more levels. And we, of course, made those uh, things. And now we're getting get one, I think, this summer. He just teased the 17-minute video of more levels that they've done, and it looks awesome. I love oh, it. Oh, cool. All right, we're back. Had a slight glitch there. Had to restart. I forget if you answered the question that I asked you about the uh, why you don't do live recordings. What was the answer to that one? 
uh yeah because because you're too busy and you have to go kill rattlesnakes right right exactly (laughs) yeah (laughs) my whole life's an adventure here so finding time to stream live uh yeah (laughs) Yeah. okay all right on to my first question yay (laughs) we made it i completed the video game (laughs) (laughs) making progress here (laughs) so my first question was about why you were motivated to begin a channel to begin with why did you start doing youtube to begin with your channel is actually not retro computer related when you started i think right because it's called mac society actually did you start it to feature mac stuff uh well my before uh i became a professional fly fisherman like i am now (laughs) working for a fly fishing company uh from late 90s until uh 2011 ish i had my uh, own company where i provided apple Macintosh computers at the time, iMacs, to retail stores as point-of-sale computers. Uh, So I uh, would sell iMacs and put a special point-of-sale software on there. Mm -hmm. And I worked with a franchise company that had a franchise of stores at malls. And I was their computer person, their IT, their tech support. So I uh, started as an employee for them, but then I peeled off and made my own company, contracted back for them. So yeah, Mac Society was my uh, company name, uh, and I sold Max as, yeah, point of sales specialist. So oh. that's why you see that name. So your YouTube channel was to promote the business? I uh, just business? have a avenue to put videos if I needed, uh, oh. but mostly it was put there for making silly videos to show your friends and family and mom, dad, uh, like everybody else, what's this YouTube thing? Let's make mm-hmm. a video. And in the early days, um, uh, I would put you know a, a little bit of fishing on there, so nothing really businessy related at first. It was all for pleasure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And has your motivation for making videos changed over the years? Now, yeah, two thousand and seven yeah. is when I started YouTube, but I like everybody else put a video on here once a year type of thing. But around two thousand seventeen, when the Specky Next was introduced, and I got wind of their Kickstarter and started exploring Sinclair and learning about it. I then started documenting and buying older Speckies to get familiar with what a Sinclair is. Do I want a Specky next? And I thought making videos of my progress and my adventure would be fun for me, fun for other people to view. So I started becoming more, okay, I found a niche, one that's going to take some time, and let's really get into this youtube part of making videos more often and then before i know it i'm making practically a video a day video every other day at worst so anywhere from 15 videos a month to almost 30 a month Uh, crazy uh but yeah that's how it all blew up retro vintage computers if you uh look back at the old tj videos you can see a real um evolution of your personality and the way you approach the videos Yes. You used to be unbelie- unbelievably subdued and a lot more quiet in your videos. And now you've really, you, you weren't the madman you are today. Right. Yeah. For lack of a better term. Just Do like you... when you get to know someone, you take that girl out on the first date and you're typically watch your P's and Q's and you're a little bit more yeah. uh, not sure what the, the borders are. Before you know it, you start pushing those borders a little bit and letting your true personality show and then let it loose. And that's what I did. <laughs> well, it, it seemed like that period went on for quite a while for you for years. I don't know if that's because you weren't publishing as anywhere near as many videos as you are today. But I'm wondering, has your involvement in the retro computing hobby, did that spark a passion for you and give you more excitement for really coming out and showing your personality in, in the videos? Yeah. Recently? Because on when you create groups like Facebook groups and avenues and meet people is when you start uh, softening it up and starting showing your true self. So I think it just was a matter of uh, time of starting out, getting your feet wet, learning the avenues of things, and then relaxing and not worrying about anything if I say something wrong. And then so it takes some time. So I think I probably cautiously... Uh, you know, was a little bit softer at the beginning. But then as soon as I I started doing these things, they were pretty exciting. So at the first time, you know, okay, 
unboxing a computer. Yeah, this looks cool. But when you start playing the games and start understanding why they did something that way is when you start forgetting a camera is watching you and you just start naturally playing. Yeah. And that's, I think, the progression is now I no longer have to uh, think that this camera's there. It's never there. I just turn it on and, blah, 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 and do just my thing. PJ. Yeah. How much of an effect, if at all, do you think it has been to have the community obviously kind of welcome you and interact with you when you start probably a channel, maybe not yeah. yours because you've been doing it for so long about different topics, but I would think normally when someone decides to start a channel and they have a particular topic in mind, they may not be sure like me, how well it's going to be received, how the community is going to welcome you. And obviously you've been very well received. I'm guessing, does that help motivate you to be your, yourself in videos? Absolutely. Yeah. And then if I had too many negative uh, messages back, it would have probably took me down some notches. So uh, yeah, I think just in general, people are probably cautious, like, who is this person? Why is he making a video? Why is he putting a link in a Facebook group about it? You, uh, and then you worry that you put a link in a Facebook group too often. People will say, you know, I don't want to see your face every month or whatever. So, yeah, there's some caution on both sides. But then I think once people see that I'm not a YouTuber doing this for money, I don't make that much money. I mean, you, you, anybody I, gets I, I know how it works. Yeah. It makes enough yeah. to basically buy a few beers here and there kind of yeah. thing. Well, you're but lucky to pay your thing. internet, I think, right? What you were saying with your... Just about. Yeah, yeah. not quite, but just about <laughs> on a good month. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I think um, there's that caution. And I think at the, you always get those few like, oh, he's a YouTuber. He's doing it for free stuff. He's doing it for money and stuff like that. But I think once people start seeing your, uh, that I'm doing the same exciting thing from five years ago now, maybe this guy is not faking it. Maybe he's truly passionate yeah. about it. People can be passionate and show just because your personality is not like that doesn't mean that there's other people that have a personality that's more bubbly or whatever. And yeah. I think once they get past that saying, yeah, this guy's the real deal. He's not faking it. You can't fake it in, at a certain point. So, yeah. And so there was that worry, but, um, most of the stuff I got back was pretty positive. There's still a few negative things that pop up. And I think some probably pe people that are very, uh, n very knowledgeable, very smart, you know, TJ smart, they're smart. They know the next in and out or whatever, that they probably still don't maybe like me or like my personality. They don't want to be friends with me or whatever, which is fine. Everybody's, you can't click with everybody. Uh, but it's kind of sad that they don't give you an opportunity to, you know, enjoy something and think that you've got some ulterior motive behind yeah. it. So I'm sure there's still some of those, but that's the way of the world. Not everybody's going to like you and I don't have to like everybody else. So it goes both ways. Yeah. Yeah. The, what you said there kind of leads me into my next question after this one. <clears throat> um, when you talked about not being an expert, but before I get to that, um, your videos, it's kind of a funny thing for all of us that, in probably most videos, there is some sort of promotion to either join a Patreon or join someone's Patreon or make a contribution or like or subscribe or whatever. Even mine, of course, I have my, my own Patreon. Right. But I'm guessing, I don't know, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but <clears throat> for me, making videos is not about making money, but you think, well, as long as I'm making videos, why not put some sort of subscription thing there where like you say you can help pay for the internet or whatever right. and so it kind of i don't know if it uh gives people an impression like is this person doing this for money or are they really passionate about it with you it's obvious you're passionate about the retro computers and the videos you make but do you find that it's that's something that makes you think about whenever you try to promote anything in your videos or do you think, well, gee, I'm really doing this for my passion, but at the same time, I do have this thing I want to promote in case people do want to contribute. Does that create any conflict for you at all? Or Yeah, a little bit. I don't want people to think that I'm in it for the money, but I'm also not stupid. If maybe, say, watch, watching a video at some point, I make it made a joke, QVC. Have you ever watched QVC, that type of thing? I would probably be a good employee for a company like that because yeah. I'm typically you can give me anything 
And sure, there could be some negative parts about it. And I'm not worried about saying, yeah, this might not be the best for that. I'm always truthful. But I've got a personality to basically represent practically anything. So I would be lying if I didn't have a little inklet saying that a QVC would run across a video of mine and say, I love your personality. I get so many uh, messages of you made my day. You, you, you're so enthusiastic about something. And I was down in the dumps. And I watched a video of yours and it made me feel good to some uh, a number of folks that have an ailment, cancer, going through chemotherapy, messaging me saying, you know, you made my day. I've had a pretty shitty day and I watched one of your videos and I took my mind off of it. Those things make you feel good. It's yeah. way, worth uh, way more making somebody feel good than having, you know, the money side of things. Yeah. But I'd lie if I couldn't say I could do this for a living. Uh, how wonderful would it be yeah. to do what you love? And fortunately, I love fly fishing. I love Tinkara. I'm part of the original company that introduced this method of fishing to the United States because it's very unique. Mm -hmm. And I'm proud of that. So I I work for a company that I love. My goodness. I, who <laughs> wouldn't want that? And yeah. if I could also do something on the side that I equally love, and over time, a lot of people liked it, and you made a, enough to pay the rent, per se, it's great. Exactly. So, e even if you're not expecting to get rich from this it doesn't hurt to have all the stuff set up in the background just in case your videos do go viral if somebody does catch on to you and why not right. have it ready to go like i said you're not stupid why why not have something set up just in case yeah and would it change me later i don't think so i'm i mean i've had times where when i had my own company i made five times as much money as i do now guess what i took a huge <laughs> cut to do something i love hmm. So I, I, I try to talk the talk and walk the walk. Uh, so I don't know if big money would ever change me. I don't think so. Uh, but I, you never can say for sure. But yeah, I'm not in it for the money. But at the same time, if people are uh, wanting to help push something and push word out about the next and the Aquarius and all these things, I'm a good cheerleader for it. And I enjoy doing it. And if it helps others get into it, I, I'm all for it. Yeah. And you mentioned previously that you said you're not an expert other people have more knowledge than you and, and all this about all these different systems that you owned and the games and the hardware and the accessories and all that but i was thinking about that actually and if you look at your videos a lot of your videos are actually informative and even though you're not you don't claim to be an expert in in any of this you do have videos that actually provide information and some of them are of a technical nature that people can learn from, even right. if you're not an expert trying to give every detail about these things. For example, your videos on some accessories like mass storage devices for the Oric, for example, uh, a separate power supply for the, uh, uh, what is that computer? I keep forgetting the name, the Coleco Atom. Oh yeah. So that people might not know <clears throat> about these tech devices that you introduce them to in the videos. Right. So it seems like kind of accidentally without meaning to you are kind of not being an expert but you're introducing maybe new technology to people who might not have heard of it before yeah and on some things i guess maybe where i'm not an expert is i'm not a programmer i'm not a guru i don't like math so there's certain things that i don't excel at that if you really know the platform you do but i'm probably someplace in the middle where i know more than half the people and 50% less than the other. So I come at a angle of, and I want to be humble too. I don't want to be a know-it-all. I don't want to be that. And I don't like other people that do that. So I try to be humble at the same time. So I may say, I don't know this that well. And, and I'm trying to be truthful about it. And I just want to come off as humbly learning, being there. And, and I may not have the right exact answer, probably close, but you may want to do your own homework just in case. Give yeah. them opportunities to want to, look further into it more than just past my two cents because my two cents may not be perfectly correct yeah but there it is interesting even if you don't provide every technical detail it provides people i think enough to get started and right a jumping board for them to do their own research and learning right exactly i think there's even i think i learned something from your video let me just grab this little device here i think you recognize this guy Yes, sir. <laughs> well, this thing, I'm pretty sure I got the notion for this from your video. 
And I don't know if I should thank you or curse you, but this is, <laughs> if people don't, you want to tell people what this is? Yeah. So in the United States, uh, Tandy, Radio Shack basically made a, a lot of TRS-80 type of computers. And they made a little one that's a little fatter than a, a, a Sinclair ZX-81 or Timex TS-1000 for us USA blokes. But it was a small color computer that was even more limited than a lot of the other, kind of like the Aquarius. The Aquarius is really neat and limiting to some, but it was a color computer and it had sound and the MC-10 is the name of the computer. And this gives the MC-10 an SD card for loading whatever the heck you want to load, games and everything. So uh, any time that you can get by and not use a cassette that's aging and having read-write issues is a good thing if you want to use it on a daily basis. Yeah, and that's when I saw you uh, talking about this, because you have one of these things, obviously, and you were showing it in one, one of your videos. And you mentioned that this thing is really hard to get. It's rare, but you happen to be at the right place at the right time looking at the website and you snagged one. Right. So I thought, holy cow, I better see if I can snag one. <laughs> because it looks like an interesting kind of underdog computer for development. Yes. But these things are, the prices for these things are ridiculous on eBay here and the shipping yeah. is crazy. And I'm not sure exactly how good a platform it is for, or how enticing it is for development. That green screen kind of puts me off. I'm not sure. So I haven't yet pulled the trigger on the actual device. Right. But there's an emulator for it. And if I ever do, I'm ready. I'm ready to go with this. <laughs> well, the, the TRS-80, like any other platform, has a huge following. And they've got the, T, you know, the, the, the Model 1, 2, and 3. And the MC-10 kind of comes in the, in the mix as being one of those. And even the Dragon. The Dragon is basically like one of those TRS computers just made for over in Europe. So right. the MC-10 is really a huge underdog. It's like an Aquarius, maybe even worse off than an Aquarius, but it's in a bigger realm because TRS-80 is huge, where Aquarius, there was nothing else. It was Aquarius only. Yeah, um, and, and they and didn't I, sell Aquarius at Radio Shack. Right, exactly. Not that I know of, and I don't remember ever seeing one there. At Kmart, maybe. It's been so long. Yeah. Yeah, I never had these computers back in the day. Like I said in my videos, my first computer was a TS-1000. That's what I could afford, but it was good enough for me at the time. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it might be, if you like the Aquarius, every, there's a gentleman, his name's Jerry something. He's been posting almost a new game for the MC-10 every week. And they're pretty toned down, blocky games. Yeah. But there's a handful of games that people have done machine code with that are really good, like a Pac-Man kind of game. Yeah. So there is some power there if you want to harness what's in that little device because that's got extra memory in it. And um, it's a nifty little thing, yeah. Well, that's the whole thing for me is to have modern storage. I'm not going to develop a game for an audio cassette tape. That's just, right. <laughs> to me, that's crazy. Like, right. Yeah. Even though there's a contingent on the Specky that does that and you get all these uh, uh, Corona Soft, I'm trying to remember the name of the company but they make a whole bunch right. of for the specky on cassette and uh, yeah, actually having Good said old. that i do have some of those because as you probably know i'm a collector so i have <coughs> so i have like this love that game oh yeah it's so ASCII, good it's all ascii characters yes. no graphics whatsoever yeah it's awesome yes. i made a video on that one did you yeah, you long did? time ago. How, how did I miss that? <laughs> it's really good. I'm, I'm, for this is for the for the Spectrum 48K. That's the video yeah, you made. For the, I, oh. Yeah, I played that a long time ago on the Specky. All right, long I'm gonna have to uh, go through my small collection here and give you a little quiz and <laughs> see see how you uh, <laughs> see if I this one it. I have. Uh, is this backwards when you read it, or is it good? No, it's it's correct. Yeah, I have not played that yet. FedEx Adventure. So that's like, well, you might be able to see kind of the... Oh, okay. It's like a ZX81 version of, of Adventure. Oh, nice. And you even put that in your Dungeon Quest game. A little uh, of a Atari Adventure. Yeah, I like to kind of give a nod to the classic games we grew up with, which everyone should be, I think, <laughs> thanking the people who developed those. Otherwise, there would be no video game industry. Right. And back then... I remember back in the days when these computers first came out and being interested in video games and computers back then 
you were the weirdo, you were the oddball. And, but I think people have got some new, this video game thing is not just a fad. It's going to be huge, which right. obviously it is. Although having said that, I'm not a huge fan of what video game the ind industry has become churning out endless copies of multi-million dollar first person shooters. Right. With, but then what are you going to release blocky graphic games today? That wouldn't work either. So I'm not sure. I guess that's why we're in the niche that we are. We have a, a fondness for the nostalgic games, but we're still trying to kind of push the limits and see what, what new elements we can bring to this yeah. hobby. Right. All My right, video next. I just put up this morning is all about what you just said about reminiscing of the old uh, and enjoying the old, but not being afraid to move on and add some new. My whole video this morning, and I called it the next epiphany because Epiph yeah, I, I just watched that. Yeah, if the next has more in it than what we're seeing, and I think there could be if there was something right uh, for it to do that. So yeah, there was something interesting about that video you mentioned about it the next maybe being able to go out online and grab content that you it might think you're interested in and right. actually I had a question about that specific video that occurred to me did you mean by that you were wanting the next to grab any content you might be interested in or just games and computer related content i think it could be either either or but since i was in a game mode i was thinking that since i like throwing people into the lion's den and playing a new game having it yeah. reach out and you know, tell you, here's a game you need to try. But I think it could be really for anything. I think yeah. it, whether it's a next story, a next update about the next Kickstarter, anything. I think it could technically do anything. But the immediate thought was a serving you a daily, how you to do? And here's a new game you might want to try. And yeah. yeah, yeah, that would be cool. There was actually a video I saw about the next, I think it was the next chatting with itself on chat GTP. Did you happen to I see watch that? that? Yeah, it's chatting with itself, asking itself about the next. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it's a cool video. That scares me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that does scare me. Yeah, I do. So I do have some audio. Well, I don't know if you'd call these audio cassettes. I guess they are technically audio cassettes, but I don't use them. I don't even have a cassette player. A lot of the stuff I collect is still shrink wrapped. I don't. <laughs> I, I I just collect things, which I know is taboo for you. You to you, that's a crime to collect thing and not take the shrink wrapping off. I think, right? Right, exactly. You like that quilt that's up on the wall behind you? Now, this one I don't use. It's a, a Volkswagen Beetle quilt that my mother-in-law made. Yeah. It's an artsy piece, but she's also made other quilts, and I bundle up in it every winter when I'm cold. So mm -hmm. use what you got. But there are some things like that. I wouldn't want to screw that one up because that took a lot of time. But yeah. yeah, use anything that you get. Otherwise... I don't know. I'd have a hard time sitting there looking at it going, oh, it wants to come out and play. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's kind of a double-edged sword, I guess. I can understand both sides of the feeling on that because there are so many, well, items that are already opened, already in use that you can use. So on the one hand, you think, well, why why would people buy something that's still in its new conditional, new condition, shrink-wrapped condition, just to rip it apart and use it right so you know should you say well let's preserve that one in its shrink wrap and it'll never get used <laughs> is that a wasting it and just use ones that are already open or should you make use of it so it actually serves a purpose and gets used yeah uh -huh. it's a double-edged sword like you said yeah. yeah so another question about youtube is as obviously it's more work than it seems to make these videos do you ever feel pressure to make a video for the sake of making a video thinking i haven't made a video in a while or you think of something that well i have an idea this would make a good video or are all your videos something that you're passionate about and you just happen to turn on the camera and say okay maybe someone else would like this too yeah i think majority of what i do for surely there has to be a passion behind it because i'm not afraid to go black for a week or two or whatever i tend not to uh there's, there is maybe a little bit of a pressure to keep up with it, to give you more opportunities to have people find your channel. But I think overall, I'm not afraid to put that to rest at the same time and say I need a week uh, of not doing anything. Uh, so, yeah, it's a tough one. But I would say majority of what I do is all definitely – I don't think I turn on the camera when I'm not ready. Uh, I hmm. And I even persevere through allergies and other 
ailments because I'm excited about what I'm about to do. Right. And I hopefully, even though I'll say I may look stoned right now, but I am excited about this. So I still want to present and to show that I'm still excited about whatever it is I do. Yeah. So when you, I remember there was one time you weren't making videos frequently for a while and you actually made a video about that. Where is, where, where where's my videos? Right. Right. So, and you said, well, I kind of need a break. It's kind of getting too much. And uh, I'm just going to take some me time for a while. Right. And do, when you do that, do you find that you miss it and you come back because it's calling you back or if I'm, I'm guessing you, I think I kind of know the answer. You, you'd probably don't find it an obligation, but do you miss it when you're not making videos after a while? I may miss it. Like I just did something that would have been great on video type of thing. And like if I'm out fishing, trying to make a video of you fishing is very difficult. <laughs> you have another thing that's not going to want to cooperate. Fish aren't going to go, yeah, I'm going to hop on your hook. <laughs> trying to make a video of you uh, stalking a fish and reading the water is very difficult. So mm. there's times I've went through a process and I go, man, that was like perfect. Mm. It would have been great on video. But at the same time, having your own personal thing that's not on video and it's only between me and the fish and nature watching me at the time yeah. is kind of special. So yeah, I, I don't worry about it too much. And I try to time any time away with like maybe a trip. My wife and I don't do any big trips. We don't, I've never been to Hawaii. Uh, we've never been out of the country other than Canada once and Mexico oh. once, and those were on cruises. So oh. most of our time off is camping. We'll go on a solid two weeks, roughing it, camping type of trip. So I try to take those, those times as this is me, my away time. I'm not going to make any videos or anything. So I try to yeah. time it to when I have a good downtime that I can get away from it, technology in general. Yeah, I find for me, I'm not sure if this is how it is for you, but for me making videos, sometimes I'm torn between something I know, well, I think would would make a good video, but that takes me away from other things that I would be doing if I wasn't trying to make videos for a YouTube channel, right. programming some game, learning programming or something. Do you find that you have projects that you have to sometimes decide between, well, I have a great idea for a video, but that's kind of keeping me away from this other thing I should be doing. Yes. Uh, and the one that steals a lot of my video time steals time away from me working on my old Volkswagen bus hmm. it's on the rack more than it is on the road. And I get mad at myself for being slow and lame. I'm not a mechanic, but I, 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 I try to learn as much as I can and do it, it myself. So getting out there doing a simple brake job may take me months, if not years in some points, because I'm hmm. so new to it. Um, uh, very methodical about it. I try to do it right. So yes, doing all these videos takes time away from me saying, today's Friday off. I'm going to go out and work in my shop all day. And and act, it, it may only be that I put this one little trinket on, but I get it done. So mm -hmm. yeah, I think making videos takes a time away from other more relaxing hobbies like fishing or not relaxing, but just getting stuff done on my Volkswagen. I guess it's about a balance, right? Finding yeah. time for yeah everything. Do you find that since you're making YouTube videos now and there are different types of content creators, there are creators who just want the views, they just want the money, they know how to churn out a successful formula or not. And for them, it's um, a machine that they're keeping going and they may not have the same community involvement that you do. Do you find that having a YouTube channel that even if the views might be small, you have a dedicated, I think, probably viewership and they're that really appreciate what you do and they interact with you and they give you feedback. Do you find that feedback actually motivates you to make videos? Does that help spur you on that you might not normally make so many videos? Yeah, I would say if I didn't get feedback or thumbs up or notes, uh, anything in a video, I would quickly probably go from making 15 to 30 videos a month to one a week or something, because mm -hmm. it does spur you on that somebody likes what you do. And I don't think if you, if you throw that all out the window, what's the purpose other than for yourself? And yes, I love myself and I like documenting what I do, but it, it wouldn't be as fun doing it as a party of one. I prefer yeah. being a party of 10 
uh, people that are just friends yapping at each other. And when you get to know somebody a little bit better, you, you can give them little fun jabs and they jab you back, but they know it's in love and you're having fun. It's not mean spirited. So yeah. I'd rather it be um, amongst a small group of people that are, I call friends, online friends, than nothing at all. And I would say if I got no responses back at some point and viewership dropped down and started leaving, I'd probably peel off and start doing it less and less until you leave. Yeah. Yeah. But you'd still keep up the hobby? Uh, Yeah. For documenting it myself, I find making videos about a subject good for me to go back and view because I often forget what I did. Yeah. And I'm not good about taking notes that I can go back and read later later that makes sense also what the hell did i just say here so if i have a video that actually shows it um i love videos because it's worth a thousand yeah. words i can say that's what i did instead yeah. of looking at this going is that what <laughs> <laughs> what did i mean when i wrote that yeah. exactly how do you know so unless you see it in video so that so i would yeah. still do it but just not as often yeah it's kind of the same for me about taking videos i recently bought something from amazon a monitor mount for my monitors and I thought, I'll just take a video. I said, I'm not, I'm just going to mount this. I'm never taking it down. I'm not going to return it. But just in case, I'll take a video of how all these parts came out of this stupid box. But right. luckily, I did that because the mount didn't fit. So I had to return it. So, yeah. <laughs> and you had to put this puzzle all back together again in the box. <laughs> exactly. And Mark. I still didn't, uh, I still had trouble with it. Right. Yeah. So another question about your videos is for me, I think one interesting and appealing thing about your videos is you're not there to teach people things i don't want your videos to learn some technical aspect it's like spending the afternoon with tj in his living room or right. maybe outside fixing his vw bus or whatever it's like i'm gonna do something that i think is cool you come along with me and we're gonna spend 10 15 minutes together talking about something cool absolutely and wasn't it like that back in the 1980s when you had your first computer you invited your friends over to play video games and share that time with and drink and do all those fun things that come along with little parties. So I, I like to invite people into my home per se and join with me doing it. I even started a series. I wish I would have did it more, but it's very dry. I started reading the Spectrum Next manual and reading it together with the person yeah. online watching me and doing what the manual just said to do. And I would show it and type it in and see what it shows. So it's like you, friend, coming over for the day. who are reading this book together to learn how to program. I think I got to like chapter two. And it was, I think, informative. But the amount of views was pretty low in terms of compared to everything else. Yeah. And there was actually a couple of people said, oh, I wish you kind of kept up with it. But it was very dry. It was very precise. I'm less of a, a, a dry and precise person. Yeah. So I like to just come on over. Let's have fun. I don't want to take things too seriously because if I have to take it seriously, then I'm. it's not going to be as fun. So I think I remember the videos you're talking about. I think you did one on bank switching for the next. That one was a good one. That wasn't in yeah. the book, but that was one that I did that I definitely wanted to document because... My my game, Invasion of the Cloud People, The Next Storm, I did 10 levels and wanted to make 13. Yeah. I have completely forgot everything, how to program, where is my last file that I did, yeah. and how to do banking again, because I'm going to have to bank the hell <laughs> out of three more levels to fit it in, because I was maxed out, and I was getting memory issues of the program getting eaten away, basically, at the end, because of memory issues. So that's when I learned I had to do some banking. Because even though the Specky Next has a lot more memory, you can still only access X amount of that 48 or 64K or right, whatever yeah. it is. So I'm going to have to go back and watch that video yeah. and learn how to do it again. And I've completely forgot. That was actually a very interesting video. I learned technical stuff from that video. So some of your videos are technical. Yeah. And I learned, and I think probably in the video I said, this is not me learning, uh, knowing how to do it and taught myself. I uh, was shown by kind of somebody else and and they basically helped because I think some of it was documented and I couldn't get it to work. And I posted it in a Facebook group, the next basic group saying, mm -hmm. I'm running into this. And they said, well, did you try this? This is what you need to do. And then I would do that and go, okay, that would work. And I had some people also email me snippets of code 
saying, TJ, look at this. I think it will be helpful. And I'd take that snippet and go, I make sense. <laughs> Let's <laughs> move that snippet in here and adjust it. So if it was all relied on me, it would have never worked. But the nice thing about community is that you pick up on other people's skills and they teach you something and you document it like in that video so I can do it again. Yeah. And you're really good about giving credit to people. I notice in your videos, you try to give, you, you mentioned people's names. Oh, this person, Joe Blow, gave me the suggestion. They put me onto this link or whatever. Right. So uh, I think it's good that you acknowledge when you do get help and try to give people credit when they help you out. And that helps the whole community as a whole to foster that mentality. Yeah. And there's a handful of people in the Specky Next community that are wonderful with Next Basic, which is a great basic mm -hmm. that you want to learn how to program games and some that just have been there, done that, made games, and you can learn so much off of what they do. So, and I'm not afraid to ask questions. So if I run into a roadblock, I'll post it. And even if it's stupid and I get back a couple of you know messages like, yeah, you're pretty stupid, friend. None of them have ever been that rude, but you hopefully you don't them, like you really need to understand this. And I'll come out and say, I don't like math. I have nightmares that I've got a test that I didn't study for. So programming is a lot of math <laughs> to me. Mm, yeah. Uh, so I'm glad there's some people that are willing to take the time and try to teach somebody that maybe not an expert with numbers and to better understand it to where at least it dumps it down enough to where I can say, OK, I kind of get it now. Yeah. And you're helping a lot of other people too, who are in exactly the same boat, I'm sure. Right. But I understand your point about those types of videos. It's tempting to make a technical video. Sometimes you think, oh, I'm going to learn something of a technical nature programming, or I just learned something of a technical nature. And you think I'm going to make a video about that, but right. it's difficult. I actually tried to do that myself just recently. The other day, I thought I'm going to make a game, an adventure game from start to finish for the Specky. And I'm going to make it simple, but even trying to make a simple game from start to finish, it takes a long time trying to do the yeah. coding and everything. It just doesn't work sometimes. Right. So some things I think you just have to do in the background. Yes. Which leads me to my next question. But before I get there, sorry, I go off on tangents all the time. My brain is just kind of fluttering around. It does its own thing. You mentioned, <laughs> I guess a while ago now, we were talking about how the viewership of the videos and how you like to get the feedback and the likes and the comments. And of course, people like to get that stuff. <clears throat> but even though the viewership is low, if you're just, if you know that there's a small core group of people who really appreciate your videos, even if they don't comment or like, and you see maybe you get 100 views, 300 views, because I think your views typically are in the 300 ish range, right? If you don't get 300, that's probably unusual for you. I'm, Thinking. Yeah, I definitely hit that pretty easily now, but there's some that will be low. Um, typically, certain videos like around the spectrum next typically do pretty well. Yeah. So I may have a pretty good contingent there. But I would say normally they they start out uh, within a first you know couple hours. If it hits 100 something in a couple hours, that's pretty good. Mm -hmm. uh, but I would say in general, three, four hundred uh, views is pretty common for a video. And then as time progresses, you, I'll go back to a video that I did six months ago and it hit four or 500. It's relatively low, but at the same time, it's a number and it's people that watched it and may have got something out of it. So yeah. Yeah. And maybe it's the same for you, but for myself making videos, sometimes I just think, wow, I'm spending a heck of a lot of time making these videos and I'm getting a hundred views why am I doing this? Right. I didn't, right. I'm not doing it for the money to begin with, but at least I want someone to appreciate it. But then I'll get one comment that says, wow, <laughs> thanks for making this video. I really learned a lot. So uh, even if uh, one person gets something from your video, that's something that history can't take back from you for that 15 minutes, 20 minutes, you've improved that person's life. You've right. given them some enjoyment in their life that is benefiting the planet in some way, right. some, some small way. So for me, that kind of spurs me on, even if I don't get thousands of views. Right. So maybe that's the same for you. I don't know. Absolutely. Yeah. Just, just one little thumb up, one little note about, Hey, I watched your video even, but one that actually gets something really out of it. And most of mine, I think what most people get out of it is just the enjoyment factor. Uh, but yeah, it makes you feel good and it spurs you on to do more. And, um, yeah. yeah. So even low quantities, 
uh, are perfectly fine. I've got a relatively small channel. And like I said, I've seen people that got 7 million people, but they've only got X amount of likes. And the numbers are very similar to what mm -hmm. I have, just you know, percentage wise, just on a different scale. Well, for those 100, 300 views, whatever, if you add that up over all your videos, how many minutes have you added to each of those people's lives right. enjoying your videos? That's that's yeah. a big contribution, I think. A million views. There you go. I just, I mean, for a little, <laughs> a little uh, funny old man that looks like Santa uh, <laughs> making videos on YouTube somehow got a million views. Maybe that's not big in terms of numbers, but at the same time, they're saying it is. It's a congratulations. So there must be something behind it. Yeah. yeah. So. This uh, question I was going to leave for a bit later, but since you brought it up, I'll ask it now. How do you feel about or what would be your preference for your channel in terms of if you were to really blow up and be successful and make a lot of money and have thousands of views and hundreds of thousands of subscribers and it was in every measurable way successful, but you didn't have that same personal interaction with the community that you do now, which I think a lot of YouTubers, successful YouTubers probably do. You post a cat video that gets 20 million views. What interaction are you, you going to get? Nice cat video. But for right. you, I'm I'm guessing your interaction with the community is on a much more personal level. So would you be happy keeping a small channel with the number of views you have now? Or would you trade that for success and maybe losing touch with some of your Is there a viewers. middle ground that you can hit a particular number where you still have more views than what you expected you would ever achieve and at the same time be able to manage the quantity of people and having that personal touch? I would like to hit that point. Mm -hmm. What's the number? I don't know. Uh, but I've seen, you know, some people have a $50,000, not 50,000, 50, sub channel that still seem to be in touch yeah. with the people that they post videos about and you can see them making remarks. I think at a, a point, if I was completely not reading them and posting a at least a, a like and a thumbs up to making your comment, that's probably where I'd probably need to draw the line saying, I'm starting to lose a personal touch with this and maybe it's not great to push past it. But how, you can't turn it off either. <laughs> yeah right unless you say i'm gonna not do it anymore uh, maybe you just make less videos and therefore have less people start continuing to follow you but i'd like to find a, a nice balance like with everything if i can find a nice balance where i can have a larger uh, uh sub count and still be able to be personal think about it this way i so i have my uh facebook group sinclair society two almost two thousand members which is not small but it's not huge still quite a bit for work, I mostly manage by myself with the help of a couple of coworkers, a channel that's 8,500 people. There's a lot of work that goes into reading, making sure they're not stepping yeah. over the line, making sure spam people aren't getting into the mix, not allowing certain people in because you can clearly see they're spammers. It takes a lot of work. So I'm pretty good at juggling social part of my life. And mm -hmm. I think it shows because I've got, I like I said, a pretty nice little YouTube channel. Facebook group that's growing and I'm still very personal. And in my Facebook group, every time there's 10 or 15 new members, I put a little note in there. Come join the yeah. society. Thanks for joining. Uh, by the way, George is down at the corner selling tamales, just silly things, but I'm making it personal and fun. And, and I think I'm pretty good at managing more than what I have today. If it comes my way. Well, I don't see any negative comments in any of your videos that I can remember. So they're, they, you must be deleting them or handling them or whatever you're doing to eliminate that. I'll give you credit for that. So I leave the negatives as long as they're not nasty. If it's a porn link, they're gone. If it's straight out something to do with a platform uh, and they're being really rude or against myself or other people that are posting, yeah, I'll mark them uh, or uh, block them or whatever. But just negative contents in general, like, uh, I don't like what stop yelling or stop doing this. That's fine. That's their hmm. opinion. Yeah. And I just let it fly. Because yeah. there are, I think, I'm sure as you know, people who would watch your videos who may be getting a lot of enjoyment out of them, but not necessarily commenting or liking or well, yeah. probably they're subscribing. Like for me, for example, when I watch your videos, 
I I will rarely like the video and I will rarely comment. And I have reasons for that because if I were to start commenting on videos, then you're gonna see, you know, Jay Mundy every every video you're gonna get a comment from Jay Mundy and probably your viewers go, oh Jay Mundy. But uh <laughs> as far as the liking goes. There's just a simple kind of technical reason I don't do that because when I'm watching the videos on my TV, I have a category that says liked and I don't want it all clogged up. So I think right. gee, I'd really like to like these videos to to help encourage this content creator, yourself or whoever. But then right. I, think, I don't want my liked category to get all clogged up. So like for yeah. people like you, for example, I tried to give feedback in other ways like this type of interview, maybe sending you a game once in a while or a chat on Facebook, whatever. So. Right. There are other ways and you might not. Well, I'm sure there are people watching your videos who you don't you have no idea they're getting enjoyment from it. Yeah, I, I've had some that have kind, kind of said I've never remarked about your video before, but just wanted to give you, you know, a kudo on this or something like that. So, yeah, guarantee. And, you know, out of fifty two hundred subs and I only get X amount of video, you know, likes and stuff. You can kind of do the math. Yeah. Either some are, you know, maybe watching but not saying anything. And I would say the majority of people probably don't click like, yeah. which in the end doesn't help your YouTube channel grow. But at the same time, it is what it is. Yeah. If they watch my video. That's cool. And if they once in a great while say hi, that's cool. We all have our own lives. But your channel is growing. I mean, five thousand is not an insignificant number right. of of members. Yeah. Who would have thought? Yeah, I never thought I would get to, you know, a few hundred. And then yeah. once you start making videos and having a, a particular niche that you you enjoy, it, it starts hitting. And I've had, I had a funny comment um, a couple of days ago. A lot of people don't like the meme type uh, thumbnails that people put in YouTube videos, like that type of thing, you know, making that face. But if you look at any YouTube channels that have substantial size, it's pretty common. So my remark is, you know, they, I don't get your channel. You, you, you act like you or you make videos and present yourself like you've got a huge following, but you don't. And I don't get why you make, you know, basically those type of things. And it's like, why wouldn't you? If, if you ever seen that cat joke, there's nine pictures of a cat and it's the same face every time saying happy, sad, pissed off. And the face never changes. Yeah. What's that thumbnail telling the person? <laughs> Nothing. So why wouldn't you make a fun thumbnail of, or whatever it is, or a picture of something? So those questions don't make sense to me, but at the same time, it's their opinion. So I just said, well, thanks for the comment. Uh, yeah. That's your opinion. And I think ultimately you want to try to build your channel with the uh, thought that maybe one day something will go viral and they'll go look back at a catalog of, Shit, I didn't know about this person, and he's been around for five years. And look at all these funny ass videos he's made. Yeah. So you want to you want to put your best foot forward and, and and make the best video you can for what you know how to do. Those um, face in the thumbnail technique strategy. That's when I was researching doing before I started my channel. That's what they said has been scientifically proven. Put your face on that thumbnail because it's going to make people watch your video more than if you don't. And I think that's tr probably true. And yeah, you're right. People have their own opinions about whether that would be an annoying for them. And I can see how people would get tired of seeing people's face in the thumbnail all the time. But at the same time, it's your brand, right? Oh, there's TJ. Where's TJ's video? Oh, there's TJ. It's right. easy to spot you. So <laughs> it's perfect. Yeah, and right? I'm not saying I'm, I'm not beautiful, <laughs> but I have my particular look. And there's some people that may like that look because it gives them a feel of comfort or whatever it is. Yeah. So yeah, why wouldn't you represent? Uh, you yeah. want to put, and and so yeah, I'm not pretty, but I I am, and I want to show you <laughs> I'm enjoying this. Ta da! Well, <laughs> like you said, you're inviting people into your home to spend a few minutes with you in your living room, and if you're inviting someone to your home, are you going to send them a postcard to invite them in, or are you going to go to their door and show them your face to invite right. them to your home? Right. So it's right. more personal. Why wouldn't you? It's perfect for your personality, right? Yeah. So those questions never make sense to me, but I don't want to argue against it. It's like, yeah, I get it. Yeah. You know, it's fine. Everybody, you know, or I've had some saying, I purposely don't watch your videos because of your uh, thumbnail. Okay. Well, then they're missing out on your content then. <laughs> right. It's like, you're, it's like saying, I'm not going to eat this perfectly wonderful piece of chicken because I can see it's a chicken. <laughs> I don't want to eat it. Yeah. Uh, what are you supposed to do? It's just one of those... 
you know, man, wife, I've been married 33 years. So I yeah, think congratulations, by the like, way, yeah. men are men and women are women. And you're never going to fully get each other. Yeah. And you just at a certain point, it's like some things you just kind of scratch your head. Like, why is she mad at me right now? What did I do? It's nothing out of the ordinary. They're always right, TJ. Don't even bother to think why. Exactly. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> happy wife, happy life is true. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. That makes sense. So you're not going to order the chicken in a restaurant because there's a picture of it on the menu. <laughs> Doesn't really make sense, right? I prefer my menus in cookbooks. If it's a cookbook that's all text, I'm never going to cook from that cookbook ever. Yeah. If it has a picture of it, that's what it could look like, and that's what it should look like. Then I, it's inviting me to try to make it. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So to bring this back to retro computing a bit, with the Dungeon Quest game that I sent you, you know, do I have it here? So just a technical kind of point. On the back of my game, it's all text, as you obviously noticed in your unboxing. Yes. So the reason I did this and the reason I do a lot of stuff in my development is probably for better or for worse because of you, because I value you as a game tester, a game reviewer, a box opener. I find that all to be fascinating and interesting feedback. And so I don't want to put... For this one, I didn't want to put screenshots on it because I wanted to try, try and trick you into thinking it's a text adventure. It's <laughs> kind of, kind of works. at first. <laughs> right. So does that, like, obviously we're, times are different now. We're not going into the local community computer store and picking a game off a shelf and looking at screenshots. And of course, the screenshots available online, but does it make a difference to you? Like, let's say you were to receive a game and it's only text. Would you find it more appealing to find the screenshots or does it matter to you? The front of the box told me a lot immediately with the wizard, you know, type of thing in the front. That kind of invited me thinking that there's a graphic game behind Element it. to it, yeah. So I don't think I ever at any point when I read the back said this is going to be a text adventure. Uh, to mm -hmm. me. Oh, actually, yeah, I didn't want the packaging to intend it to say this is a text adventure but once you started it and you saw a text adventure i was thinking well he he wouldn't have seen any screenshots on my packaging right. but of course all the junk i threw in the in the instructions and stuff you probably saw hints of okay. the graphics but yeah you have to go through the graphic part first to start the game yeah that so i i don't think at any point i thought this is going to be a text only from what yeah. i had received and it was a complete shock receiving this box and it was a complete mm. shock receiving it because the Aquarius is not a huge platform. And having no. new games that you can get, like Roy has tons of games on cassette that you can order. So actually having a physical mm -hmm. copy of something for the Aquarius is strange in itself because there's not much out there. So just getting a yeah. box and going, what the heck? Aquarius? A box? What's going on here? So it was all fresh and it was an adventure just going through the box and figuring out what it is that I received. So the surprise worked somewhat. So that's good. <laughs> yeah, for me. And I don't think at any time I ever thought, is this only a text adventure? I don't think it ever crossed my mind. Okay. I'll have to work harder next time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I've seen uh, Roy's made like three or four games, maybe five now. And yeah. they've been quite well received. His bomb catcher and doomsday defender and all that for the Aquarius. Yep. So it's, it's, I think amazing that people nowadays are making games for these old systems. And what's even more amazing kind of is that for me, it's exciting to make games for these systems because we have these new technology available for storage and development and cross platform development. But I don't think Roy's doing that. I, just like you, when you cloud people, you guys are plugging away uh, these little rubber keys and it's like, okay, why weren't you doing <laughs> it for the last 40 years? You can... Yeah. Now I, have a I think I asked Roy this before. He said he loves the blue keys, but he's not that crazy. So I think he actually keys them in on something else. Oh, okay. I don't think he's doing the wee blue key, as he calls them, as he works through the program. I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure I asked him that. And mm. I think he said, no, I'm not that crazy. <laughs> oh, okay. So he may be doing something else. Now, I am. And You're I that crazy. My game's on the actual hardware itself. Uh, maybe because part of it yeah. is I'm not quite bright enough to figure out how to put everything like you did in place to make it and make it easier. But I also like keying in on the original thing too. It just, yeah. I, well, truth be told, I'm not that bright either. I really actually hate trying to get all those pieces working together <clears throat> and I'm lucky when I get it all working, but once it's working, 
then it's a lot easier to make the game. I can type on right. a real keyboard, somehow get it over, but it can be quite a pain. There's like several steps in these development processes that, and I've made videos about them. And it's, for me, it's a pain in the ass to set the thing up to begin with. And then when it breaks, like just recently, my whole computer crashed, my windows died. So I had to reinstall everything. Oh, but uh, yeah, I, I couldn't type on those rubber keys. Do you have your uh, Omni nearby or? or yeah, right here. I had never heard of this thing. What? So this is obviously a new, a modern <laughs> Frankenstein version of the Specky, but this is a 128, I think, right? Yeah, it's basically a 128 Specky built into a bottom, because they make it without the laptop. They just sell the bottom part alone, or you can get it as a laptop. Um, and it's a one-man okay. operational. I always have a hard time pronouncing his name, but Jordy, he's from over, I don't know if he's in Poland or what country he's in but he basically took a board that was designed it's called a harlequin and it's a board that's basically a uh specky uh, okay it's up to be a 128 version and he made mold or wherever he got the case from it says sinclair on it it looks for all practical purposes the keyboard everything is a sinclair and he made them and that's one of the first computers that and my ts2068 are the two first computers I received within days of each other back in 2018 or whatever it was. Hmm. My first two speckies. And did you have to put the screen on that or it comes fully assembled? No, nope. two different oh. packages that came in the mail and they weren't they coming in at the same time. They were shipped <laughs> from China. So I oh, think okay. Jordy has a link with China and they came in and they had a bracket that I think may have come in a third package and you had to put it all together and make it. And did you make a video about that? Uh, of the receiving of it, yes, and putting the original plastic bracket on because he made a metal one later. The plastic ones oh. would break, and okay. so he sold the metal one later. And so I've got videos on all that stuff. Yep. And that's what you use to make your cloud people. The original invasion of the cloud people for the Specky Forty Eight. The original one, yeah. So there's how different is the Forty Eight K version of your cloud people from the next version? Is it oh, a totally oh. total rebuild or? Yeah, the uh, premise and the idea of collecting raindrops and having the same nasty of a tornado, which is Twistertron, and Chakra, which is the lightning bolt, those characters all came into it, but it's the next storm for the next computer. And the idea is you still need to collect raindrops, but you, for the first time, get introduced to the actual cloud people. In my first game, it mm. was all collecting and getting to a portal and going to the next level, but you never saw a cloud person. In the second yeah. one, I introduced the cloud people. And at the end of the game, if you get that far, you can actually shoot the cloud yeah. people with a rocket. Yeah. So, I've, embarrassingly, I, just, I haven't played either of those versions, but one day I'll get to it. The first one is actually harder than the second. And the second one is more eye candy because it's got sprites and better sound yeah. effects and all that. Yeah, I actually don't play a lot of games. It has to really entice me to play it because I develop games more than playing them. But right. um I found your game very interesting as a developer for the elements that you put into it. Yeah. The cloud people, for example, well, for instance, the name itself, the cloud people, invasion of the cloud people, that's a cool name. You're instantly attracted to, you know, who, who your enemy is kind right. of, you don't know what the hell is a cloud person, but the name it, itself is cool. And the elements you put in there, you really, I think, draw people into the game with your identifying the enemies, the chakra and the twisted Tron thing. And you, you really, it really personifies this bastard feeling because you really hate those those things, I would think, when you're playing the game. <laughs> and those bastards come and take your exit or whatever they they do. Right. So I yeah, like that and element. I, and I'm limited on programming knowledge. And I like random in life because a lot of, you know, uh, games that you play, once you learn the pattern, you can get through that level forever unless it's a dexterity thing, uh, which is fun because once you learn it, then you can get further in. But I, in, as in life, like random. So you walk outside and a bird flies over and poops on you. What are the odds? Well, it's a random thing that that bird's supposed to, unless he's really, these birds have it out for you, but that's <laughs> random. So where in my game a thing appears is random. Why would I have it in the same spot every time? So I like random and the random may not be kind to you. And random in life is sometimes not kind to you because... Life can sometimes not be kind to you. So I just add that element. And maybe it's just because I'm not knowledgeable enough to 
put some other elements where the random is less random, but I liked it that way and it worked for me. And that's how I go with my game designing. I think I agree with that uh, philosophy of game design, whether it's accidental or technical limitations or whatever your reasoning for it is. I personally would rather have a game that is random and maybe unwinnable rather than and have to restart for that reason because oh shit it <laughs> the hail thing got me or whatever I, i'm i'm screwed i can't win there's no more exits left i'm done right i'd rather have to restart for that reason for some randomness that's you don't know what's coming rather than oh this game's too hard i have to start again i'm dead i'm dead i'm dead that to me is not fun restarting because it's just too hard and you can't get anywhere but at least with randomness you feel like you have a shot of winning yes. the thing and I add it into my game, and I even spell it out in the text that the word Harry Carey, obviously is suicide or taking taking your yourself out in, in order to progress. So part of my game is uh, that you need to at certain times take yourself out if you have extra lives because it's going to allow you to go forward. Otherwise, you've lost the game. So, for example, the portal mm. hears, and you know if the nasty touches the portal, no matter how many lives you've got, the game is over. And I said that at the beginning, but if I can't get there in time to touch the portal first, mm. but there's a red acid drop here that I could touch and kill myself. The game is not over. So I tried That's to say, strategy. Yeah. don't be afraid to take yourself out to progress. Uh, whether they read it or not is beyond me. Probably most people don't read that, that deep into it, but I put that element in there. And I do, if I remember take myself out and I've done it many a times where I've won the game later. Well, even if people don't read, I think they will develop that as a strategy on their own, which is another, I think, cool element of your game is that it's, it's, it might seem like a simplistic game maybe to you as the programmer and designer, but as someone like me, who's very critical about games, I don't like to see the same crap being churned out over and over again. I like to see something different and something that makes it a game, not just fancy graphics, but actual gameplay. And yeah. your game, you can develop a strategy. So it's not, even though it has a random element to it, you still have control over, oh, am I going to kill myself? Am I going to go for the exit? Am I going to try to get extra raindrops? Which brings me to a question. I was watching a gameplay video that you did of your own game. And you were going for, I think there was a 48K version you were playing, right? Uh, I played both. To play uh, your own game video you made? Yep. Yeah. I, I recently did one on my older original game, and I got to level. There's only seven levels in the original, and I got to six. That's the most recent one I played. Oh, you've never finished your own game? Oh, no, I have. But in this <laughs> play, I, I said I'm going to play it for three times and see if oh, I can right. right. And I played and got killed twice right away or pretty early, and then I played again and almost won. And I was that far away from winning. Mm. Yeah, I think I think I remember that one, and something just got the exit before you did, or something. Maybe. And it seemed like to me at one point you were trying to get extra blue raindrops. Is that just to get points, or is there? Because I think you made a comment while you were doing that. Because I was, I, I could be wrong, but correct me if I'm if I'm wrong. But I remember thinking, why the hell is he going for extra raindrops? Get go to the exit. And is there a reason to get the drops? Is it just points, or because I think you made a comment that said. This is going to benefit me later or something like that. What, what's yeah. the deal with that? So in the first game, there's tons of blue rain dots and that you touch and you get points. But those points, the way that I bring up the portal is in locked areas, 20, 40, 60, 80 type of approach. So if I can collect five extra on level one, those five extra don't go amiss because it adds on to what I need. So just because I got 25, the next step is 40, means I only have to collect 15 this next time. So it behooves you to collect as many as you can because it allows you to oh. get to the next uh, portal pass quicker. Oh, so it's based on raindrops you collect and it's cumulative throughout the levels. Yes. But in the second game, it doesn't work like that. Well, there's 10 total and that's it. So instead of having 20 some odd, 30 some odd appear on the screen, there's 10 that pop up. And if the nasties touch a blue one, it turns red, and you got to get seven mm -hmm. out of the ten to. Oh, it turns blue. red, yeah. So it's a little bit more cruel in that aspect, but uh, still very playable and actually easier in the end. And that would be quite an easy game, I think, to 
modify for adding difficulty settings. You could have more raindrops you need to collect. Yeah. For example, as an easy difficulty selection, which game was easier to program or more enjoyable to program? I don't know if those are different questions between the old one and the new one. Yeah, I would say uh, both were about the same amount because I was learning new stuff in both areas. ZX Basic, Next Basic. Similar, mm. yet different. Sprites, no sprites. UDGs, sprites. You know, you've got a mm. mix of things. So I was learning from scratch on everything, and I had never made a game before. So both were as challenging. Uh, and one of the challenges on the old one, the Specky 48K keyboard, one key does four things. Uh, well, on the newer mm. Next Basic, you don't have to do that. You can actually program it just like you would want to program it. You type it out and so on. You don't have to use, you don't use keyboard shortcuts really on the next basic, uh, unless you're making a 48K game in that older method. So Right. And which, what do you prefer having those keywords available or not? Back then it, it was cool. After I learned it, I was jamming. I got yeah. used to it. But you asked me to go back today and do it. I have to relearn everything all over again. So I, guess- I would say it was cool. And I could see the benefit of it, but today age, I would say I probably prefer not having to do it that way. I would rather just key in certain things that I know in my mind I need to put yeah. in. I guess with the rubber keyboard, you appreciate those keywords, but with the next, you don't need them. Not if you're making a game for the next. If you're making a game on the oh. next, you're designing it for uh, 48K basic, then you could use them and you would use them. It would be interesting to know and I'm guessing it's a pretty small number, how many people, either companies or bedroom coders, and probably not companies, I can't think of any company, but maybe I'm wrong. How many people have actually made two versions of the same game for the original Specky and the next? Do you know any any other game that's done that? That's the same exact game without any changes other than... Or it could have changes, but oh. you know, cloud people, cloud people. Right. <laughs> on two different yeah. similar platforms. Yeah. Uh, I can't think of any that. Yeah. Hard, well, like Baggers in Space, for example, on the next w- is very jetpacky. Hmm. So the idea behind the game is the same. There must be a jetpack for the next. Uh, not an official jetpack that I know oh. of. Yeah. That's called jetpack. Oh, okay. no, there are some jetpacky games. There's hmm. Baggers in Space. And then I think there's another one that's got the same you know, little Martian yeah. guy, whatever you want to call them, going around and shooting a uh, similar idea and concept. Yeah. And uh, I think the Night Night, that's going to be in that category, right? There's going to be a new one and there was an old one. There wasn't an old one that I know of. Night there Night. Wasn't an old- oh, that's a new game. Completely? Platforms, like the MSX. I think Night Night was made for like the MSX or at least oh. that's where I saw it. I do not remember a night night for a Specky 48. If oh. it's out there, I'm not familiar with it. Oh, okay. But next, there is. Well, maybe you're the only one. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Hard to yeah. say. Okay. Um, I wanted to ask you something else about your <laughs> videos. And like we mentioned a few times today, it's like spending a few minutes with TJ in his living room playing some games, which is cool. And is probably the appeal of your channel, at least for some people. How much of the content that we see in your videos is representative of what you're actually doing? Or do you have a lot of projects that you do in the background that you spend a lot of time on all your systems, actually doing stuff, using them, playing games, upgrading them, installing stuff, modifying them, whatever. And then every once in a while, we get a tiny peek into that world. Or are we actually seeing like most of the the good stuff you share with your viewers? I think it's almost live for what I'm doing that time. So I typically don't go and do something, video it and come back to it weeks or months later. I'm normally, okay, what am I going to do today? I'm going to play a game, Mm -hmm. set up the camera, go for it. Spontaneity. I'm going to do something Atari TT today. Okay. What are we going to do? I'm going to do this, do it. So I would say it's my day-to-day operation going on that I'm just, turning on the camera, inviting people in and doing it. Hmm. Cool. Okay, so my last YouTube-ish related 
question. It's more actually about you and the community and your involvement in it. But uh, now you have some, obviously some sort of notoriety in the community and you have people asking you to contribute to various things. You have now the crash radio segments that you do. You have an article in the Blast Annual yep. the book, which I actually have in my collection here. Cool. And uh, you have people asking you for interviews, such as myself and <laughs> other people. How does that make you feel to have people? How does it make you feel to have people asking for your involvement, despite the fact that you refuse to consider yourself an expert in giving advice on any of this stuff? But people are obviously thinking you have something valuable to contribute. Yeah, it does make me feel good, and it makes you want to obviously do it more. So. I think over time, anybody that is vocal about something and gets excited about it will gain and get a little attraction towards you for, hey, I remember seeing this dude do something. I don't remember his name, but he did it on the next or whatever. So it does make you feel good that people, for example, you sent me the Dungeon Quest. No idea was being made. No idea was coming. So having those type of things like, hey, he took time out of his day to create a game and thought I'd be a good person to test it. That makes you feel good. Like, Hey, maybe I am building up a little bit of a community of folks that know about me and would like to get me involved in some way to be a cheerleader for whatever they're doing. So yeah, I like that. I, I'm a people person. I like going to parties. I always say, if you go to a party and sit in a corner waiting for somebody to ask you for a dance, you're going to be kind of bored. <laughs> Unless you look really good or attract somebody. I prefer to go to the party and say, hey, how you doing? And what are you doing? And bring up a conversation. That's yeah. just my personality. So uh, I feel good that maybe that's uh, overflowing a little bit. And a few people have grasped onto it and have invited me to be part of whatever they're doing. Well, that Dungeon Quest game would not even exist without you. I mean, I, I mentioned in my letter and I think in my video and in the credits that you were the inspiration. So yeah. that's true it's not just uh you know blowing smoke saying oh this guy contributed this guy i kind of like his videos so i'll give him uh, i'll shoot him a credit in my game or whatever and specifically you made one video on your channel i'm probably sure you remembered but because it probably took forever to set up all these boxes of aquarius junk in the background oh yeah and he said hey everyone the aquarius is a cool computer there's a group about it come and check it out join the group learn about the aquarius howdy folks tj here have a little bit of a wall of Aquarius behind me. And why is that? Because I wanted to chat about the Aquarius computer made by Mattel or Radifin. And uh, I also want to give props and point folks to the Aquarius Facebook group where everything in the world that you want to know about Aquarius is there. Not only are the people there quite fun and nice, uh, it's just uh, tons of great new information. And it is a platform that had such a short life span when it was brand new, yet there's so many followers now, I find it quite amazing. I mean, there's companies that have pumped out thousands and thousands of computers that are much more known that don't have any type of following on Facebook or other groups. So it has something to say about the Aquarius and the people behind it today. So yes. that one, I did, I followed your advice. I said, what the hell is the Aquarius? And I checked it out and you never know what you're going to run into once you start checking out these things, because I didn't know, well, I'd never heard of the Aquarius. And once I found out about it and found out about the new developments for it, the uh, micro expander, which really makes this thing an awesome gaming machine, particularly for beginners with the built-in graphics and it has pretty much no memory limitations now. It's got the AOI sound chip if you wanted it. For me, it's an ideal computer for beginners to get started with. And now with the expanded basic and everything. But yeah, if I hadn't run across that video, there would be no game. And wow. so, yeah, you, you never know who you're touching in these videos, right? You think, oh, right. well, look at all these uh, Aquarius boxes. I should really uh, take a video about them before I throw them into my closet or something. Well, that right. video produced a game. So you tell, <laughs> not just me, awesome. but other people who played my game. Yeah, I made a joke one time about, you know, again, being a cheerleader. And as soon as I made this video, the uh, the group went up by one person, you know, at least it was one more. But I think over time there have been probably like anything and you never know how far 
your reach goes because I guarantee there's some people that never mention that they watched a video of mine, but yet are in the community or purchased a next or whatever. So it feels exactly. good. That, uh, whatever you like doing that, that at least you, it's nice to build a name up for yourself. And, and if the name is uh, corresponds to somebody that's nice and fun, that's a nice thing. I don't want to be hated. I prefer to be liked and, and it feels good. Yeah. Well, if you, if you get the haters, just tell them to read the shirt and they'll get the idea. They got the message. <laughs> Bastard. <laughs> These, these shirts are actually really comfortable. They must be good quality because they look good. They feel good. They fit good. They're nice and soft. Yep. And I'd buy the shirt even if it didn't have your uh, beautiful face on the front of it. <laughs> Someone actually designed this for you, right? So I, actually, that's if I'm understanding correctly, you touched someone else's life enough to motivate them to make this yeah. design for you. Flappy Marston uh, is his name, and he's heavily in the Intellivision world. And at some point he saw videos that I made and he made graphics for some of the other YouTubers I'm friends with that are on the television side. So he uh, sent them, Hey, this is, and he made a lot of neat stuff. He was uh, good about Photoshopping and making fun <clears throat> games like for the television that never existed, but yet TJ's face was on there oh. or Papa Pete's face was on there. There was a whole bunch of Intellivision people and he did it for others. And he had said, hey, I made this for you. If you can use it, great. And it's like, hell yeah. And people have been saying, make, make some swag. And so this was an easy way to make the first one. And it worked out great. <laughs> and this is on T Public. Yep. T yep. Public. Yeah. Actually, after you made this, and maybe after I ordered the shirt, I thought that's a good idea. I'll put some of my own designs on T Public as well. But I got banned. I guess I used maybe the Aquarius logo got me kicked off or something. And I could never get back on. You were banned? Well, I got kicked off. They closed my account. No and I shit. sent multiple emails. I think you did too initially, right? Not banned, but I had a problem. So in my so this shirt has nothing Atari on it. In the text where it says, what is the shirt? I just said, I'm into retro computers, including Atari, uh, Aquarius, and television. I just, in the text saying what the shirt's about, that I'm a retro computer user. So nothing on the shirt says Atari, but this T Public must have been, had issues with people putting Atari stuff on shirts before. So they mm -hmm. immediately, after a day, said the word Atari was on there and said, we had to take it down because it's Atari. And I went back to them saying, there's nothing Atari on here. <laughs> and I said, Could it be that I wrote the word Atari in the description yeah. of the text? And they said, yes. And they re-looked at it and said, okay, oh. you didn't overstep your bounds and re it. Obviously, they don't have people checking these listings carefully. They just have some yeah. bot. Yeah, it was some bot that picked up Atari and whacked me off. Yeah. Because I, I had read some posts about this on Facebook when you were going through this thing. And it mentioned something about the joystick. There is a joystick on your shirt yeah. here, right? So it's right. not the image of a joystick that they didn't like. It was the Atari. <laughs> In the description that I don't think even showed. It was under a keyword description to, if you typed in Atari, your shirt may come up in the feed. Mm. That was it. Crazy. Well, good Good you got it back on. So yeah, I have a nice comfy shirt to wear now. And <laughs> it's funny, I go out wearing this shirt sometimes and I forget, well, not really forget, but I later think, gee, you know, when I'm at Starbucks or whatever, are they, am I offending people <laughs> by wearing this shirt or do they even notice, notice yeah. it or I don't know. So <laughs> <That's> who cares? <fun. laughs> okay. So now that's all the YouTube questions I have. Are you still good for some more questions or has? Uh... Yeah, I'm good. You mind if I go grab a quick uh, drink in the kitchen? Yeah, of course. Let's maybe take a short break. Yeah. So after a little break, we're ready for part two. So I know we've covered a lot of retro computing related topics to this point, sort of. And, uh, but now I really want to, kind of get into it and get into the, the meat of your retro computing involvement and hobby. So I'll ask oh. some more specific questions around okay, that. As long as, it, long as it's not a math question, if TJ runs X uh, oh, hell. this way and 20 feet backwards, where is he? Don't ask me those. <laughs> not technical programming questions, but they're going to be questions that are like, probably you wouldn't get in a normal interview. I'm not going to ask you what computer you started off with. I know it's <laughs> and Atari 800 and all that stuff. But we are going to, I want to start with your current involvement in retro computing and kind of somewhat sort of work our way backwards 
at points. And the first question is, and correct me again if I'm wrong, but I believe your involvement in your current involvement in retro computing began with the next when you learned about the next. Yes. And my question is, do you remember where and when you first heard about the next and how you heard about it? Yes, exact day and month, no, but 2017, I believe, is when the next was announced that you could buy or get onto a list to buy the developer board. And then they came out with a Kickstarter around that time. I saw a link to the Kickstarter through one of my Facebook groups that I was on. I clicked it, watched a video that showed the Oliver Twins and Jim Bagley, who are popular specky people, Henrique, talking about wanting to reintroduce the spectrum. They showed a picture of what it would look like, a render, I think it was. And I go, wow, that thing's sexy. And it's black. I love black, sexy computers. So I just, out of a a link of some kind, saw it in 2017, I think. Started reading about it. Did not get in the Kickstarter. But it enticed me enough to explore Sinclair after that. And then as I did it, I, I then kicked myself for not being on the Kickstarter one because I was lucky that I could get one on, on two later. But a pledge was sold from somebody that had a, a Kickstarter one, and luck, luckily, I was able to get one. So, well, obviously, yeah. this wasn't the next group you saw this link in because you didn't didn't know about the next, but it just came up. Granted, I don't think. Even, yeah, I don't think the next group was even on Facebook yet in 2017. Oh. That I remember, it was in a different retro computing group. If the group was there, I had no clue about it. Yeah. So, obviously, being in North America, you didn't grow up with speckies and i don't think unless i'm mistaken you even grew up with Tomic sinclair computers although you mentioned a couple times in your videos that i think at the outset you had a choice of the atari 800 you were considering versus the zx80 yes First of all, where the hell would you get a zx80 back then were they available in north america yeah so even though timex sinclair sold their own line there were computer houses that had ads in computer publications, magazines. And I saw my first ZX80 ad in, it was probably Compute or one of the magazines I got in the day. And I saw this sleek looking white wedge of a computer that looked very spacey. And so, yes, you could mail order hmm. a Sinclair branded product in the United States. So it would come from the UK. Uh, no, I think they actually made arrangements with somebody here in the United States to distribute for them. Really? To my knowledge. <clears throat> I don't remember back that far, but I'm pretty sure there was a legal U.S. channel that you could buy it from that actually shipped from the United States, like a distributor of some kind. I had never heard about the ZX80, I don't think, back then, although the TS-1000, which was my first computer, was all over the place. Well, wow. What about for you? Were, were, was the TS-1000 something you were considering or just the ZX-80? I don't even remember the TS-1000. That's oh, the funny okay. part. I remember the ZX-80, which came out before the TS-1000. Uh, the and I remember seeing it, but I don't remember seeing ads for the Timex line that I remember. I remember the ZX-80 as firmly as my Atari 800, but not Timex at all. Oh. Yeah. And do you regret not buying one back then? Yes. <laughs> Be not that, that I wanted to have it too, but I made the right choice in terms of what yeah. computer was right for me because having a white little box that uh, every time you hit a key would blink the video <laughs> yeah. as it used a particular thing that, oh, it needed memory for this or whatever, and the whole screen would blink. <laughs> and it had no sound, had no color. I mean, what kid doesn't want to play a video game like they play at the arcade? So, yeah, I made the right choice. But later in life, looking back, uh, I wish I could have afforded to had one also to learn on. But, yeah, the 800 was the bee's knees for me. Yeah, obviously you would have gotten a lot more use and gameplay out of an 800 than 
Oh yeah, a ZX80. I would. There's think. no comparison, and but the nice thing is, I've got some friends that I've made, you know, online friends from over in the UK that basically say this is what they could afford. The economy in UK, yeah. Britain, or whatever England was much different than in the United States. So two different worlds, really. Yeah, and that's what they could get into where we in the United States had different access. Yeah, to yeah, that's true, and. Even for me, even being in North America, I wasn't buying any twelve hundred dollar Atari eight hundred when I was a teenager. So even here, yeah. not everyone had really access to it. And you mentioned several times in your videos you had to work your ass off, yeah, chucking newspapers I, on people's lawns to get that right. Yeah, I wanted one, and I uh, fell in love with Atari eight hundred, and uh, I had to have one. So I saved my ass off to get anything. I I tip, and that's what probably I get a little bit defensive i've had somebody on one of the facebook groups uh say oh he's a youtuber that gets free stuff and you know that's kind of like why he i don't think anyone's throwing free zx80s at you right exactly. you but it bugs me because i'm always the type that works my ass off for stuff not saying i haven't received many goodies there's been very generous like yourself sending me games casey nidal <clears throat> all sorts of folks have now since i kind of have a, a fun little youtube channel want and enjoy what i do so their way of uh, instead of being a patreon or whatever or some are that too they send me things because they want to see me make videos about it and they like what i do uh, yeah. but i work my ass off for everything that falcon behind me wasn't given to me my first car wasn't given to me my parents didn't have the money to send me to college so i went to junior college they treated me right and they gave me a good home well taken care of, but I worked my ass off for everything. Hmm. So when my friends, when I was in high school, my friends were going out and partying every Friday night, Saturday night. Guess what TJ was doing? I was dishwashing at a restaurant. Oh. I worked my ass off. So I get a little defensive when somebody that doesn't know me makes yeah. a rude comment like that. And I get a little bit in a defense mode. And then I try to remember it's the internet, but it's like, no, and people don't, everybody in the world doesn't send me free stuff. Now, if somebody wants to send me a free thing, I love it. I'm going to make a video about it and 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 have fun with it. But yeah, that's the one thing about the internet that probably chomps my hide a little bit more than anything else. Yeah. yeah. And I guess you probably have to be careful of your interactions with people who do offer to send you free stuff like, okay, I'm giving someone my home address or do I set up right. a PO box or do I, how well do I know this person? And that kind of thing. So I guess it's a fine line. You kind of got to walk there. Yeah. And I've done one before in that, that I look in hindsight that I shouldn't have, but what's done is done. And hopefully nothing you know bad ever comes from it, but hopefully I know there's people that don't like me out there. I've made jokes about it before. Not everybody's going to like everybody, but that's part of YouTube. There's some people that will get in a particular click and they just don't like you, but they're a normal person. Then you get some sociopathic, Human brain is an interesting thing. And you get some people that just all of a sudden get a grudge upon whatever. Mm. And they, they they do their best to be a nuisance. And uh, hopefully I never have any big issue come from that. But it is a fine line that you have to watch. And as you get a bigger YouTube channel, that is a further danger that you may deal with that more often. I think if I were to deal with that much at all, I would just shut it down. I don't need any negativity in my life, especially right. when you spend so much effort making these videos. And if you're programming games or whatever, why, why would you do any activity that makes you feel more bad than good? Bring yeah. bad into your life. I've had a couple of ones that have made me seriously think about it, but then I start thinking they win if the, if you leave and it, and I just That's write true. it out. Other people have done the same thing. There's many a big YouTubers that, get stalked and all sorts of weird things it's it's weird and the human brain i'll just leave is an interesting thing for good or bad it just humans yeah. are bizarre sometimes yeah yeah so i actually was working my way towards an actual question in my mention of your first computer which was what did you find interesting about the next in particular having not grown up obviously with speckies and even with timex sinclair other than possibly considering buying the ZX80 because there are other modern remakes of retro systems that as far as I'm aware of, I haven't heard you mention in any videos. As far as I recall, the next is the only 
modern remake of a retro system that I've heard you mention of was there, which seems kind of strange in that obviously it's made in the UK. It's made as a remake of a UK system. Right. What, what appealed to you about the next compared to other modern remakes of systems, if you were even aware of any other modern remakes? Yeah. Two main things. Uh, the community, after I watched that video and saw the likes of Jim Bagley and the Oliver Twins and some people, I immediately was drawn to the people first. I, 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 I love people in general, and I like chatting with them and learning about them and them learning of myself. And something about the community really immediately goes, you know, this is a kind of a neat little group of folks that's pretty big, actually. And so the people immediately grabbed onto me. And then after I looked at the next the design of it, it's really cool. Mm. It's got a wonderful keyboard. It's small, all in one. And I do like black computers. So everything about the style of it enticed me. So those are the two main things. But then they started chatting about easy to learn, basic, make your own games. They started bringing that into the equation. And that interests me because I started making Invasion of the Cloud People on my Atari 800 back in 1980. Oh. Never proceeded with it because I fell in love with girls and cars instead. And it became not as important. Mm. But now in my older age, and I've been married for a bazillion years, I would like to learn to program. And this looks like a fun, easy way to work in sprites and make your own games. <laughs> and the people look really cool. So why not? So that's what attracted me. Two questions I want to try and get out if I remember. One is the Atari 800. That looks like an exciting system to program for because of all of its capabilities. How, and I'm obviously you were using basic back then to start your cloud people. Yep. How is it programming on the 800? Because I know the 800 has a basic cartridge, right? It doesn't have basic built in. Uh, the newer ones have it built in, but the older, like the 800, was a cartridge. They had player missile graphics as, and it's been so long, and I never made a game. I don't remember back that far. But instead of sprites, there was player missile graphics, the way that I remember it, that allowed you to more easily add color graphics and sound into your 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 game or your application. So back then, basic was the basic language, but then I don't know if it was an add-on or for something that you could, that was built into the original basic that allowed the player missile graphics. I don't remember that. I think it was some time, how a uh, part of it, but you would be able to add on top of it to do more stuff later, if that makes sense. And do you have a, a sense without remembering the technical aspects of programming back then, do you have a sense of, how it is programming on the next your cloud people game versus back then. Like, do you remember having a feeling of, wow, this is a lot easier to do than when I tried to do it back then or, or not? Yeah. Big difference. Making a Sprite or a UDG on the Specky on the original Specky was UDGs. And I understood a grid pattern of X amount of squares. And if you fill them in, it became a graphic that, which are as Aquarius people don't have, <laughs> you've got a set amount yeah. Uh, although maybe Aquarius 3 one day will add that as an option. But anyway, yeah, I understood. I, I, I'm i fine with math. If I can see square blocks and you do this and it fills in the blank. And then if you do this, it moves. So for some reason, I grasp on to that easier than on the 800. And I don't remember why. It's just been too long. The 800, the player missile graphics, they essentially work like sprites? I think they're like UDGs, actually. Very similar. Oh. Uh, that you fill in the blanks and it makes a character. But it's been so long and I haven't really read a book about it since. And why I didn't pick up the 800, because I already owned one and started making a game. I think it was something about just having something new, modern, next, adding sprites and sound. It all was very sexy and enticing yeah. versus going back and grabbing a book and trying to read how you do it on an older thing. I could do it on something newer easier for me and i grasped and i just latched on to it so your 800 that you had back in the day you had a disc drive for it or just tape cassette originally only and then i bought a 1050 
drive later. But initially it was all cassette. And, uh, oh, that was fun. <laughs> <laughs> so the game you were making, the cloud people back then, you would have been saving it onto cassette. Yep. And then eventually I got a 1050. It didn't take too long before I moved from cassette to 1050. Hmm. It was about $400 drive, I think. And hmm. so I saved up more paper route money and got a drive. Hmm. And then my whole world of pirating games, I wasn't really too bad of a pirate. Sure, I had my occasional one that a friend had and would get. But having a disk drive uh, oh, was awesome. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there was one. And I still love using a disk drive today. On my you know, three and a half inch floppy on my TT and Falcon yeah. and all that. I find it a treat. Yeah. I like it. They're cool. Closing that little door or whatever. It's yeah. Like eight and a half inch or on the five older and a quarter inch. inch. Five and a quarter inch. And you actually had to flop, push down a big, big old front faceplate. Yeah. The 1050 was a latch. A little latch. Okay. Yeah. 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 So that makes it a bit easier, I guess, for develop. Is it easy to, speaking of pirating, because I know with a cassette tape, you can just do the old cassette A to cassette B and copy the audio. How, how about with the floppies? Is it just as easy to kind of do that or you need special hacking software? Yeah, until they built piracy stuff into it, it was easy. Oh. But then they they started uh, making it to where you had to. And I'm trying to remember the name of it. I don't know if it was called Happy, H-A-P-P-Y. But Happy could do a disk sector for sector copy kind of thing that would somehow bypass the copy protection part. So you did have to start getting programs or things to make it possible. Hmm. I, it's been so long, I don't remember. Uh, nowadays, okay. you grab a Fuji net and you latch onto the internet and grab whatever you like. But the games are yeah. sold. I think they're well past any copy, pirating, any of that stuff. So you grab it what you want. Yeah, the 800 looks like a very interesting system, actually, especially with the modern enhancements with the Fuji net, which I wasn't planning on asking you about, but I think I will. The 800 seems kind of cool. I might just throw a couple of questions in there. But before we get there, I was wondering, the other second question that I mentioned earlier that I wanted to ask was when you were looking at the next, at that time, did you already know about any other modern recreations of other retro systems that you were either knew about or were considering at all, or was it just the next? Uh, I think they probably popped up in my feed, but they didn't grasp on, and I didn't want another rabbit hole to pillage. Yeah. Rabbit holes are so easy to fall into. So I think I was trying to be smarter about what I purchased and thought, yeah, this is kind of neat, but it's not like a legacy thing. A lot of them seem to be third party. They made it because now it's past copyright and all that. So they're making something that can do the old. Mm. Where the next has true lineage, even though it's an FPGA, it has the Sinclair name. Somebody legally still owns that. They got the rights to do it. They put it on it. They made a keyboard. They made a complete package. That's kind of the log a logical step towards moving from the old toast rack to a newer specky. And what would we do? So I like that lineage. And I like that they had the original case designer for a lot yeah. of Sinclair, Rick Dickinson. Uh, those things, I think, make it more legit. And that's mm -hmm. what I liked about it. And it's also a risk, obviously, getting involved with the Kickstarter, which... You technically did because you bought someone else's pledge. Yes. So you had no guarantee of ever receiving this thing. Right. Although the team is super legit, obviously. We yeah. received our first next, which I, I wasn't in on the Kickstarter, but I just paid the ridiculous eBay price to get mine. Right. So, yeah, I can see your appreciation for the lineage with the Sinclair name that they're using and the, even the people involved back then from the day. Like yep. that, I can see how that would be appealing. Yes. Rather than just getting involved in some Kickstarter that you don't know if it's going to go anywhere. You don't know the people. They have no connection to the past. And so. Yeah. They seem to be more in it for the money where truly, I don't think this is a for profit. The next is not made for profit. They need to make enough to mm. make what they're doing, but they're not able to go beyond that. So they can't start slapping the word Sinclair on anything else and make money or further money or buy more and sell more. They only have a certain realm they have to work within and it, it's for the love of carrying this thing into the future it's amazing to me they're even doing a second kickstarter because like i don't 
I'm not involved on the project. I don't know the numbers, but I wouldn't assume they're making hardly anything, if anything, if you consider the time that they spent on this project, <laughs> but yet they're doing a second one. I think they lost money in the first one because there was some tax thing or something they had to and weren't told mm. they had to pay something. So I think pretty much they probably lost or broke even on the original. Yeah. And the next one was probably made because there was such a following of people wanting it uh, to make another one. And maybe let's make up for it because the second one was more mm. costly and more pricely. Uh, so maybe they needed thought, well, maybe we need to make a little of it back. Oh. But I think most of it is just for the pure, so many people want it, and they sold a lot more on the second one. It was a $2 million <laughs> Kickstarter. Hmm. That's huge. And they're probably sold out in about 10 minutes. Uh, they sold, it really ramped up and went well past what they originally set the goal at. Hmm. And so you got in on the second one when <laughs> they were offering it. Yeah, yeah. And, I, and I made a video about waking up in time to be able to buy oh. one and the excitement behind it. And I want, if you love something, having two of it's great because if one fails, you've got a one to fall back on. And I would be truly sad if my next died. I, yeah. You can go out and get an end go. Uh, but even those are unlimited numbers. So I, I would feel pretty bummed if mine kicked the bucket. So having a second one is important for me. Yeah. I'm pretty sure that with all the helpful people in the next community people like us who get our next broken our next broken our next broken we could probably find resources to get them fixed i'm guessing oh, but still you want to have yeah. that backup in your collection right yes yeah. yeah and probably that person that could fix it is probably over in the united kingdom yeah in the united states and if people don't realize the cost of shipping stuff from the united states any place is huge a magazine cost me forty dollars to mail a freaking magazine. It's crazy, we're, yeah. We're sending it into the United States is a completely different story. They can spend a lot less getting it into us. It's hmm. crazy. Even just sending you the games, that's not cheap. I forget how much it was. I'm gonna guess maybe thirty-ish dollars for US money, I'm guessing. Right. Which to me is crazy, but to send anything, yeah, the shipping costs are ridiculous. And you try to buy anything on eBay, the shipping costs will kill you worse than right. the price of the item. Some of the speckies that I purchased were from eBay UK, and they cost me an astronomical amount of money to get. Yeah. So the you mentioned about the FBGA for the next. And I guess some people would have a feeling about that. That's not a real Z80. It's not, it's not legit, but really from what I understand, and I'm not, not an expert, I do have a diploma in electronics, but an FPGA really is, from my understanding, an actual physical recreation of the Z80 or whatever. So right. essentially, technically it is, it's not an emulation. It's right. a physical recreation of the chip, right? And it's an actual chip. It's a yeah. FPGA chip. It's not a software manipulating things to splurt out something. So yeah. it's an actual chip and it's it's one that can be many. It's the greatest chip out there, you know? Yeah. It does a lot of things, whatever you tell it to do. So I find it, and I'm perfectly fine saying uh, an FPGA-based next is the real deal. Real chip, real Z80, basically out of the programming they do behind it. So that's where the lineage to me is really a, a good, it works for me still. And you have connections I'm assuming, or interactions with the actual developers of the next, right? Like Henrique and, and Jim Bagley and those guys. I'm assuming you've been in contact with those people in all your interactions. To be truthful, no. no. I'm friends with them on Facebook, like Jim and Henrique and all sorts of other folks that are involved, Alan Albright. I've asked them to be friends. There were, there were some that I asked to be friends and rudely told them to kind of be my friend, but... Uh, they that's why. You, they <laughs> uh, didn't want to be your friend. <laughs> it was weird. I don't want to. I, I I don't want to bring up old stuff. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. basically, ask somebody to be a friend because you're excited about something and you want to be part of their in life. Basically, because you put them, you find them interesting, and they basically you know message you back. No, I don't want to be here for mm. it. Oh, that's all right. <laughs> okay, no. uh, fine. Moving on. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but so yeah, it's interesting that. Uh, with I, I think as many things as I've kind of done for the community in terms of excitement about the next, uh, you would think I would have a direct links or anything. No, other than Facebook friends 
and they know of me and I know of them and they find me to be a friend of theirs and me, them. I don't have any behind the scenes info, uh, behind the scenes. I'm not a beta tester. None of that. I would have, you know, it would have been cool if they would invite me to say, TJ, we'd like that you do this. Would you mind participating in this little way to be part of the next team? I would probably accept it depending on what type of time it is. Cause I am pretty busy. I've got my, yeah. I may look as retired, but I'm not, <laughs> I still have work for a living. I got another 10 years to go basically. Uh, but I, I would love to have been part of uh, the next team in some little way. Uh, but yeah, I'm not, I'm just another dude on, on the uh, uh, mm. dude list of people. They probably know about because of my videos and that's about it. But you wouldn't mind a free ticket to the UK to be on a panel discussion. I'm sure uh, I would take it. <laughs> yeah, I would love it. Uh, in fact, uh, like Jim Bagley has mentioned before, he had said, oh, well, yeah, you come on over, we'll get you into the show. But getting over there is a huge cost and mm, getting time yeah. off and all that. Uh, but I would love to be able to be uh, visit the UK one day and visit England, mm. Scotland, Ireland, Wales, all that. And while I'm there, meet some of these friends I've met over the Internet at a bar and a show and have a good time and I would have a blast. I would not be shy. I would go over there and show them that us Americans can also party pretty well too. <laughs> and I'm assuming they've been receptive to that and they said probably inviting you if you're ever in the neighborhood, look us up yeah. kind of thing. Yeah, quite a few, just mostly even in my uh, Facebook groups and Claire Society, they said, if you're ever over here, hit me up, love to have a pint with you. And uh, yeah, I, I don't think, and I think probably if I, was going over there on a trip with my wife and said I was there and it was during a show, I bet you anything probably somebody would reach out saying, hey, why don't you come over to our table and help us present or something? I think they mm -hmm. would probably do that because I think I have done enough where they know of me and they know I'm not super crazy and would maybe like me to be part of the, the fun. But I don't know. Yeah. It's hard to say. That'd be cool to see a panel discussion with all you guys <clears throat> and some other people who maybe even aren't in the official development team but are a real positive element in the community like um, names come to mind adrian sinclair i know he's a really positive member of the community richard yeah. faulkner is doing all kinds of synthesizer music for all these kinds of games yeah. and so i think that'd be great to see a discussion with you guys just yeah. enjoying the platform not necessarily having to be technically involved in the development right mike cod will <laughs> he's <laughs> Very heavy into getting yeah. next out the door. David Safety, or all yeah. these. Names. There's tons of people that are. They're in the actual yeah. development team, I think. Right. Right. Yeah. Some are on the team, yeah, and others that are just into basic and making their own games and love programming. Yeah. Uh, you oh, know what's the, the name of that fellow? The Block Boy creator guy. Can't keep. That's Kevin. Him. Kevin. Kevin. Three D something or other. Right? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. He's yeah. just cranking those games out. He must I, be chained to his desk. Yeah, he's the Energizer Bunny of Next Basic, in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah. So you didn't get in on the Kickstarter. I, well, you just said so. You didn't take part in the Kickstarter for the first Kickstarter for the next, but right. you bought someone's pledge, but you were aware of the next during the first Kickstarter when you could have gotten in on it, I think. Yep. What was the hesitation? And what made you change your mind? Oh, you're just waiting for the cash to come up? The money at the time, oh. I was trying to enjoy outdoor life more, uh, camping, getting Volkswagen or camper related mm. cars, get out, get off computer. My mind changed. I was in a different mindset at the time. Mm. And I wanted to just, I had limited money that I could enjoy some computer stuff, but most of my money was going to just getting out and about and fishing and all that. So uh. it just wasn't the right time right then but then shortly afterwards, I fell in love with it so much, I started going, I need to find the time to be involved in it. And that's where I started kicking myself saying, damn it, I should have did it, but I didn't have the money and blah, blah, blah. And then later, luck, I lucked out. Got yeah. It. Well, you sure found the time, all the time you spent making these videos. That takes a long time. Yeah. I, I found a way to incorporate it into my current lifestyle. Absolutely. And back then you were doing the tank car thing as well, I'm guessing. Yeah, I've been doing that since 2011. So hmm. going on 13 or 12 years now, I've been involved in that. So, yep. So I was thinking maybe, well, I was wondering maybe since that was your introduction to reintroduction to retro computers, 
which are now retro computers, maybe I was wondering if you were thinking, should I really get involved in this retro rabbit hole or should I not kind of thing? Yeah, I was already in it. Um, a recent video I made, I kind of mentioned. So mid 90s, I got rid of, gave away, goodwilled, I forget all my Atari stuff because Atari basically went out of business. I moved on professionally to the Apple Mac platform. But immediately after I did that, it didn't stop me from continuing my old computer stuff. And what I was doing is I started collecting computers that didn't quite make it. The Next Cube, the B-Box. I'm sure you've heard of both of them. I've heard of the Next Cube. I, I'm not familiar with the B-Box. So have you heard of BOS? No. Operating system? Uh, very tangentially. <laughs> okay. So yeah, it was one of the, it ended up becoming a contender for Apple, moving from System 9 that they hmm. were on. They started looking at the BOS as a possible updated alternative to Mac OS or Next Step through Next. Hmm. Naturally, they brought Next Step and brought Steve Jobs back into the equation. So BOS left, but BOS was a wonderful operating system, very multimedia centric, very capable, written from the ground up uh, to be a servant for you, sticking in the background when it needed to be, but bringing all this new capability. Very powerful OS. They came out with a computer, which was more for developers, called the B Box, and they sold only, I don't know how many they sold, a thousand? If that, I don't know. It was very limited, but I bought one. But so I started buying some kind of has been that weren't quite that old yet, but had a fun following. And that led me into recollecting my old Ataris. So in the 90s, later 90s, I already started buying back what I gave up. In the 90s? Yeah. Okay. So your reintroduction to retro was back in the 90s. Yeah, really never left it, to tell you the truth. Oh. I got rid of it, but immediately started filling it back in with newer stuff that I oh. couldn't quite afford at the time. So okay. my mega, my my Atari Mega 2 ST was 1987 vintage. So I had used it from 87 to 95 as my main computer. Got rid of it. And then by 96, I bought an Atari TT because I could never afford one. Mm. And so I started just filling in the stuff that I always wanted. Mm. So I never really left it. Mm. I just, we're we're going to get into all that. Yeah. I uh, wanted to ask you, because I was assuming, and pro mistakenly now, obviously, that you had learned about the next, and that spurred you to get back into, spurned, is that the right word? Spurred? Anyway, motivated you to, to get into retro computing, but then you didn't actually, the next wasn't your first computer that you ordered and received at that time time you i think you got the did you receive the omni first and the 2068 how did that kind of all work so the next spurned spurred <laughs> <laughs> it may, you're not sure either are you yeah anybody watching this video type down below <laughs> <laughs> what the word is uh so no the next started it but the next didn't come out until 2020 right that's when they started shipping so there were years of what am I going to do? Well, I'm going to buy a specy of old to learn ZX Basic, learn the history, learn how it came to be. And that's when I purchased around the same time the Omni. And it was a made to order that would take a long time to arrive. And uh, the TS 2068 from Timex. Hmm. Those are the first two that I received. So do you consider that kind of a reintroduction to retro or you just never left it and you've been collecting Ataris and whatever? Yeah, I never left it, but it was my first foray back into old 8-bit, if you want to say that. Oh, because okay. I was buying B-Box Next. Those were 68,000 processor. They were not 8-bit computers. And I would say, when did I purchase? Late 90s, again, I probably went back and started buying my Atari 8-bits again. Hmm. So, yeah, I never left it. I just wasn't as prominent. I didn't have a YouTube channel. So I wasn't out there toting it, but... So the Omni would be your first introduction to the UK line of the Sinclair yep. computer yeah. line. Yep, for sure. Have, have you ever made a list of either recently or any time in the past, a list of all the systems you own? Nope. Just out of <laughs> curiosity? Yeah, nope. And that's the funny thing. Casey Nidal, if you're watching this, so he's a, a big time in, in television collection. 
he knows better than I what in television games I have because he made a whole spreadsheet of what did I send TJ? Oh, he's so organized. I get him in, and I, I glaze goes over my eyes, thinking, "How am I going to categorize this? <laughs> How am I going to make a database on it on a computer?" And those type of things I am not good at. So I'm better at putting it in a somewhat logical area where I'll use it, but put it down in a piece of paper. No, I'm bad. And would you want to be organized or do you find it more fun to have all your cartridges in a basket and you just pick one and play it? I wish I was more organized because then I could get to it easier, but certain things I got to draw the line. If I, cause I'm easy at spinning wheels and not getting far on something. My Volkswagen bus. I work on a brake job for a year because I'm so slow and methodical about it or lame about it. I just don't get it done. So I spin my wheels on, as I'm working on the brake job, I say, oh, this doesn't look good. This needs to be fixed. Mm. All of a sudden that tangent goes and then I take another few months doing something else. So yeah, if you, I'm easily uh, distracted. Hopefully you're still able, you're able to drive your bus. I hope while you're doing this brake job over the year. No. So oh. that's the back. So with brakes, you can't drive it. So I, I, it's more than just putting on new pads. I'm putting, you know, taking the bearings out, replacing bearings hmm. on it, repacking everything. And there's some leaks that I need to get to. The lines are metal and they're corroded and uh, oh. what do you call it? Rust. <clears throat> so, okay, I better replace this hard line. So it becomes a more thing. So once I start it, it takes me forever to get back on the road that's quite the project yeah and i'm just late a real good mechanic would knock it out in a day i'm not a good mechanic <laughs> i'm just a dude that's trying and learning and slow now, did this used to be the camper you took camping no, no. Uh, it more for taking to local shows trade i took my last bus to a big volkswagen bug rama where thousands and thousands of people drop in on Sacramento for drag racing, for showing off your vintage vehicle hmm. and being part of a little club of people up here where I live that get together every uh, Tuesday of the month, first Tuesday and have an ice cream or a burger at a joint, that type of thing. So it was more for fun. Uh, for camping, I have taken my old Volkswagens camping. Uh, but most of the time I did it in something more modern. Because hmm. you, you've made a video about another band that you have that you're hooked up the solar panel thing too, right? How's your battery with that thing, by the way? Did that solar panel work out? Uh, Yes and no. It's keeping the battery just up enough, but current new vehicles suck the life out of your batteries and Mm. the manufacturers don't want to say there's an issue, but there's an issue. I Mm. I put a new, brand new battery on our new camper and I could quickly tell within a week to 10 days the voltage that was up at 12.6 volts, which is a healthy mm. battery, was down to 12.02 volts, which means that you're 25% of a battery left. Something is draining it, even though Dodge Ram says there's no excessive drain. The camper company that makes this camper on this mm. chassis says we don't see an excessive drain. But I've got a good friend in Dodge that says there's this phantom feed that could maybe come on once in a great while and do something but they're not sure and hmm. so yeah I, I basically need to keep a battery tender on this thing for the, for the life of it sucks but it's the way it is i guess living in the would you say you're living in the country with that is that fair or yeah yeah so i guess you need to be more aware of all these types of things like solar power and water where you're going to get your water when there's a storm or whatever and right a whole new element of fun to your life i'm sure yes i mean we've got electrical pole we're not that far out in the sticks but in the sticks enough where i'm in well water so if the power goes out you don't have anything to flush your pooper so Mm -hmm. what does tj do before a storm comes in you fill your bathtub up with water Mm -hmm. in case the power goes out so you can you You don't just hold it for three days right (laughs) or a week once A a week I think that was when you were offline recently for a week. Yeah. Right? yeah. Uh, I, it's been twice in the last two winters. We were down six days the first time. And then last year we were down three or four days, I think, uh, power. Uh, and the internet was down a little longer. Yeah. Because you have fiber there now, I think, right? Yep. Or, for your internet. So how do you decide 
or what factors go into your decision of which systems you're going to buy or get involved with. Do you have a formula you use? Or? Yeah, I don't. I think it's whatever. I, I'm easily attracted to light. <laughs> Look at that pretty thing. Uh, I would say I'm, I am pretty, I, I've slowed down. I don't have, I, I, I went out and purchased things that I really mm -hmm. wanted back. The Atari Falcon I had owned, sold, kicked myself, got back. So I was more in a get back mode. And at this point in time, I've run out of funds to really buy anything else. So I've kind of put a stop to that. And I'm now to the point where mm -hmm. I'm enjoying what I have. If there's a new doodad for that thing, I will buy it because I would like to have it. Uh, but I'm running out of space and just time too. If I spread myself through too thin, yeah. it won't be good for me. It won't be good for the YouTube channel. Yeah. I wish I had more space, like a whole 24 by 24 fun shop <laughs> that could be yeah. all computers. I don't. So I, I've got to draw the line for now on what I collect. So you, you didn't have any criteria you used. You just found something you thought was cool and yep. went for it if you could afford it kind of thing? Yep. <laughs> okay. Yeah, just Fair enough. Did you tend to or do you tend to lean towards the underdog systems? Is that a factor in your... Yes, I like the oddball. As a living, if I said the word Tenkara right now to you, just the word Tenkara, you know me, but would you know what Tenkara is? I wouldn't have, no. Right. And it's a Japanese method of fly fishing. There's no reel. It's centuries, years old. Man first started with a stick, string, and a bug or other net ways to catch fish. So Tenkara in the United States was not known until the company I work for and the owner happened to have a, a Japanese-American wife, went to Japan long ago, saw these weird rods that were telescopic, that had no reel, and they were fishing for trout. Came back to the United States and said, no one's doing this. They've never heard of it. Introduced it, and then it's become quite popular now. But yeah, it's uh, I love those odd things because it makes you feel as part of the growing community, being fresh, new, and you're growing along with it as it ages. And um, yeah, it's very special. I like Aquarius for that reason. It's the underdog, but there's a lot of cool people in that group that are pushing the limits, making new things. It's fun. Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. For the fly fishing, is that an old sport, the Tenkara, or is that modern? It's in... It's an old method of fishing for food. Centuries, the first time they wrote about a bamboo rod that was break apartable with a horsehair line on it, where Japanese folks were going out catching fish to bring back to the village to sell. It was a business for them. So it's long ago, but in modern times, it's now a sport. I think the earliest mention of the word tenkara was 70s or 80s from some Japanese uh, that had started learning the history of where their fishing started from. So today it's now modern carbon fiber that's telescopic mm. instead of breaking apart. So they modernized an old method of fishing for today's world. Yeah, because that's what I was wondering, how they would have had telescopic rods a couple they hundred did. years ago or whenever it started. The Japanese were so, bamboo is very lightweight. You can hollow out some of the bamboo in the back. So rather than it being telescopic, you take the piece apart and put the smaller one in through the back of ah. the bigger one, and you nest three or four parts together, and it's now this big. <laughs> and that's what the size of a Tinkara rod is closed because it's telescopic. Yeah. In the olden days, they took it apart. So they stuck with the lineage of how did they break it apart and make it nest into the back of it? Hmm. Very smart. Oh, so they redesigned it to copy the old way. Right. Just in the reverse order, telescopic instead of through the back. And did your company pioneer that? Uh, in terms of marketability in the United States and the world, yes. Hmm. In Japan, they were doing it already, but it was a small niche. Japanese are very fly, uh, fishing. The culture, it's part of their heritage. It's part of their DNA, fishing. And so over there, they did it. But it wasn't even big there. Our company popularized it so much that we became the market leader or one of them now that made this type of product. So it was a big leap for the founder of our company to go out there and bring this back and make it popular and market it. 
it was known, but no one knew about it because it wasn't marketed. And I think I read on YouTube or YouTube, I read on Wikipedia about it that it's not really a huge thing in Japan still, is it? It's just one of their unlimited ways of fishing. So different waters and different fishing takes a different rod. So rather than have one rod that does mm. everything, they've got particular fish to go after certain things in a certain river. Tenkara is more of a mountain stream fishing method. You don't use bait, you use an artificial fly, but they have telescopic rods for other things. And in the United States, you can go down to Cabela's or to Kmart and buy a, a crappie rod that's telescopic. So it's a similar world, but it's just another fish line method to the same madness. So mm. yeah, just then one of their many ways of fishing and in Japan, I think we've made it more popular there now because of what we did to be truthful. But the companies that make the rods over there are huge. Daiwa, Shimano, huge names in the in the fishing world. We're nothing compared to them. But in this little niche of Tenkara, Tenkara USA, who I work for, uh, has a pretty big name. So both here and in Japan, is Tenkara fly fishing considered a catch and release sport? Or is it 50-50 or most people eating the fish? Or... Yeah. In Japan, mostly eating. Okay. And a whole different culture there. You're you're catching to eat and enjoy. In the United States, fly fishing was more of a gentleman's thing, catching, releasing. In mm -hmm. England, UK, and all that, again, they had rods that were no reels originally, uh, but then introduced the reel, but it was catch, release, the sport of it. Two different worlds. So, yeah, in Japan, they're now taking a little bit differently. They see that maybe they overfish some things and saw what we were doing in the United States, catch and release. So you find a lot more channels now where they used to be more catch and eat have become catch and release and showing videos mm. in the sport of it. So maybe we helped introduce that little aspect over to Japan. Cool. Globally. Interesting. Yeah. So back to retro computing. <laughs> The systems that you own, and I want I really want to dig into a few of the systems in a second, but the systems that you own do most and or or all of them have a community surrounding them? Or do you have some orphan systems that you just own because you like it and it's cool for you and you don't necessarily belong to a community? I no longer have any computer that I'm not part of a community. Hmm. Uh, I received in a bulk buy or a bulk donation from a friend long ago. Same one that gave me the Aquarius gave me this Panasonic computer that was kind of pre-MSX. I think I saw that one. It's something 200, I think. Panasonic yeah, something. Uh, it's something 200 Junior. And you could read about it on a Facebook group, but there was really no dedicated group only to it. It was yeah. a very sparse. And I got rid of it because there wasn't a community oh. that really backed it up. I would say the smallest one that I'm part of a community is the Sword M5. Hmm. I don't know if you watched any of my videos I on have. the computer. Yep. I saw you rip I, open the packaging on that thing, you right. bastard. Yeah. <laughs> Find the power button on this huge power supply. Three, two, one. Basic eye ready. <laughs> oh, so the video is not beautiful. Yeah, I've got this like a little bit of a yellow line going up and down. Uh, don't know if the TV can be adjusted around a little bit, but needless to say, I am getting video. Uh, basic eye ready. Let's go ahead and key in a program. The little power light on this thing is lit up, so that's cool. Uh, let's see. Ten. I heard sound. Space. Yep, sound. Uh, four. Space A. Equal one. Space two, space ten, return. Okay, twenty. Little the space is all the way over here. There's not a big space bar down here. Twenty. Um, space print. Space uh, quote. I've already got here on here. Quote. Uh, hello. End quote. Return. Okay, thirty. Space next. Space A, return, run. Hello! <laughs> My sword M5 booted. 
Can't wait till the cartridge from Sir Morris arrives because I'd like to play some games and see what it all looks like. I did not even connect the joystick up as of yet. Like I said, a simple, quick connection. I've got a nice up converter over there that's blowing the 110 up to 220 volts. That's the power cord that came with this one. Uh, since it's made in Japan, I'm almost wondering if there's a uh, other form of a power source that you can buy for this. But this one's pretty gourmet, so there must be a lot packing into that that big brick thing. So maybe there's not a simple AC adapter to do it. Things I need to explore. But anyway, my M5 booted. Isn't this? Let me take this uh, off here. Isn't this a gorgeous computer? Look at that thing. Little flap, basic eye, keyboard, little chiclet style. And on the back, you'll see, and I already had two yellow cords, so I plugged them into the right place. I have red and white ones someplace, but I couldn't find them. And I grew impatient because I wanted to run Hello. Yeah. Uh, the group, the Facebook group, I think only has a hundred and some odd people. Is it active? Uh, very, very small. Oh. Yeah. yeah, not not the Aquarius group is much more active. Oh, considerably. Out of all the groups that I'm in, an oddball one, the Aquarius is very active. Hmm. The Sword M5 has some people that collect, play once in a while. I don't see much action. I don't see any big new action. You can buy a cartridge for the Sword by a gentleman, uh, Sir Morris, I'll call him, uh, that makes a cartridge that has everything to date. That was available on a sword that you can put a cartridge in. Beyond that, there's not much new stuff like on the Aquarius. Aquarius has the MX add-on. A lot more action going on yeah. in the Aquarius. We got Roy making games. Yeah, and yeah. hardware. Roy making games or Sean making hardware stuff. All yeah. the other uh, folks like Mac, that's part of that. There's a whole community. Very smart guys. Behind the scenes people. You know of Richard Chandler more because of how you make your Aquarius game. I haven't had that much interaction with him other than just a bit of questions and feedback on the emulator. Right. But yeah, it's amazing. If another similar to you, if it wasn't for him and his emulator, Dungeon Quest would not exist. And right. same, all the people I gave credit to. So if these people don't do these things, <laughs> me. glad it's not a coffee coffee mug. That's my my microphone, my cheap old microphone <laughs> that I have to sit about an inch and a half away from in order for anyone to hear me. Right. I should upgrade my gear one day but i should too <laughs> but i don't i'm still using the free computer that i got from one of my jobs and i like Not to save money when i can so i have to save money for these systems we can't afford right so i want to ask you about your systems that you own and if you remember or can list do you know which systems that you currently own that you used to own back in the day when you were i guess you were a teenager back when you would have owned these things originally yep and it's easy for me because I only had three. Hmm. I bought and I used my own money. So I had to buy and use and enjoy for a long time. My Odyssey 2 is not a computer, but it had a keyboard and you could buy a basic cartridge for it and make a really simple little game. Before you continue, you I've heard you mention that before, sorry, but you've mentioned it's not a computer. What does that mean exactly? It's got a keyboard, so but it's not a computer. So. I take it as if you own a computer, you can write your code back to something and save it. Yeah. There is no saving capability on the United States version of the Odyssey. Phillips oh. over in whatever country they were in had a computer module you could buy and save it back to cassette. So technically, I would say that would have been a computer. In the United States, the Odyssey never really got huge traction, only had mm. like 50 games. And even though they had the computer intro, there was no way I could save what I just created. So I consider that a gaming console only because I can't save back to it. That's the way I look at it. Is the keyboard for gaming input? Yep. Can input. You, can you program on it? Yep. There was an actual programming computer intro cartridge and book okay. that would teach you how to key in your game or key in your whatever, go to 10 and print hello. So technically, you could key it in and use it as a computer. You just couldn't sit, do much. It was very limited, basic. And oh, it has it, basic built no into it. What's that? It has basic built into it? No, uh, no, it was a cartridge. Okay, so you a basic cartridge, then you can make a basic program, and it's lost. 
Like, yeah. Type, and not many specky people were behind that. You think all the hours you programmed a game in on the specky and the power went out or the RAM yeah. module wobbled and yeah. lost all your code? They had some <laughs> of those days too. Yeah. But technically, they could always write back to a cassette. Yeah. Interesting. So, yeah. So Odyssey 2, 76 ish when it came out, 77. Uh -huh. I, that was my first gaming console. 90, 1980, I purchased my first computer, the Atari 800. Used that until 1987. You had the Odyssey before the 800. Yes. 800 didn't oh. come out until 79. Okay. The O2 came out in 77. Was there an Odyssey 1? Uh, yes. I, they just called it the Odyssey, but it was more of a Pong only type of thing. Was that but the, it, what's his name, Ralph Bear? Was that his thing? Yes. Yeah. And there was, was more the Odyssey one. Pong, but you could actually get, I never owned one, but you could get these Mylar things that you could stick on your screen that made it look like a tennis court. Yeah. And the Pong ball moved on the screen. So it was elaborate Pong, I guess. Yeah. Color enhanced Pong. Right. Yeah. Because they slapped a piece of mylar on your screen. I don't. I never followed that much, but yeah. O2, and then 98, uh, 1980, I purchased my real computer. Enjoyed it until 1987. Purchased my Mega 2 ST, which was my first 68,000 uh, processor-based computer. 68,000. Uh, and enjoyed that from 87 until 94, 95-ish, where I jumped ship because Atari went out of business and I moved on. So those were my main ones, and I used the hell out of them until I had to move on. So you've reacquired all the systems you had from your youth, basically, already. Yep. Atari 800 and Mega 2 ST. And one of the things I did on my Mega ST was a Spectre GCR, which made your Atari into a Macintosh Plus computer. And so I back then did that, and that's exactly what I do with it now. Was it the Mega 2 you had or the TT? No, Mega 2. Howdy folks, TJ here. Going to show you my recreated computer, Atari Mega 2 ST computer, as I had it back in the late 80s. Mega I couldn't two. afford the TT, but I did later on in, in later 1990s when I moved on to Apple and then started okay. going back and buying things I could never own because I didn't have the money. So I bought my first TT and late 90s and then got mm. rid of it for whatever reason and then mm. reacquired it just this year do you find a difference in buying things you used to own rather than still owning the things you had from back in the day would it make a difference to you if you had kept your original one versus buying a new one in reminiscing and having that heart pounding that i still have my original widget Mm. Yeah, it would give me a little bit more, but I enjoy the newer things as much as I would have back in the day. But had I kept my original 800, that would have been special, and I didn't. Yeah. Uh, amazingly, though, I did save a couple of things from my teens. I saved my Kenwood receiver uh, and my Techniques turntable. For whatever reason, mm. I kept those all these years, and they're stuck in a cabinet someplace. And there's a few things that I amazingly didn't get rid of and saved some old toys, my G.I. Joe. Yeah, yeah, I saw that video, yeah. I, I, for That's whatever cool. reason, I guess that had more of, I was younger, and I, it was my first real toys, action figures, and I saved a few things, but stupidly, I got rid of the bigger, bulkier things that I wish I would have kept. Yeah. Yeah, it's funny. You run across something that you kept for 40 years, like your G.I. Joe. Was that, that, that was the actual thing original, it was the real gi joe right You're, real gi joe yeah. my one that i played with when i was in the 1970s as a what did kid. you say your brother burned his hair off or something or that was actually jackson <laughs> actually, actually my jackson. memory is that he pulled his head off and filled it up with some flammable thing and lit it on fire <laughs> now i don't know if he would agree to saying he did it i'm pretty sure <laughs> I, I, I could be remembering it a little differently but his head was for surely off and it looked scorched so I think he lit it on fire. <laughs> no doubt. I used to have one of the, his name was Stretch Armstrong. Are you familiar yeah. with that toy? Oh, yeah. He, he stretches arms and he gets long. Till my sister stuck a knitting needle in him and all the red goo came out. Oh. Okay. <laughs> that thing's probably collectible now if you can even find it. 
Yeah, we had a stretch Armstrong. I, I was looking through my cabinet the other day. I should still have a couple of old games. Super Toe, which was a game you smacked his head and he kicked the football through field goal. Hmm. Pretty sure I saved a couple of those really old things that I still have from my childhood. But any of the technology other than the receivers, I got rid of. Are the Is your stereo hooked up? Nope. It's Usable? in a closet someplace. Big, bulky Kenwood. My yeah. original receiver I purchased in 1980, whatever. And I kept it. And it's in a box way inside of a cabinet behind tons of other boxes. So mm. it would take an adventure to get to it. Mm. Oh, one least... day. One day? Yeah. Hopefully the speakers are still intact. Those paper uh, phones well, might have disintegrated by now. Yeah. Mice got to them. Who knows? But yeah, the <laughs> receiver I kept in the turntable, I still have. Yeah. Do they work? I don't know. Were there or are there any systems that you didn't own from your youth that you would like to require, acquire now if you had the money and the opportunity? Oh, boy, that's a good question. You, you have a hell of a lot of systems. Yeah. I've <laughs> I'm wondering, is there anything stuff. left for you to, to shoot for? Yeah. Actually, to tell you the truth, I was too poor to own Apple. And I was envious of my friends that had Apples. I like Atari because power without the price, right? But there's some older 16-bit, like the uh, GS, Apple II GS, the Apple okay. IIc, C, which is a really small, ultra-portable computer. I think there's some Apple 8-bit slash 16-bit I would love to own that I never did. So, mm -hmm. yeah, Apple. Mm. But you haven't gone down the Apple, the retro Apple nope. rabbit hole yet. Yeah. yeah, I think I have a 2GS that's beat up out in the garage that was part of a bulk buy. Uh, I don't even remember what it was. But, yeah, never really like Atari. Atari was mine, so I have a lot of Atari. And then I have a lot of Sinclair now, but... Yeah, none of the other ones. Are there any systems that you would like to have but are just crazily priced right now and you know you're never going to have one, but you'd love to? I'm guessing, well, think what comes to mind would be the Aquarius 2, perhaps, but any other systems? or That one, yeah, that one doesn't even come. The one that I would love to have right now is the Sharp X68000. Hmm. Black tower work, horse kind of computer, mainframe looking. Really high tech sciencey. I don't know if you've seen him. No. But six eight zero 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 made by Sharp. Hmm. It was there. It was kind of like post MSX maybe, um, but more capable. A lot of audio capability on par with the Atari Falcon, for example. Uh, hmm. Google it. It's a beautiful looking tower type of computer, but they're like twenty five hundred dollars, and every ad I see is like. Uh, as parts so <laughs> yeah they don't want to guarantee it's working i guess right exactly so yeah that, that would be the one i would love to be able to buy and be a rabbit hole that i'm scared to go down and kind of glad i can't afford it because then maybe yeah. i'll get in trouble an expensive rabbit hole yes there is a sharp mz or mz 700 i believe are you familiar with that one i've seen that numbering before but doesn't ring a bell on what it looks like i think uh roy Templeton, Templeman, Templeman, Templeton. Templeman. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. Roy, I forget. Uh, I think he owns one because I saw a video of him at um, a retro computing event on YouTube one time and he was showing it off and it looked pretty cool. So we have the fantastic Sharp MZ700 in its glorious, weighs about the same as a Volkswagen <laughs> footprint. <laughs> Yeah, they were heavy. Uh, and again, so celebrating its 40th birthday this year. Um, I quite like this particular machine because it doesn't have any uh, bitmap capability. No, it it's doesn't. Like the Aquarius, and it, that it's um, it's a character-based machine. Uh -huh. um, but uh, you might think that that would stifle it in the games market, but no. <laughs> Hundreds of games came out for this machine, and believe it or not, they're actually really good. Mm. Yeah, you see, you're shaking not your shit. head. <laughs> they're really good. There's a version of Arkanoid for this, and it yeah. really is. Arkanoid, it's not a clone, it's Tato's Arkanoid. It's really good.
You've got to remember that I like the oddballs and I mean, the underdogs. Me, me too. And, yeah. <laughs> but, and this uh, was a bit of an underdog, and it was an expensive underdog when it yeah, came Yeah, it out. was expensive. Yeah. yeah. In, now, in fairness, if you compare it to the other machines from 82, uh -huh. you can see that it is quite poor. Right. Because you don't have that bitmap ability. You're not getting sprites. You're not getting... The sound is okay. The sound mm -hmm. is okay. But, yeah, it is quite let down. But mm -hmm. I quite like it because it's quirky. You I really have to use your imagination in some of these, <laughs> some of these games. <laughs> And it looks very similar in capabilities to the Aquarius, actually. Mm. I think it has built-in character graphics. and But this thing, whereas the Aquarius has hardly anything made for it in terms of games, this thing has tons of games for it. And I think most of them are made by maybe one or two people. But yeah. it, that one looks interesting to me, although I wouldn't probably buy it because I don't know how it would be to develop for it. But it was interesting to me how that's similar to the Aquarius, but totally different. Right. And Roy is, in my opinion, the king of the oddballs. That is his reason that a for compliment? Like, <laughs> collecting oddball computers. Yeah. The, the, that little computer that could. And he's joked before because I would collect a computer or buy it. And he's all like, are you trying to compete with me? <laughs> I could never touch him because that, that guy's got like 200. He actually is... Uh, very organized and, and knows what he owns. I've got a whole bunch of stuff all over the place and I've never tried to compete with something like that because he's actually more techie. He's he can repair things. I can't unless I look in and say, TJ, here's a capacitor. If you get a soldering iron and heat it up a little bit, you can maybe pull it off and stick a new one. I could yeah. probably do that, but troubleshooting why I'm doing that beyond me. Yeah. Well, different people have different skills and right. Yep. Yeah. When you do collect a system or, well, I guess systems in particular, you seem to like to get the best condition you can find, one with the boxes and the styrofoam and everything. Yep. But yet you're not a collector and putting it on a shelf for display. So you, you take it out of the box immediately, throw it on your workbench and start playing a game on it. Why right. is the box and packaging and aesthetic condition of the system important to you that you're willing to, obviously I'm assuming, pay extra money for that? I'm guessing you're not thinking of, or maybe you are selling it down the road or what? Nope. So two things. The first one is buying it like it was in the day. You would have got the complete package. I wanted to have that experience of opening it up, opening the box, seeing the buns, seeing the manual, feeling like I'm stepping back in time. The other part is I do have a dream that one day I will have a real man cave, not this 14 by 14 office that I use now but for example i've got a 24 by 24 garage that's attached to the house if my wife and i didn't have so many cars and we didn't need to park in it we could use our other shop for parking convert this 24 by 24 into more living space living space mm -hmm. meaning a media room that my wife and mm -hmm. i could share and have stuff visually pleasing so you walk out there looks like a little movie theater we can have a couple of chairs and a big screen and i would like to have these boxes right above where i'm showing off my aquarius for the day or mm. month aquarius month this month have the boxes all there have the aquarius out enjoy it having that feel of completeness i i love that part of it so you'd want to have everything set up permanently i'm guessing uh, permanently for a degree of time depending on how many i own I don't think 24 by 24 could even show off everything that I own because you run out of real estate, electrical plugs, whatever. But I would like to have at least, say, 10, 15 computers completely rigged up, ready to rock and roll with all the boxes and manuals corresponding to them with an arm's reach next to it. For I just want to walk out there and say, what am I doing today? Today's Aquarius Day. I'm going to sit down in the Aquarius play games, do whatever, learn how to program, have it all right there, ready to go. Do you own any collectibles that you strictly collect that you haven't taken out of the original package of any, a game or anything? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> no? Uh, yeah, a few Atari Lynx games that were part of a bulk purchase that I've never played that still have shrink wrap on them. I think when I made my video about here stuff, I go, hey, here's a shrink wrap Lynx game. Uh, and there's some things I don't have own that are in boxes uh there's few things that i just couldn't get the box but the deal was right so i purchased it like the zx80 it didn't come with a box 
Mm -hmm. So ZX80 box, is that even a thing? I think technically it came in a corrugated in the United States brown box. Mm. So I don't think there was a really pretty glossy box, but it did come with buns that protected it for shipping. And I think they put that in a generic box. I've never seen other than a recreation or a mock-up of a newer one that somebody's making now that you can put yeah. the bun ZX80 in. But I, I don't remember ever seeing a ZX80 pretty box, at least in the United States. I've seen a lot of ZX81 boxes. Yes. And ZX81s unboxed for sale. Yep. I don't know if I've ever seen a ZX80 box, either real or recreation. Is it similar to the ZX81 box then? Yes. The buns look very similar. The not buns, but the uh, yeah, buns, the the styrofoam things look yeah. similar and you could almost fit them in the same space, but they are a little bit different. And I've seen one sold on eBay of a ZX80 in the corrugated part or no the styrofoam part the buns but no outer box oh yeah interesting so a couple questions that may be potentially controversial i don't know answer them or not if you like uh the first one will be the more controversial one the amico you had backed it and i had backed it as well and whether or not it's gonna come out it's not looking like it. I don't care at this point. But my question to you is, you had mentioned when you purchased that, that you were thinking that would be a good system for you and your wife to have kind of a family game night, a quick fire it up, play a game kind yeah. of thing. Yeah. And if that doesn't come out, do you have another system or another plan that would you still like to get your wife more involved in your retro hobby? Or <laughs> what's your yeah. plan with that? Or or not. So it's not, yeah, the the playing of the video games, I don't necessarily equate to having to be retro, but playing video games together in itself, whether it's a modern game or old, I still find that I would like to do. We tried it with the Wii. The Wii is the most modern, other than the Atari VCS that Casey gifted me, that VCS 800. Howdy folks, TJ here. It is a huge day, and I have the whole old console family here to witness it i am going to explore a modern gaming console for the first time in a very long time this the new atari vcs uh, shoot the chickens shoot the chickens got him you bastard nicely done uh, the last one that we actually purchased was a wii that's what 17 18 years old now and we collected a a couple of handfuls of games and we played it early on a little bit, but it, it was hard to find time thereafter to continue on with that yeah. because a lot of the Wii games were running, yeah. rolling. Uh, you needed room and our yeah. coffee table was right in the middle. So we'd have to push the coffee table out of the way where with the Amico, the games were more centric to a controller sitting on a couch and just having some quick fun in and out. I still hope that it comes out. I would still, because I plunked down money for it. And I'd love to see people enjoy what they paid their money for. I don't hold high hopes for it. And I'm saddened that things turned out the way they are. But I still wish it does. Because if it does, I think my wife and I would enjoy sitting down, playing a few uh, games, and just finding a common uh, hobby that we can kind of do together and just... Mm -hmm sit there and play a few video games for 15, 20 minutes and call it a day. Yeah. My wife and I are the same. She's not into retro computing at all, but there's been a couple of games that she's just been interested in and, and she latched onto it. And we did have some fun hours playing video games together. So I can understand you're wanting to yeah. So you share your hobby with your wife. And I'm guessing that the, Atari VCS, is that what it's called? The, that new system that you were yeah, gifted? Yeah, Atari VCS, but they put the number 800 at the end. 800. So is VCS. 800 refers to the storage capacity or? or yeah, uh, RAM, I think. So they were going to come out with a 400 model initially and an 800, but they scratched the 400 version and oh. went right to the 8 megabyte RAM or 8 gigabyte RAM model. So I think that's what the 800 stands for. And it, it shows homage to the first Ataris. 400 and 800 in terms of computers. Yeah. So that would seem like it might be a, a great system to fit that role. It could. 
Uh, and it's got a lot of the games of old. For whatever reason, I still hold a little glimmer of hope that the Amico happens and comes out. So I'm trying not to jump the gun and tarnish the fresh feel of us starting <clears throat> this Amico together rather than introduce something I already own into it and it not quite be the same mm. experience yeah, uh, and tarnish and not have her interested. So I'm, I don't, for lack of a better word, I think that's what I'm kind of doing. I could move mm. it out to the room and do that, but I'm still holding a little hope that the Amico's it. Cause there's a lot of cool people I've met in that scene. There's a lot of crazy ones too. Uh, this world is a big place. So I guess there's room for us all. But I'm holding out that it happens still. I don't think it is. It's just so many things that have just poorly managed, poorly whatever. But if it does, I'll be excited to own it. And I'll be excited to try sitting my wife down and saying, hey, this is what I plunked my money down for before. Let's give it a whirl and see what you think. And hopefully one or two games make that connection. Well, if it does come out, you've got the uh, Founders Edition reserved for you, right? Yep. With the wood grain wood grain i'll be curious to think if they somehow because atari recently purchased from intellivision ip owners which i think is the group that owns the current miko some games of old licensing them to mm. come out on the newer atari maybe that money is a way for them to finally achieve and get this amico done at least the original ones that people have put money down for and then see what happens if somehow they can achieve that, uh, that would be kind of cool and exciting that if they could pull it off. Again, I'm not holding much hope, but yeah, and I've you already have the games for it, right? So. Yeah, I purchased all of those box oh, games. The boxes. Yeah, yeah. How important was it, or how big a factor was it in your decision to buy that? That it was an Intellivision linked to Intellivision. Zero. <laughs> oh, because I was an Atari. Uh, well, I was an Odyssey two kid. But I always enjoyed playing in television and ColecoVision and Atari 2600 at all my friends' houses. So I had an appreciation and saw the Intellivision was better graphically on some of my... A lot of things were better graphically than on the Odyssey 2. What made the Odyssey 2 fun was some of the game, gameplay and that little engine that could, and they did a lot with the little bit they had. But the games on the Intellivision were, were much broader but I would think just the, again, the people behind it attracted me more and that it was a connection to the 1970s and 80s that attracted me. And the group that started it off, there were some charismatic people in it early on that, you know, made me excited for it. Yeah, and it's it's a shame if it doesn't come out that all these people had a lot of positive energy trying to support it. So... You never know, though, because who would have expected the next would be someone would develop a next? Who knows? Right. You never know. So I'll, I'll hold my hopes on it. But that community is a bit uh, all over the place. And I would say I've just stepped back for now. If it comes, it comes. I'll enjoy it. But until it comes, I, I don't have anything to talk about it because there has been literally nothing, nothing of value from the people that own it. So if they're not going to talk about it, why would I? Hmm. That's the way I look at it. Okay, second potentially controversial subject just for you is why no Commodore in your collection? Or is there? Am I missing? Well, you have Amiga, I guess, but yeah, do we consider the Amiga it. Commodore or not? And the Amiga I own is actually a next-gen Amiga. So other than the operating system lineage, there's not much there. But I did have friends that had Commodores. Always had Blast using them and playing. I think it was Blue Max that I played on my friends, the little airplane game. On the Commodore okay. 64, loved it. Had a friend that had a Vic. Uh, I just uh, preferred Atari because I was I, I went Atari in terms of computers. But the Commodore, I never had any issues with it. I would play it. I would enjoy it. But I think it was mostly for friends and giving them little jabs because mm -hmm. they would jab me. And like I said earlier, if you start getting friendly with somebody, you know you can push a little jab here and they jab you back and you have fun with it. It's not in mean spirit. Uh, I have had some Commodores in here, Commodore Vic, C64. I actually have some pictures of me holding a Commodore 64 and a Vic, crying like I'm sad that I received it. 
And I ended up getting rid of them. I think I gave it away uh, locally. And the reason I gave it away is because of a rabbit hole. I just don't, it's not a rabbit hole that I want to fill. I went out and purchased some Amigas. I had an Amiga 500. I've owned a 4000T. If you know Amiga, and you know what the word 4000T is, that's a serious Amiga. Hmm. Uh, and I purchased one, I spent a lot of money on it, had it. But I found that the Amiga connection for me was more of old excitement, old times where I am fulfilled with the Ataris for that. So hmm. I didn't need to add that for Amiga. So for Amiga, I only saw it as a, a movement towards something next gen later on. So I got rid of all the old Amiga Commodore and went next gen with the Amiga platform. And I still have mine now. And what do you use that for? I wish more. <laughs> I've actually at one time put it up on the, the block. If somebody was, I was willing to lose plenty of money on it, but I didn't want to give it away. And Is I got the big square it. case you have on your desk. Which one is that? The big square oh, thing you have on your desk with all the lights in it and stuff? Uh, yes. It's a oh. big, huge thermal take. Okay. Uh, View 71 glass box. It looks wonderful. I've got it connected to my best 4K monitor slash TV. And the next, the Amiga OS is very cool. It's like BOS in terms of if it's very responsive. When you click on something, it happens. We're on some computers that have become very fat in terms of the operating system, sluggish. And the only way they can take away that sluggishness is put behind a huge RAM GPU and processor behind it. They're getting lazy with the programming the way I look at it. But with Amiga OS, it's a very small operating system. Still does a lot. It's very responsive. So the operating system to me is still very cool. And I met a lot of friends and that's why I've kept it. But I don't use it much because, to tell you the truth, next gen to me meant modernizing the Amiga OS, moving it into today so I can use it for web use for work. And I realistically can't do any of that. So that's mm -hmm. why I don't use it much. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Now, I know this has been going on a long time, but I just have a few more questions if you're up for it about yeah, your, no your systems. Because you have obviously a ton of systems. And you've been living with some of them and using them for a fair bit of time now. So I think you might have an interesting and useful perspective for collectors who are potentially thinking about getting into some of the systems that you own. And so I thought I could maybe get your take on some of the systems now that you've been using them for a while, what advice you might give potential collectors, why they might want to get it or might want to avoid it in terms of programming or playing games, what's available for it, how the community is. So maybe if I could just list out some systems and you can give me your quick TJ, yeah. TJ overview. I love these kind of things. Spot and <laughs> okay. So I should have listed more systems. And I'm going to try and... I have a few systems listed, but I'm going to try and test my memory of what systems I think you own. Okay. But the first question I want to ask is about people considering buying systems that are from overseas. Let's, let's assume the collector is in the North America and you own systems that are from Europe, I know. And how big of a factor do you find that if at all, with the different voltage for the power and the different video standards in considering buying a Euro European system, let's say. Power is easy because technically you could buy a up transformer like I did that ticks 110 to 220. And I've got a nice little white box that looks like it's finds its place on my desktop. So it's not a big industrial thing. So the power part's easy. I can either do one of those and use the AC adapter that comes with it, or in the case of the Speccy, or a lot of the other ones, you can buy a generic off-the-shelf AC adapter that's 110, has the right uh, negative and positive lead and all that, and connects. Mm -hmm. So you can buy a $10, $15 adapter to use your old Speccy 48 or Speccy Plus in the United States very easily. So yeah, I guess all of your Speccy collection, not counting the Timex Sinclairs, would be European voltage yep. and video, 50 hertz, and except for the next. Right. Uh, so the power part's easy. The video part becomes a little bit more chaotic. And depending on how much you want to spend, you can make it easy. There's a Byte Delight. Ben from Byte Delight makes a ZX HD device 
that plugs into the back of every specy you can buy, little edge card connector, and makes that feed HDMI. So everybody in the world has an HDMI mm. display, TV, you can easily connect it. But it's expensive. At the time I bought it, shipped, it ended up being a hundred and some odd dollars. So it's not a cheap mm. purchase. You can try to be cheap and get away with buying a SCART to HDMI type of adapter, $40 range, and the right cable to make these older feeds work on some USA type of uh, devices. Not that perfect, not that great, but you can get away with doing that, which I have done on older videos and older systems. But generically, you can buy a ZX HD device and work with any specy. Mm. On some other ones, you still need to use an adapter of some kind, but they're out there. And uh, you can do most stuff in the United States, even though it's from overseas. And the adapter for the non speckies or even the speckies, does the 50, 60 hertz thing cause an issue? Because does the adapter convert it? It wouldn't, wouldn't convert to 60 hertz, I'm guessing. Uh, it actually, the little ones that I have took a SCART connection to HDMI. There was a 720 to 1080p selector, and there was a PAL an NTS ad adapter. So you can say whether it's a PAL signal or a uh, NTSC. So there's some flexibility there of what you're oh. receiving and what you can send out to. And these are cheap and readily available. And you can also buy some higher priced ones that do similar things that are SCART, uh, Retro Tink. I don't know if you've heard the company. No. I've never purchased any of them, but they're, they're adapters that take feeds from other countries and converts it into regular uh, composite or whatever. So there's mm. a lot of ways around most of it, unless it's a really weird France only uh, video feed mm. that I'm a little scared to buy a, a computer from France because of their uh, strange thing that you might be able to work, but it's not going to be in color. So I tend not to buy the ones from France, yeah. but most of them are pretty user doable. I think the Alice would be from France, right? Yeah, and uh, but the Alice is really, if it's the original Alice, the I forget the model number, oh. it's the same thing as the MC-10. Okay. Basically. So it works fine. But their other one, like the Alice 92, Mantra 92, Yeah. I, I'm, I don't know. I don't know if it would work here in the United States easily or not. Yeah, they make me nervous by trying to get into a European system. Yeah, it's like Paratel. It starts with a P. Paratel, P-E-R-I-T-E-L. Something about their signal. It's a SCART connector, but it's a different signal, and, and that goes above my pay grade, so I don't know. Mm. Okay, so I'm going to ask you <clears throat> about some of your systems, and my favorite system that I want to talk about, well, not my favorite system, but my favorite question in this category is I want to ask you about the Coleco Atom. So the Coleco the reason I'm interested in this is because if you look at anything anywhere about the Coleco Atom, it's going to probably dissuade any collectors <laughs> from even considering buying one because of all the infamous uh, quality issues that it had. Oh, yeah. Um, so I would have been nervous even considering buying one of these things, even not considering the fact that you have to have the printer <laughs> hooked up to make this thing even work. Right. But the system itself has a really cool look to it. And technically, those data tapes should have better operation than a regular audio cassette tape, which all the other ones were using, and which people still buy those ones with the audio tape capabilities. Yep. So what do you think about your Atom? Do you love having it just because it looks cool? Or do you think this is the big monster? I shouldn't have bought it. Or yeah. what do you feel about it? And what would you recommend other people considering getting one? It is a huge, if you're a collector and want the box, the original box it comes with, that is the biggest, I can't even, I got to stretch my hands beyond the video here. It is a huge box that no one wants to ship kind of thing because the printer and everything else in it. But it looked like a very capable, very powerful computer of the time. You could even do CPM on it. There was a lot of capability that I don't think was ever harnessed from this computer. What kind of attracted me early on to it was, and I'll go back to my invasion of the cloud people. One of my early thoughts was, I want to make my game for as many oddball platforms as I can find. 
odd, Specky's not oddball, but to me it was. I wanted to make it for that one. I wanted to make it for my Atari. I wanted to make it for Aquarius. And hey, there's this Atom. I would like to make it for that. So I had this little vision of collecting some unique computers that over time I could make my game compatible for. And so that was kind of one of the ways. The size of it was, I think it looks cool. The Coleco looks expandable. You take the little cover off, there's some slots for expandability. And it looked, and it had some video games on it that were near arcade. I mean, it was like you were at the arcade. Up, down, up, up, down, up, down, up, up, jump over. That's right, I jumped up on that son of a bee. Okay, down, over, down, up, down. Down, down, over. <laughs> I did it. I think that's the first time in a, like a bazillion years I actually did it. They had wonderful game conversions for it. So it seemed like it was so powerful and I wanted to try it out and experience it. I know you bought the the standalone power module for it. Yep. So you don't have to have that printer and paperweight on your desk anymore. But is it still the, takes up a lot of space is the thing. So Did you make a video on the... You, you made a video on the power thing. Yep. Is I forget, is it easy to connect that thing to swap out the printer with the separate power? Yeah. Oh. Simple plug-in connection, no wiring. And okay. it's special odd. You just take the printer out, plug this power supply into the mix, and you're ready to rock and roll. Yeah. But the ColecoVision is big, deep, wide, heavy. So I've run out of space here at my home. Space has become hard to find, and I had a choice. Coleco, Atari TT, Atari Falcon, Atari Mega 2, you know what won, the Atari, because I have a more connection to it. Yeah. I'm hoping over time, a couple of computers I'd love to dive in more, the Coleco Atom is one. The other one's the TI-99. I own one. It's the, the beige model, which isn't the best model to own. The gray model is more capable, from what I gather. Mm. And I wish I had more space and time to experience it i've run out of space and time for now but i'm hoping one day i can find time to put those into my rotation yeah from what i can see the ti is a real rabbit hole that goes deep yes <laughs> and that's not even considering the modern advancements for it, modern gizmos whatever they've come up with now but right so i don't think i'll ever get into it as much as that would have been my number one computer that i wanted to own just purely for the look of the thing and the keyboard yeah. But actually getting it and using it for anything, it seems scary to me to, to go down that hole. Yeah. And it's funny having so many computers, everybody thinks there's a delete key on your keyboard. Not every computer has a delete that key. That one doesn't have one? The TI-99. Yeah. I think that was one of them that did not have a delete key to delete character because there was some key I'm saying, Where's the key? Where's the key? It took me like five minutes to find. I'm going to type in 10. Uh, P-R-I-N-T space. Now, where is the... Uh, um, next to the P. Well, that wasn't right. Oh, no. Now i got to use the arrow things. Is it uh, arrow one? What am I... <laughs> i got to try to delete. And I watched a video on this. Oh, no. I now have two characters. Um, function one arrow. <laughs> this, <laughs> I'll figure it out one of these times. Shift. Um, how do you arrow back? I know what I'll do. Okay, like my QL, yeah, that I have here. It doesn't have a uh, well, actually, does this one have a delete key? It's got the control arrow key, there is no delete key. On the QL, you got to use a arrow and control key to delete the character. Uh. And I forget if the TI-99 was the one that also was the same thing because it took me five minutes to find a key on it. I could be wrong. Hmm. I'll have to go look later. <laughs> yeah. The, the other thing about the TI is it is kind of crippled in the bus or whatever. It doesn't right. run as fast as it should run if they designed right. it differently, I guess. But also the version of BASIC that it runs, I think, is has some oddities to it. It's not a Microsoft basic, right? It's I don't thing about it, other than the look, the thing scares me. Yeah. 
I, I, I limited use on my TI-99. I, it came with one cartridge, two joysticks, and one of them was broken. Mm. And I did very limited powering it on, playing it, seeing what it's like. I like the style of it. It's got a sleek style to it. Nice keyboard, it felt. Cartridge slot, kind of like the TS-2068. I love the looks of the, the computer, other than the keyboard being chiclets. I'm fine with. But it's got a little opening door that you can stick a cartridge in. I yeah. like that whole cartridge in front of you and slip it in. Yeah. My TS-2068 will be in the videos, and you'll see how it all pans out and why I chose this computer to be in every video. So anyway, hopefully you come in and enjoy the fun. Happy holidays to you. Merry Christmas. And uh, every day, come back and check out What's on Sinclair Society uh, Facebook group and what little new video that we're going to put out every day up in two through the 25th of and that will be Christmas Day. Yeah, I had a 2068 for most of my, that was a computer that I used for most of my youth. And I enjoyed it. I didn't know any better. Right. I, I was fine with it. Okay, so the TS-1000, and particularly versus the 1500, the 1000, there's been, it's amazing how much, developments there have been for the 1000 and how much is still being developed for it. people just seem to love that thing they're developing yeah. all kinds of games and gadgets and gizmos and they just won't let that thing die and ZX you have the zx band plus which gives it i think more memory joystick one joystick i guess and, and SD, sd card and so what we have here what the heck i've got a joystick next to it why is that well because there's a little lead a little toggle over here because on this side there's a reset button that you can't see down there but there's a little cable and you connect your standard little kempston type of joystick i'm connecting my epics to it i did connect an external speaker that's what that little port down there was the other day when i did the unboxing video i go what is that oh yeah there's sound capability on this so i do have it running over to a set of external speakers sd card I've copied a number of games over to it along with the commander program and renamed it menu.p uh, per instructions that I saw because technically when I turn this on it should automatically go to that menu and then it's got the nice ZX band plus on there and you'll see it just looks the part there's no wobbling there's no wiggling it's nice and secure in there so looks the part looks great now all I have to do is connect that lead and do not get it mixed up with the speaker lead you bastard! I, I feel like I'm turning red. One more time. Left. Run is oh, it's, oh, it's be a high G. Oh shit! <laughs> I think I scored a lot of points though. Two hundred and thirty-five points. Can I get this? Jump up here. Oh, jump! Yes! Uh, jump up here. Okay. On top. Drop. Drop. Come on, you bastard, drop. Holy, look at these graphics. Oh, I'm flying. I've got sound effects. I'm shooting and I'm bobbing and I'm weaving and I'm shooting. I've never seen a game like this this fast on a ZX81. Auto shoot. Oh, I got me. He got me the bastard. Nice. Can that thing be used on the 1500? Uh, no, I don't believe so, because the ports on the 1500 were moved. So we're on the ZX81 and TS1000. They're all on the left. Let me oh. grab I've got it right here, if you don't mind. Yeah, sure. They're all on the back. So on your TS1000, they were all on the side. This is the side of <laughs> mine. This is the... Mm -hmm. 1500. Guess where all the ports are. Isn't the port on the back of the 1000 as well? Though? Oh, the ports. The ports. All your feed for cassettes oh. and everything. The TV. Okay. On the Timex. I've got that over there right, too. But yeah. They're all on the side. So when you plug in your ZX band, guess mm. what it covers? Now, technically, here. you could get an extension on it and probably make it work. Yep. So one. Yeah. So. From what I gather, if you get an extender that pushes everything back so far, then you could use it, but I don't own one of those. So, mm. 
Yeah, because it would seem like having that better keyboard on the 1500 combined with the ZX Band Plus would be a perfect combination. Unless yep. the, the ZX Band Plus has extra memory, <clears throat> right? 32K, I think. Yeah, I think. I don't know if that would, would that work with the 16K that's built into the 1500? I don't know. Yeah, <clears throat> uh, I would think, I don't know if it adds on top of it. I would think one it's one or the other, but I don't know. How would you compare the TS-1000 keyboard with the Atari 400 keyboard? <laughs> that's a that's a fun one uh and the reason i asked that is because i i've always wanted to get a 400 just because the, the look of it but the keyboard looks like a nightmare yeah compared to which computer again the atari yeah. 400 and, and ts1000 two membrane membrane head-to-head -head battle i would have to say the atari 400 wins because it's bigger yeah the keys are bigger so for fat fingers if you've ever tried to play a game on a ZX81, and I've done some videos for that, and it's membrane, and it's a hard-ass... The Atari 400 has a little bit more of a tactile feel, where on the ZX81 or TS-1000, it's just a hard... Uh, uh. So yeah. trying to play anything is very difficult. So I would say the Atari 400 wins. Although there are some tactile-ish solutions for the 1000. Yep. And there's some real tactile solutions as well. You can put the thing right inside the keyboard case for the Memotech, I think, unless that's an external one. But yeah, it's just, I don't know if it's, uh, it, it's interesting to me that so much has been done and is being done for the TS-1000 and the ZX81, but not the 1500, which is, and, and similarly to the Timex 2068, it's like there, unless there's stuff that I'm not aware of, but it's, I know there are developments, but it seems largely ignored in favor of the 1000 and the ZX81. Yeah, and it's a very small party. There is a night like David Anderson comes to mind for yeah. being an expert with the TS2068 because he's making upgrades uh, today and he makes expansions and he documents and archives every written material you know in the man for the Timex computers. But it's like a party of one with maybe a handful of others. They have a, they used, to, he does quite a few meetings. So there's mm -hmm. people out there, but actual getting stuff done and out. Yes, it has a very small following compared to the ZX81 uh, or even the TS1000 because it's the same computer, really. Yeah, that's one issue for me with the modern retro community is there's so much being done now by all kinds of developers and homebrew and whatever, but a lot of it never becomes available for the general consumption. They do it right. for themselves and you think that's cool. How can I get one? You can't. So right. I would like to see more projects become, have more wider availability. Of course there's limitations to that, but yeah, that's one thing when you see people, okay, a lot is being done, but how much of it does the general public have access to unless they're going to build their own? Yeah. And even when you get general access to it, it's normally a party of one that's making it. So I, I'll throw this out, the Chroma. So we already know about the ZX Band. Even those are, there's times and lulls between people that make them for sale. So there's always a little harder to get. The Chroma adds color and sound and better monitor capability for the ZX81 and TS1000. It gives you all that sound and color and everything on this old computer, but getting it's nearly impossible. The Chroma for the ZX81 hasn't sold for so long. I know the maker of it and I put my name in the queue mm. and that was a while ago. I know he's making something new and different for a different computer now, but over time I hope to get one. So just being a small part-time out of fun, when I make one, I'll make 10 of them and sell it. So yeah, they're just not in the quantities that some of us want, but that's the way it goes. Do you know if you can use that with the ZX Band Plus? Yes, they work together. How how does that work? Do they piggyback off each other? Yeah, piggyback. Oh. I think there's a piggyback expansion on it that allows the two to work together, to the best of my knowledge. Now, I own the ZX Band. I don't own the Chroma, so I can't say 100%, but I believe the two do work in unison together. I could be wrong on that. I don't own it, but I think that's the way it, it works. They can work together. So what video output do you have for your TS-1000 now? Uh, regular RCA, RF to a TV. Oh, <laughs> okay. Yeah. 
All and right. I'm perfectly fine with old RF. If it's a little janky on the eyes, well, my eyes aren't the greatest anyway. So yeah. as long as it's video and it's playable, great. Uh, and I don't use the TS-1000 tons. I do use it more now with the ZX Band. And for whatever reason, the TVs I normally connect it to shows up pretty well. TVs have a lot of filters built into it. So it can make something look shitty, pretty representable. So I'm fine. Yeah, I was going to say the TVs that you have, that you show in your videos that you're playing with these TS-1000 type machines, they look pretty good. Yeah. It look the, the the video makes it look better than what it really is, but it is still mm. better than what you would imagine it to be. So okay, yeah. So the uh, so the Atari four hundred keyboards wins over the TS one thousand membrane. Yep. Are there any other yeah. membrane keyboards in your collection? That do any other computers have a membrane keyboard? Yeah, Atari four hundred and the TS one thousand. Uh, that's it. Hmm. Every hmm. every other computer I have has a real keyboard although strangely a lot and maybe even most of a lot of the old retro computers have a mylar inside of them which is technically a membrane keyboard yeah <laughs> they just have tactile buttons hitting the membrane yeah a little sponge act dead flesh <laughs> yeah okay auric atmos this computer uh is somewhat interesting for i think game developers now potentially because it has SD card capability, right? With the, I'm not, you showed three different devices, the Erebus, the yeah, two others, Arebus, one of the other ones. And, the, and I've already forgot the name of it. Erebus. Um, What's the name? What's the name? I have it right over here. Yeah, it's going to come to me in a minute. buried under other stuff to find it. Uh, oh. But yeah, Cumulus. Cum Cumulus. There's a Cumulus, and the Rebus, and then one other one that starts Cumana. Cumana Reborn. M-A-N-A, -A, I think. Yeah. And all of them have different ways about what they, whether it's cassette, disc, rotary knob to make the switch. And I know just enough about all of them to get in trouble. But I, I'm glad I own them because I had... Again, Invasion of the Cloud people make it for a, a, an oddball computer. Yeah. And I, all the oddballs one, I feel the Auric Atmos is the most sexy looking computer of them all. Something about the black and then the RNG keys. Let me take a quick little look at my computer before I show you. Cool. So... I gotta say, for a slick looking computer, the Auric Atmos is definitely the bee's knees. Look at these keys, the red or orange. I'm a little colorblind, I think, so should be, uh, I guess, red technically. It looks orange to me. So here's computer front, really nice keyboard. Here's the back, back, front, sides don't look to have anything, but the back wheel, ports, and I'll figure out all this stuff as I read the, the manual. I also picked up a cumulus device which is an SD card type of device that connects to the Auric and allows you to load software. So that came with it. That was part of my deal that I made with him. It's a very yeah. looking 8-bit computer that uh, I, I thought looked awesome. And it was yeah. very expensive for me to get one. You don't find them come up for sale too often. I've been tempted a couple times to get one for myself when the pricing is agreeable on eBay. Right. But the whole development thing, I don't buy a system typically unless I'm going to try and make games for it. And that one, I'm not sure how easy it would be to make games. That's a European system. So you've got to do the whole SCART, whatever thing, and the power and all that. Yeah. They and... do have, there is somebody that makes a new adapter 
that makes video connection better. I think it's kind of like Sean's Aquarius one that takes a particular connection and allows you to use a little Sega adapter. That Sega adapter basically kicks it out to like VGA or something. Not quite mm. sure, but yeah, that is one of the computers I still need to use a SCART type of device and cable conglomeration to get a video that looks just so-so. Mm. But I think there's somebody that makes a newer one, but it might be a VGA or something. I forget. Um... <laughs> oh! Get the bird! Oh! He's flying with me. That's cool. Jump! Oh! Oh! Mmm. Yeah. And I think you were having some technical issues with that thing starting up on one of your videos. Did, did that sort itself out? I think you just have to power it up in a different way. So I think I was trying, like on a Speccy, you go plug the power supply in kind of like last and it turns on. I think what I mm. had to end up doing is plugging in all the other cables first and then one different cable last and then it worked every time fine. So there oh. was like a timing. This needs to have power in order for it to work right. Otherwise, yeah. Hit and miss whether it will boot. And obviously for the Sinclair-ish computers, the Timex Sinclair and the actual Sinclair computers, there's a ton of support, ton of games, ton of devices. Ton, ton, there's a ton of stuff for those. Right. So I'm guessing your advice for people considering collecting Sinclair slash Timex Sinclair would be no hesitation. You'll Whatever you want to do, you can do it. Yeah, I think it's a really, there's so many out there, so many games. Everything's available to download for games wise. Uh, and, and you just need to get an SD card or mass media device to feed it in easier because re reading cassettes, making cassettes, all that would get old or hard. So as long as you uh, get one that has a SD card capability, it, it's a lot of fun. And with the pricing of all the different versions of the spectrum, I don't know what the prices are, but compared to the next, assuming you could get a next, would you just say get a next? If you can get a next, get a next. Don't don't bother with any of the others. Yeah, if you could get a next, get a next. An Engo is more readily available, but since the CPU that they use on it's hard to get, they're only made in small batches. But if you have an opportunity to get an Engo or a real next, I would say buy those first because they're a lot more capable. They pretty much run most everything that I've thrown at it. There may be some timing issues if you're connecting it to an HDMI display where there might be some color issues that happen or speed issues. But overall, for what I do, it's a lot more user-friendly and you don't have to go through anything else. No power issues, none of that. It just works. You connect it up to a TV and power it up and go. And upgrading the firmware, I guess you have to do once in a while? Yes. Yeah. Part of their ZX OS, and it, they don't come out with a new version every day. They have beta versions that you can do, but I'm not a beta version guy. I wait for the official, here's the new version. And yeah. it took, what, two, three years before I did that update. I've been using yeah. my Next up until uh, end of last year with what came with it. And then I finally updated it, and it's really easy. Yeah. So for the let's say the Auric Atmos, and you don't have an Auric one. Nope, just the Auric Atmos. I wanted that one first because of its beauty. Sexy black. Yeah, Orange the other green. one is the same mechanism, the same everything, other than the keyboard being a little different. Yeah. But the, the size of it and the, the design of it's the same. But yeah, the, the, the newer one, the Auric Atmos looked better to me. And I forget, does the Atmos or either Auric have any kind of device where it has all the games you can plug in or how how is it to get games for that thing yeah there's no cartridge port but there is a one or two websites that have access to lots of downloadable things uh, okay specialized one so there's plenty to be had but nowhere near as much as a, a specy you go to world of spectrum or any of the other sites you can down thousands and thousands of games we're on these other ones that didn't quite get to the same size as Sinclair. There's mm -hmm. plenty, and you can keep yourself busy for years, but not the, not the same quantity. 
And if you have a next, obviously you throw it on an SD card or I think there's even a wireless option. Now you can get it in there. Yep. I'm not sure with all your other specy versions, is it a pain to get games into them or do they all have SD card solutions or? Yeah. So that's the funny part. That's why I use the next most of the time, because up to now I was using either real cassettes or a Max Duino device, which allows you to put wave files or files of the compatibility onto an SD card. The SD card goes in the Max Duino device, but it feeds it as slow through mm -hmm. the speaker and uh, mic port. So you get the same feeling of a cassette, but in a more perfect format that typically doesn't have read right issues as an old cassette, but that's time consuming. They do make devices like Div IDE, Byte Delight makes all these devices that let you feed a .tap file in immediately, but I don't own one, believe it or not. So I've got a Next. The Next does that for me, but sure, I wouldn't mind getting one one day because I do like to spark up my older speckies and use them from time to time, but since they don't have easy SD card readability, I tend not to use them as much. So for those, you have to use a tape? Yep, tape or Max Duino. Or Max Duino. Which is a tape device. Uh, get, uh, robot, we make robots website. He's hmm. on the Aquarius site. In fact, he's making you make robots. Yeah. You make, sorry, yeah. yeah. He makes, he's making a joystick for the Aquarius. Right, yeah. You know, be able to buy. He you haven't makes, tried my joystick on the Aquarius yet. <laughs> I, I did, right. but he didn't make a video about it. Oh, did it work okay? Uh, on your game, fine, but on other games, it didn't. Yeah, it's designed for my game. That's why the, none of the diagonal directions worked. <laughs> right, yeah. I tried, and I don't think it worked. And I was starting to make a video and get tied in with something yeah. else. But it's nice to have, but I'm fine playing with the old Aquarius. Really? Yeah, hmm. it, it seemed to work. But this new one that um, they're coming out with, just to support the group that's making stuff, I'll buy a, a joystick and enjoy it. And, yeah. The next, are there games for the next that you still need to load in? I, I guess it's a tap file, right? That takes the, do all games come in versions you can load instantly or some you still have to wait even on the next? No, all instantly if it's made specific for the next, there's a .nex file, all that stuff's yeah. instantaneous like a .tap, but TZ, tzx files are cassette and they load in slow. So if you find a only a TZX file, you sit there and load it and you go through all the Oh, it's drawing a picture. <laughs> See, there's the little hand holding a little uh, dude, Xavier. <laughs> okay. Uh... So all these games that you're playing on your channel that are from the 80s, you're waiting for them to load? No, they're all tight. Most of everything has been converted to a top TAP file. And that so, loads instantly. Instantly, yep. Hmm. Only okay. the ones that are TZX. And I don't know if there's a reason behind them not making a TAP version. I don't know. I don't know electronically why you would hmm. want one or the other. But there are some games that are only TZX and I couldn't find a TAP and I use it and load it the old way. Huh. Okay, technical question for you now. A lot of mathematics involved. Oh, no. <laughs> but it's all behind the scenes. You won't need to figure <laughs> It just occurred to me, when you made your game, The Cloud People, you've made it for the old 48K and you made it for the Next. Now, the Next runs at 28 megahertz, but the 48K doesn't. How? And I think you used Compiled Basic for that, right? Is that how you got it to run fast enough to? Yes. So the first game, Invasion of the Cloud People, is strictly a specky 48K game. It's not a Nextified game at all. It will run on all older speckies like a specky 48 and so on so all of it is in zx basic not next basic and does everything old school and um but when i started getting the file bigger and more graphics and chakras moving around and more characters everything started going doo, 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 doo. everything started slowing up so i explored five or six different programs and you've seen them back in the day this, this, you know, create your own games in basic, but then use this and it makes it really fast. It was compiler type of thing. Yeah. And so I tried all these and only two out of the five or six I tried worked. One of them worked, but it did something weird and I couldn't figure it out. 
and only one left that actually worked across the board on everything. And I was able to make the game in the size that it was to work. And I stuck with that version and I don't even remember how to use it anymore. I made a video. I, I saw the video. Yeah. I'd have to go back and watch to see if I can be reminded how I did it, but it made the game considerably faster and it's, and it works. It's still, dun, 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 but it's dun, 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 instead of done, done, done. Yeah. I used, I was just looking for a game that I made, but it's buried somewhere. Like probably most of your stuff is buried. But um, I did make a game back in the back in the day, back in the eighties. I made two games: a Pong version, a Pong game, and a Breakout game. And I did use a, a basic compiler for that as well. I had to be careful how I coded it, so I had to use simple instructions. I couldn't use big, big long, complicated instructions or right. lines. But it worked good, and I did watch your video too about the compiled basic tool that you used and i actually tried that out based on your video and it worked for me as well so that's a good way if anyone it's too bad your videos aren't cataloged so you have playlists and you can find them you got yeah, so many videos have, you have now a thousand that's the whole organization thing that i'm not good at <laughs> <laughs> it's just Throw it out there and find it yourself <laughs> yeah but yeah that, so that particular program that i end up finding what the only problem with that version is it makes the program really fat because it loads itself and your game in one mm. big file instead of converting it and making it a uh, a little bit bigger file that's faster. I think the, the one that we ran is it puts the two together, but you need both in order for it to work. And it uh. makes it really, I think my game is only technically like 17, 18 K. But if you look at the file of my game, it's 30, 40 some odd K. Hmm. So it's it made it. I don't understand it, but it, I'm glad I found it because it made a game pretty fun and usable to play. Yeah, because I'm wondering how you would make your cloud people game for different systems. You said you want to port it to different systems, but if you don't have a compiler for those, they're not running at 28 megahertz like the next. Isn't it going to be a crawl trying to yeah, play? Yeah, I would have to learn how to program. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's what it takes from TJ saying I. You made a game that actually kind of works uh, to where, yeah, the next step up is not, not have so many loops and not have so many things jump around. Like they say, have all your main running code between this and this, you know, first uh, beginning of the thing. Because yeah. if you all of a sudden say jump out here, jump to 9,000, jump to 7,000, you're doing all these jumps and it really takes everything to a crawl. So I've got way too much of that. And why? Because I'm not a programmer. <laughs> I'm just yeah. a dude that went for it and said, I want to make a game. I'll do the best as I can. And I pulled it off and I figured out a cheater way, I guess, if you want to call it, to make it run well enough for people to play it. Well, you've done something that most of the people on the planet have not done and never right. will do. And not just more than mo most people, but I don't know what the number would be, but it must be 99.99 something people <laughs> on the planet. How many people on the planet actually make a game from beginning to end? And get it done and get it up on HIO for people to play. Right. I mean, you see demos of games that are in the works, and some of them get completed, some of them don't. And yeah. you even used what I would consider an advanced technique, converting your basic into machine code using a compiler. How many people would do that? Right. I mean, you'd, you'd have to be pretty know, knowledgeable. You wouldn't think that someone who, like you, always claim you have you're not expert at all in any of this stuff yet you're compiling basic into machine code which right. i think a lot of people would think that's pretty advanced yeah it, it, there and i'm glad i was able to pull it off so and that's where if i ever made i would have to say if you said tj what platform are you going to make invasion of the cloud for next and it would have to be the old original version because the next is unique to the next you have mm. to have a next to run it there's sp specifics in it to do it but for my older game could I bring it to an Aquarius, an, an Auric Atmos? Hmm. I would have to say if I was going to make my game for the older one for another platform, it would be the Aquarius. I don't know why, just because I like everybody in the community and it seems vibrant enough to keep you in excited about it, uh, but small enough to be intimate. But I'd love to make it for that. But I would probably have to learn, I don't know, could I learn a little bit of machine code in order to make it spiffy enough or learn not to have so many loops and stuff. I'd have to learn things better, but I think I could do it uh, one day. Yeah, I would love to see you make 
that for the Aquarius. I find the Aquarius very exciting, mainly because of the micro expander, which lets you instantly load full screen images. So that saves a ton of processor time if your game yeah. lends itself to that. So then all you have to worry about is moving these little guys around on the screen. Right. But what takes the time, I think, is probably the checking. You know, what are you running into this? Did your projectile hit the bad guy? Should I make a hail thing explode now or, right. or what? That all takes processors. And even yeah. with my dungeon quest, I had to redo my whole game and refactor it and make it run more quickly so it's usable and move my code up to the beginning that's looping and move other stuff away. So it's kind of, uh, for me, I like to program in a modular fashion, which means, like you said, you're jumping to all, to all kinds of different subroutines, but that slows things down to a crawl sometimes. Oh, yeah. And that's what happened for me. But I've learned enough to know that you need to put the stuff at the beginning and not have it jump all over. So I know it. And there were actually some routines that I was able to bring back into the beginning and made it faster. But I was too lazy to then do the whole thing later on because I got to a certain point where yeah. I'm, I'm going to never get this out if I don't yeah. call it good. And I called it good and it worked out. Yeah, like I've said in one of my previous videos, the most important aspect to a game development, I think, is getting the game done. If you don't yeah. get it done, then what's the point? Yeah. And you got or it I'm done. One, I'm looking at it all day long. I'd rather yeah. have people try it out and give me some input. Yeah, but you're wanting more comments on your game from people who've played it. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I'll have to download the thing and play it one day. It'd be nice, yeah, if you have a specy 48. It, 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 well, you, you well, have it. I could run it on the next, couldn't I? Oh, yeah. Well, you have it, and then you could play both of them. Yeah. And they're free, so you have no reason not to try it. <laughs> and then give me a response later. Until you see until you see a notification that I downloaded it and didn't bother giving you a, a, a kickback, then... You don't see those. I don't. Because I've had 300 and some odd downloads of my uh, Specky Next version, and I've only received oh. X amount of 16 people, I think, bought it. But doesn't so it tell you... People that download it. It doesn't tell you who downloads it? Not that I know of. Hmm. And I wouldn't care anyway, because I put it up for make your own... And if zero is it, it's it. Play yeah. it, you know. Yeah. Hmm. yeah, well, I'll have to try it one day. <laughs> yeah, but that's good you got it done. Did you, just a couple technical technical things, did you put the, do you go to the trouble of putting all the variable initialization and stuff at the end and jump there, do all that junk, and then come back to the stop, to the beginning? No? No. Nope. Well, uh, yes, on, depends what game, but I, on the next version of the game, I did smarten up and the way that you draw tiles for your screen, the arena, all that, I did learn, and that's where some banking came into the picture too, but I did learn to throw a whole bunch of that data at the end and do your initial grabbing of it and filling in the screen, and then you don't need to go back to it again until you absolutely have to. So I did yeah. learn that, but there's other variables that I got very sloppy with and I didn't interize, integerize. I don't know how to say the word. Yeah. You're supposed to use um, integer variables are faster on the next than non. And I didn't do it. So I could have saved there. So there's a lot of room for improvement. I always wondered that. Why don't they make integers the default instead of floating point? How often do you need a floating point variable in a game, right? Mostly you're using integers. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, and, and that goes again above my pay grade. So yeah. I have no idea. <laughs> but, you know, I started making the game before I was told that you should make the variable an integer variable. And then I tried to go back and change it later. And all shit broke loose. Yeah. So I decided to say, screw that. I'm never going to get the game out. Change it back to what it was. And then moved on and got it done. I tried that with my game as you, as you found out. <laughs> Uh, bricks that thing yeah. runs at a snail's pace i'm surprised you played it longer than a minute uh, <laughs> i tried to do the same thing you just said about converting the variables to integer and it just went to crap so I, and it could have been very well just a, a comma not here a colon not there whatever it is yeah. something i wasn't picking up and i and it, and it just a rabbit hole i didn't want to explore anymore a real programmer would have i'm not a real programmer i'm just a dude yeah who wants to make a game yeah. 
when I made my game for the Aquarius, a problem I ran into, and I think you ran into this as well as running out of memory. That's why you had to bank it, right? Yep. So I ran out of memory, but I didn't want to bank it because I just wanted my game to be 32K. But the issue I found was that I didn't declare all my variables up front. I just let the program assign values to variables as it went along. So it was sucking up more memory as it ran. I thought, why the hell am I running out of memory? It was running fine a minute ago, and now it's right. running out of memory. So right. now I initialized everything, given all zero values or whatever, so then I know how much is reserved for variables. Anyway, yeah. technical side side <laughs> quest there. Sword M5. You, I'm guessing, love it just because you got it brand new and it's rare and it looks cool and it's orange and you got the enhancement <laughs> cartridge thing. But Right. If I wasn't, uh, I bought it pre-knowing that I could buy that cartridge, but it was a, like the Auric Atmos, a very sexy looking computer. Having that little flop up and having a cartridge, mm -hmm. it would look very dynamic to me. And it was... Do I want to make my invasion of the cop people for this oddball platform? And in hindsight, I probably shouldn't have got it because it cost a lot of money. But it is kind of an MX, almost an MSX computer, which I don't own one yet. It was almost there. It had a lot of uniqueness to it. There's some add-ons that you could do, but writing to cassette or writing to floppy was hit and miss. And now looking back at it, I could have probably saved myself the money in terms of putting it towards an Atari that I'd probably use more. But I'm glad I own it because actually, if you watch my channel, before I touch the Auric, I'd probably play a sword game. Needless to say, I bought the sword M5 uh, and we're gonna try playing a plume. Okay, so joystick left, right, uh, bottom button, oh, it seems like he, he jumps. Uh, top button, shoot, okay. And I'm dead. <laughs> I've got the cartridge, I plug it in, and some of the games on there are very, I've never seen this on any other platform before. So yeah, it's, 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 it's a little bit of a cultish computer, but very limited, like I said, 100 and some odd, maybe 200 now. I haven't went on to the Facebook for a while. There's not a lot of action on it. No really new stuff other than Sir Morris makes that awesome cartridge for it. But beyond that, I think it's just a really niche thing, and I'm glad to have owned it. And I would have to say it's probably a lot of the looks. I'll admit it. It looked really cool. I wanted it. I got it. Would I sell it now? No, I think I took a lot to get it. And maybe there's one day that I'll have more time on my hands and I'll explore it more. But for now, I do have it in this office. It's not in the back room. And I do plug it in every couple of months and use it. So you, you would need to find some way to speed up your program on that as well, I'm guessing. How Do you know how fast that thing runs? I don't think so because it's a different processor. Oh. If I remember right, the pro I'd have to go back and look. Don't hold me to, but I think it's a different processor than the Z80. Am I oh. right? I don't know. It's been so long, I forget. Yeah. So there were two versions of that, right? The one you have and the other one. Now, was your version North American and the other one is UK? Uh, they have the sword version and then they have, it's called... Tatung, T-A-T-U-N-G. It was made for the Japanese market. And it was a Am still NTSC. Wasn't there one that's not orange that was made for a different market? Yes, and it's got the uh, uh, CG. Oh, yeah, CG Ford, something. CG, I, CG something. And it's a PAL version for the United Kingdom or Britain and England and all that. So yes, okay. there's three known ones that I know about, those three. You know what's unique? So this little M5, over in Japan, they, I believe, did sell it, or was it Korea? Someplace sold it as Takara M5 instead of just M5 Sword. And then in United Kingdom, they sold it as the, what, the CJ5, CM5, something like that, something five. So it's kind of unique how they put their slightly different name and they market it in a different area. You got little fat man here in the corner pumping up balloons, and I need to massively quickly shoot the balloons. Other what? Oh, there's a nice little tune going. Oh, uh, shoot. So you can shoot the apples, you can shoot the balloons. A balloon! That's what it is. It's a balloon. And yours is made for the Japan market? Uh, yes. And that's why I got it because it was 
NTSC. I could play on a regular United States TV and not have PAL issues. Oh. And the power is 110? Um, on the sword, no. I'm running it through that up transformer. Oh, because it's for Japan. I guess Japan is yeah. not 110. There was, yeah, it is a look, cool looking computer. Yeah. How, how's the keyboard on that thing? It is a rubber chiclet, right? Yeah, it's not nothing gourmet to write home about. Mm -hmm. But it's and sleek looking. The problem that is reported with the cartridges disconnecting if that little door flops onto it. Have you had any problem with the cartridges on that? No. Nope. Um, I'm going to use yeah. one cartridge, and that's the one Sir Morris makes. Is I that have one basic cartridge, and that's it. Oh, we have a basic cartridge. Yeah. So I did come with a, there was three basic versions. That's what's so funny about these computers. There's like a basic B, an E, and a D or whatever. Hello and welcome to the Centre for Computing History. We're doing another one of our little zip vids and today we're looking at the Sword M5. So Sword as a company started in 1970, founded by a man called Takayashi Chino. And at first they just wrote software for deck machines before starting to produce hardware in 1974. So they produced various machines for business and in the home. And by 1982, they were ready to take on the games market with this little machine here. So the company name Sword is apparently a very large contraction of the two words software and hardware. So that's taking the SO from software and the RD from hardware. So the machine was set to release at the tail end of 1982 but it was going to launch already into a very crowded market so we had the home machines we had the Sinclairs the Acorns Dragon 32 was on the market as well as that there was the American companies so Commodore Atari and Texas Instruments all having their own different rates of success and later on in the year they'd be joined by Oric and to a much less degree by computers with their links so it was going to be a pretty crowded market. Uh, the machine itself is aimed squarely at the games market. So it has a Zilog Z80 processor running at 3.58 megahertz. It's set up really for sprites as well. So it could have 32 sprites on screen at once. That put it up there level with the Commodore 64 and the machines such as that. Okay, so on the back of the machine here, we have an RF video socket. We have sound and composite video. We have two controller ports, printer port, the DIN for the cassette, and the power socket. The machine did not have BASIC built onto a ROM chip. Instead, you lift up this flap here, and then you were supplied with a BASIC integer cart. And turn the machine on, and there is the BASIC ready to go. So the basic cartridge supplied with the machine was really seen by the critics as not being terribly good. Uh, if you wanted to do more graphics-based programs, you needed to buy the basic G cart, which was £35. Or if you wanted to do more complicated maths, then you had the basic F cartridge that added floating point arithmetic. Yeah. You didn't have all three of them to really make a game but the only way to run three cartridges is to buy this floppy adapter, which fit over the top of the sword and made it look like a transformer and not a pretty transformer. Hmm. And then you had to plug these in to then write and save code with all these different basics together. It was hokey. You enjoy having it, though. I enjoy having it and mostly to play oddball games. Uh, and it's, it is a unique little memento. But it, it would be one that, yeah, TJ, you saw the, the pretty eye candy. You went for it before, really. I, I researched it a little bit, and I knew I'd want to get one, but I probably could have used the money elsewhere on something else. I'll agree. I'm, I'm pretty sure you could sell that for a pretty penny, I would guess, in the condition you've got it. Yeah, uh, it's it's like new still, and, yeah. and and there's not that many out there. I could probably get most of my money back, but yeah. I'm not in that. I, I promised myself that I wouldn't sell stuff again unless you really, unless things hit the fan really bad. Yeah. So I plan on keeping everything that I'm buying and use it for years to come. Does the cartridge for that have SD card as well or not? It's just no, what's in there is in there. Yeah, and even the Sir Morris card one, I had, 
I don't know if there's a technical reason why he's not doing it, but on his, you have to actually plug a little component chip in. I saw that you made a video about that, right? Right. What did that upgrade do? Give you more games? Yeah. So there's that um, Japanese, I think it's Japanese, making all these Inufuto games for mm, all right. the oddball platforms, including Aquarius. So he made it for the Sword M5. Howdy folks, TJ here. Today is Sword M5 Day, and thank you to Charlie for sending me a little package. Uh, you can't really see the little doohickey that's in this package, but you'll see it in a moment. What am I up to? Well, I own the super cool multi-cartridge for the Sword M5, and uh, there's been some new games, uh, Inufuto games that have become available that work on the sword. And Charlie was nice enough to send me a updated chip, I'll call it, uh, to that has more games on it. And I'm going to go ahead and open up this cartridge for the first time and do a chip type of component that I'm not familiar with. I've pulled ROMs and chips before from old computers that are big and long with lots of legs and sockets and stuff. Nothing like this little doohickey. So he was also nice enough to send me some pictures and some text on here's basically what you will need to do. So I'm going to take you through a little um, uh, experience with me and we'll see how I do. I don't care what people say. Yellow, white. This cartridge is so cool looking. Okay, it just it pops open. Oh, that was easy. It was like butter. I must have uh, finagled it and gave it a little voodoo right before him. There is a particular way for this chip to come in. There's a little dot on here. This is the little component that I'm basically going to be replacing. And I've never pulled something like that before. So that's why I asked him. And he notes here, lever up from the corner, gently does it. <laughs> TJ Gentle? <laughs> Not likely. I'm like a bull in a china shop. There we go. Okay. Component out! Amazing! Okay, so now let's get the new component that was so nicely sent to me and take a gander at it. So I need to just push this in straight as best as I can. So I'm going to go ahead and put it over here. Just trust that I'm putting it in here the right direction and I'm giving it a general push. Oh, that slipped, that slipped in like butter! <laughs> Okay, so this, this sucker's in. It looks good. Uh, okay, new new components in. I'm just giving it a general schmush to make sure it's in. So then this should fit back in here. So that's that. And then uh, get this cover. Obviously only goes on one direction. And snap in place. That was simple. <laughs> now to see if it works. So... I'm going to shut off the camera again. We're going to go connect up my Sword M5, plug this in and make sure it boots, and then this video is successful. All right, testing time. Sword M5, updated multi-cartridge. Let's go ahead and turn it on. Three, two, one. M5, multi-cart. Dog's going to start barking. I just want to make sure this cartridge works. So, uh, so far, so good. Hey, it looks like Sir Morris 2022 multi or m5 multi 2 so here's the original game do i notice anything different bat lot did that one's an inufutu game if i remember right that was a pretty cool game bat lot hey look at that push trigger button uh or shift key <laughs> new game for sword m5 how cool is that okay uh shoot the chakras got him got him Oh, shit! You hear the dog barking? She is just one Looney Tunes. So to put the games on there, Sir Morris put all of them on a new component, sent me that, put it in, and I now have access to new games that were never available back in the day for the sword. Hmm, cool. Yeah. Okay, so my last category of systems I want to ask you about, unless anything else comes up while we're chatting, is your huge Atari collection. I don't even know if I've seen, I don't think, well, I'm guessing, have you done videos on everything in your Atari collection? Everything but one. The XEGS, I have not done a video on yet that I remember. 
That's the last one in the 8-bit line. And last one in general. Uh, yeah, that one. And then I don't think I've done a video on my Mega STE yet. Maybe an old video, but nothing gourmet. Just a quick video I'm going to make showing this Mega STE booting up. I've got an Atari SC1224 connected to it. And a keyboard, mouse. And I'm going to reach around and turn it on. It's no hard drive in this one, so I'm going to boot up off a of floppy. Once uh, you turn it on, since there's no hard drive inside, go down and hit the space bar. Tell it to boot up from the floppy, which is doing. And once it's booted up, I'll go ahead and run basic or something so you can see it running. drive and go find basic you can see it's booting off the floppy and there you go just hit some keys to click on the keyboard I'll go ahead and quit and there you go Booting and running. So yeah, uh, XGGS is probably the only other one that you're not aware of. Mega STE. So you have the Mega 2, you have the TT, and you have, there's another one, the Mega... Mega STE. STE. Is that Five. one of the ones that's on your long table there? Yeah, so I've got the Mega 2 ST, which is the old one I originally owned. Then I've got the Mega STE, which looks like a TT, separate detachable keyboard, really yeah. cool looking. And that's basically the last of the ST line Atari made. Then they moved on to the TT, which is hmm. a 6830. Looks just like the Mega STE, but a little different color. And then I've got the Falcon, and then a 520 ST and a 1040 ST. And that's all on the uh, ST TT line that I have. And of course, you have the 400, the 800, probably a bunch of XLs. Uh, yep, 800 XL, 600 XL. I no longer own a 1200 XL, so. Believe it or not, there is still one I need to go buy. And I don't have a 65 XE. It's this, I don't foresee me needing to buy one just to be complete because yeah. the 130 XE is it with more. So, mm -hmm. but yeah, there's a handful of ones I could still technically buy. There's other STEs that are not the mega ones that I could technically buy that I don't mm -hmm. own. But I, I kind of drew the line. Like I don't have to have these unless a great deal comes up on one that I happen to just want and the 1200 xe xe yeah 600 xe yeah the 1200 xe was actually released before the 6 and 800 right and it's less capable than those two isn't it or right. am i wrong 1200 xl xl yeah. xl yeah it came out right before the 600 and 800 i don't think there are any more it's funny it's like a volkswagen bug uh, you know, they only make a little tweak here and give it a whole new name and a little bit different mm. color and spruce things up, but they continue mating the bug for decades. Kind of like the Ataris. They're all very similar, maybe slapped in an extra about a memory. So the 600 XL had less memory. The 800 XL had more. Mm. The 1200 XL in all practical purposes, I think it's just maybe what it was built on is not as capable as the 800 XL. I'm not sure of the technical... Big differences, but it did come out before, to my knowledge, the 600 and 800. They came out afterwards. Yeah, I thought, I think I remember seeing a video about it, how they kind of slapped together the 1200 for some purpose they needed to ship it. But then when they really redesigned it, they went to the 600 and the 800. Right. The most expandable, I think, Atari that a lot of people want and buy is the 800 XL. Seems to both mm -hmm. be the most price friendly and most capable to upgrade for whatever reason. Yeah, although it, it does have a bigger enclosure than the 600, and I yeah. think you can upgrade the 600 to be pretty much an 800 if you wanted that smaller enclosure. Yeah, yeah. and it is a nice little Pequinto package. The 600 XL does look really nice, yeah. Yeah, and there was, you made a video about a new potential computer that is being developed to be a modern version of, I think, the 800 XL. Yep. Howdy, folks, TJ here. 
the heck is this going on here on the screen? The legend returns. And it's got a picture of what appears to be an Atari 800 XL. But this 800 XL is a very popular computer. And in April, I mean, April's kind of the, the, the month of April Fools, right? You don't know if you're going to be become the fool, the foolie. Uh, but this has recently, I don't think it came out in April Fool's Day. Not saying that it's a lie, <laughs> not saying it's true. But there's enough buzz going around about this Revive Machines. And it's called the RM800XL. This is not a replica, but a new incarnation of the best 8-bit computer from Atari in 1983. It has a wonderful design that has survived to this day and still captivates a huge fan base. Its excellent technical capabilities surpass competitive products at the time of its creation. That looks exciting if it comes out. Yeah, and it looks identical. And from what I gather, the people behind it, there is a huge, I think it's Poland, that Atari 8-bit is huge. Hmm. It is like the place, the mecca for Atari 8-bit. Hmm. And supposedly the people behind it are from things that they've successfully done before. So it looks very promising, but I, I don't know enough about them or the people, but the renders of it look fabulous. Yeah, It gives you a lot of new capability. And would I buy one? If the price is right, if it's $500, probably not. The Specy Next cost me four twenty-five off the top of my head. That was about the, my max for something like that. Yeah. But if it comes in at three to four hundred dollar range, I could see myself getting an eight. Well, it's not. It's an eight hundred XL, but the letters before it's R M Retro Machine eight hundred. Right. XL. Yeah. Yeah. And your TT and Mega ST line of computers, those. Are those all business machines or do you play games on them? What are those? What can you do with those things? Yeah. The TT was really tailored at businesses as in the professional user. Uh, graphic, you know, believe it or not, Atari had a nice little stronghold on two markets in the United States and the world music on the ST line because they had MIDI ports built in. So the music industry really loved in the early days, the Atari until the other computer companies caught up and then Atari just basically faded away. But musically, the MIDI ports uh, were wonderful for that. The TT was kind of unique. It was not compatible with a lot of the older games and such that people were used to, but it was a lot faster, a lot more capable. And a business market in the United States did not appear. <laughs> but in like Germany, the desktop publishing world really used the heck out of the Atari TT line. And so you have a pretty good German presence for the Atari TT over there for a while until that went away too. But yeah, it was very business oriented power without the price. The price was pretty good for what it offered. So I would say business wise desktop publishing for the time, it was really yeah. a, a good business machine. And those are the ones that I think you can put the Spectre gadget on and make it into yep. apples. Apple, All Apple. of them. Howdy, folks. TJ here. Atari. Jackintosh. Macintosh. Spectre GCR. What does all this have to do with me yapping about it? Well, were you ever one to uh, own an Atari and had a little uh, envy of some of your Mac friends that were running some pretty cool business type of software, but you wanted to run it on your Atari? Well, there was a way, and it was called Spectre. Uh, there's a lot of different uh, versions of Mac capabilities or Mac emulation, however you want to call it, on the Atari back in the day. Originally, actually, let me show you the box because I have this one too. There was a Magic Sack, which I think I own one. It's out in the garage in a box someplace. There was one called Aladdin. There was Spectre 128. And then there was... Spectre GCR. So let's take, so number one is the top of the box. I, box, I'm meaning the cartridge box. So it says Spectre GCR on it. And this is how it came because you needed to put the ROMs in there. And once you shut this box, it's a little difficult to open. And it even says that in his book. Uh, the bottom of 
the box is here. So here's the other side of the cartridge. When I keep saying box, I mean cartridge. The cartridge looks like this. So here's what it looks like. And you'll see there's a couple of slots here to stick your ROMs. And there were certain ones that you needed to use. Here is the back. Here is the side that has a couple of floppy ports because you did need to. And I don't remember if it came with an extra floppy cable or you needed to buy one or use the one that you had. But you could, um, you needed a floppy drive cable to plug this in to where it properly does the GCR part. So you needed to slap your ROMs on here, then put it in this uh, box. So you can see I've got that part in here. And then you would get this and slap it on uh, whichever, yeah, that way. <laughs> and then you would have a completed goodie. And then you smack their ass, you smack their ass, you smack their ass. Got them. Nicely done. Uh, let's go ahead and boot up as a Mac so you can see that for the first time. I'm going to push this button here because we're going to boot up from this one. And let's see, do I need a floppy in here? Yep. Okay. Turn on. So. What am I going to do? We're going to run Spectre GCRs. I don't have um, Mac OS, not Mac OS, system software on the hard drive yet. That's something I need to explore, but I do have it on a floppy, which I need to grab my floppy now. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and launch Spectre. So double click Spectre and run Spectre program. And it will come up and tell me what I need to do. So you go up here, file, and you run Spectre. Spectre. Then it's going to ask eventually for me to put in, and we're going to boot up off a floppy here. So let's go ahead and slap this in. We'll start looking for system 6.05 is what I have on here. There's the little Happy Mac. Welcome to Macintosh. There we go. Look at that. So I am now a Mac head. Bring this in a little closer, I guess, so you can see it a little better. So anyway, yeah, that's, I, I'm now a Mac computer, 6.05, and we can go up here and see what's on Zifloppy, the wonderful world of floppy. Look at that. Well, that company that made that device uh, went out of business and stopped making them, so they ended at a early operating system that didn't continue on the lineage. So hmm. Vector GCR was basically a Mac Plus, which is okay. a, it, it had faster than a Mac Plus because of the Atari, but they never got to color or the oh. uh, higher end system. So it just left the industry before it uh, had time to move on, I guess. Oh. Yeah. Do you regret having bought any of the systems that you bought that you still own? I don't know if you've gotten rid of any of the systems you acquired that were ones that you wanted to acquire and not just got in a bulk buy or something, but are there any you bought, changed your mind and kind of got rid of it or are now considering maybe getting rid of it or just wish you hadn't bought them? Any regrets? Yeah, I'm in a mode now where everything I've been buying, I said, don't sell unless <laughs> shit really hit the fan kind of thing. So I'm good there. I yeah. did sell and give away and I don't remember where I got it. I think I purchased it locally, a Waz Edition 2GS Apple. Had two floppy drives, a nice monitor, pristine condition. Got rid of it for like a hundred bucks or something. That one I kicked myself for selling because I've been eyeballing getting into something like the Apple II C that I talked about. Yeah. So that one I do, but that was pre where my state of mind is today. This was long ago. I think I got rid of it in the 2000s. So it's been yeah. a long time. Yeah. But I haven't sold anything since that I didn't want to get rid of. Hmm. That's good. So you're sticking with your collection. You've learned your I lesson. <laughs> so far, so good. <laughs> well, TJ, it's been fascinating and a lot of fun. I want to thank you for taking all this time to talk to me today. And like I said, it's really nice getting to finally speak with you in person, sort of face to face. <laughs> yeah, very awesome of you to to invite me to chat. I loved it. I had every yeah, bit same of here. fun as you to just chat. And you came to my house. I went to your house, however you want to look at it. Okay. Chatting about computers for a number of hours now. Yeah. It was purple. I can't yeah. wait to see how you're going to edit this together. <laughs> I'm going to edit it like this. Upload. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. That's about my editing. I put in the main feed. I put on my ending credits. I splurp them together. There you go. 
I'm still amazed at and hoping to aspire to do a one take video like you. I've never been able to do it yet. I don't think, I don't know how you do it, <laughs> but it's to me, amazing skill you got there to just, just do a whole take in one what? shot. That's I my think. specialty. I guess if I could say any claim to fame, I can pretty much, there's only a few videos that I had to splice something together, but I yeah. had to because I heard the dog barking because the UPS driver was coming up and I had to run out and sign for a package or something. So. Yeah. Do you have any plans to make any longer videos? Like, do you have, is there a reason you're, are you cutting them short, like for the algorithm or would you really like to do longer ones? You, you're just good with what you're, you're doing. Yeah. I, I don't really follow or understand math algorithm. All that's black magic to me. Yeah. Voodoo. So I just make it whatever feels comfortable making it. And I feel like I'm not overspending somebody's time. The longest yeah. video I think I made might've been the one that I demoed your dungeon quest game. Oh! Make your way to the Black Castle to reclaim your throne. Shit, I'm in the fucking castle. <laughs> right. Yeah, I, I feel proud about that. Yeah, I was like 40 minutes long. I may have made a couple others that were about that far, but I forget what it was for. Uh, but yeah, I tend to do someplace around 15 to 25 minutes. Yeah. That seems to be my logical spot. And for a real YouTuber, they would say that's way too long. It's supposed to be 10 minutes or less. Hmm. above eight so you can uh, play around with the mid feeds and all that crap i don't get into that so i just make it and it is what it is yeah <laughs> I, th I think that's probably a good way to do it you yeah however long it takes is how long it takes and it's what it is yeah. yeah so thanks again tj it's been a blast and uh hopefully we can do this again sometime absolutely talk about, talk about something else. Yes. we don't seem to have trouble thinking of things to uh go off on tangents and Chatted like old friends that have known each other for decades, and I yeah. barely know you really, to tell the truth. So, yeah, yeah. I'm glad uh, you invited me, and thank you very much for the invite. I'm yeah, same ready here. to do it again whenever. And on, on behalf of the entire YouTube viewing community, thanks for making your videos and continuing to provide some positivity to people's lives, and hopefully we can get together in person one day. Awesome! shoot anything oh i keep pushing one uh, but that doesn't do anything that just shows me my shit